Alrighty, man. Let's get to it. It's gonna be uh, doing a little bit of studying right before the big stream here. Don't mind me. Just giving people an opportunity to just uh, come in here before everything gets kicking off. Also gives me a good little time to um, just do a little bit of warm up. Get the blood flowing, get the brain thinking. I feel a little bit under the weather right now. Get a little bit sick, feel a slight fever coming on, but um, it shouldn't be too debilitating. We should be alright. Let's go ahead and finish this uh, quick little animal study off and maybe an R. And then we can begin the uh, the actual stream in proper. Mac, how's it going, dude? Good to see you. Alright. Do a quick little check on how big this file is, and then we should be pretty good to go. Okay. I'm gonna set my timer. Let's go at 3, 2, 1, and it'll be for maybe an R. First thing we're gonna do, let's set that background in some, some degree of order, shall we? So, background reads to be a little bit kind of dull, desaturated, warm. So, we'll go ahead and hit it with a bit of a gradient. There we go, already looking kind of nice. Uh, let's go with uh, what's gonna be the primary light source. Reference reads desaturated, warm across the board that seems to be accurate and then the ambient light seems to be slightly more saturated or warm so reference is relatively cooler um the main light is relatively cooler to the ambient light so we can quite easily just uh, up the amount of cool light hitting this um this entire environment right and then we can kind of utilize a nice lovely warm ambient light to light everything else sounds good okay sounds good mark has again dude hope you're doing well so, uh, in accordance with that, let's go ahead and hit it with uh, a bit of a cool light on top right, just to kind of set things in order here. Get our mind thinking the way it needs to. That should be fine for the time being. Next step is to set our proportions in order. Make sure we know where everything's supposed to be going. So I'll make a couple of marks over here just to indicate where things need to go. So let's go ahead and grab a brush that is easy enough to use, something like that is perfectly fine. So, considering the fact that the ambience are going to be quite warm and we're kind of dealing with living subjects here, I'll choose to make my lines with something like a darkish warm brush, just like that. Just because I'm going to be painting over a lot of my lines. So, when you put stuff in like black or vari variations of gray, right, what tends to happen is that when you are um, eventually going to paint over your lines and you want your lines to still be in the piece, right, what ends up happening is it desaturates stuff and tends to sort of ruin the overall effect. Light has again, dude. Okay, so how do we block this stuff out? Very simple. All right, just think about the big ideas. Big ideas is all we think about now. Well, this is one of the biggest mistakes, right? At the very beginning of the piece, it's very liable to be made. Just deal with things as large as you can. Largest ideas. And then slowly, slowly but surely, start to get smaller and smaller ideas in there, right? So I can see that negative shape right over there, easy enough. And almost that double gives me right over here. So I can kind of draw a line with some degree of confidence. Again, I'm going to be quite harsh with uh, evaluating these lines later on. But when I put the lines in, I like to be a little bit confident, right? Why not? We get to be a little bit confident. Get this overall idea of this lovely, beautiful, curvy gesture in there. I like that. Very nice. This gives us a good indication. Can draw a plumb line from the side of the mouth right there. It goes right about halfway through the schnoot. So if you can draw a plumb line in our heads, we can find out that's, that's about halfway through the schnoot. So I get half more. So I bring it up about that, about that much and I can get the edge of the snoot right there. Maybe it's pointing a little bit upwards, that's okay. We can deal with that later on. Make it a bit more horizontal, that's fine. Again, use a negative space. Where exactly is this guy? This guy is about vertically lower. So if I draw a straight line from the bottom of the top dog, it gives me exactly about where this dog starts to protrude, right? Maybe a little bit in front of that. So we can do the same thing in our piece. Draw a straight line. And then a little bit on top of that is where my dog kind of pops out and it creates that negative shape. What does that negative shape look like? Looks like a beak of a parrot, perhaps a cockatoo. Let me draw some simple shapes to accommodate. There we go. So the negative shape tells me that this is a little bit too angular. So we can go ahead and push that a bit forward, make that a bit less angular. Now we're not going for exact proportions here, we don't really care too much about that, but at the same time, get everything mostly right. Okay, so a couple of strokes there, and already we have a good little basis. So let's start um, somewhat chipping this away to get exactly what we need. So again, we'll revise some of the shapes over here. That needs to go a little bit downwards. So again, using the principle of shape association to verify some of our negative shapes. Right over there, that goes up there. Do you see that little shape there? What does that look like to you? It looks like the side of a pigeon. 
So we draw the pigeon on a piece. Attack us again, dude. So the pigeon tells us. What does the pigeon tell us, guys? Tells us that the head's a bit too high. Pull that down a little bit. Tells us also that the neck of the pigeon's right over here. If you don't see the pigeon, by the way, here's the pigeon. That's the beak. That's a little gorbly neck. That's the head on top. I think that's, that's, that's basically the pigeon I'm looking at. So, again, it's not really a pigeon. It's shape association. It's a technique that you can use to evaluate negative shape. Why do you use it? It's because you tend to maybe draw your version of things as opposed to what's actually there. So it sort of helps you just organize things in your mind. Okay, so there we go. We get that uh, that initial little popper right there. Looks so cute. So, taking a good, good little step back, what can we say? We can say that maybe the snout's a little bit too long, so we cut it a little bit off there. Just a little bit of minor changes, but it's just blotting out the initial stuff. So, we can draw some larger negative shapes in here first. Let's draw the shape that goes across the front leg into the pectoral muscle. So, right over there, there, and then there. Just nice, lovely, large shapes. It goes across the lower side of the jaw and goes on the underside of the face. Cool. Same thing on this side. Evaluate the overall distance. I think this guy could use a little bit more bulk on his neck. Again, I'll be able to make final verifications whenever I start to commit this stuff to, uh, to paint. The lines are just a quick little way of me getting a block in, in there. Okay, let's get this ear in there really quickly. Get the little jaw in there. Always helps to kind of know the anatomy a little bit. So I sort of know that the masseter muscle is going to end right over there, so I have some basis to continue this. Right over there. Okie dokie. Ataki, how's it going, dude? How your stream has been? Okay, so putting the center line is probably going to be important right now. Putting in the center line so we can kind of figure out where everything's supposed to go. Center line for the dog up there. Starts at the middle of the brow. Goes all the way down and then goes in the middle, terminating at the nose, that's the center, which tells me that the eye is going to be approximately there. Is it really going to be there? Who knows, man, who knows? Right now we're just going to make an assumption and then move on. You know, back in high school when you used to solve math problems, you used to assume a certain thing and then if it was wrong, eventually you kind of figure out, oh, well it was wrong, that was an incorrect assumption, that's how I proved my theorem. It's kind of similar over here, right? We don't care too much about getting exacts. Do your best and then evaluate stuff later on. It's all about uh, manipulating stuff and varying stuff, optimizing until you get a correct answer, so I'm not too bothered if at any point any of these measurements seem a little bit too off. I'm perfectly content with just uh, trying my best here, and then we can verify later on to ensure that everything's all, all fine. Did someone say crit stream? Indeed. Unfortunately, I think I misspelled it. Much cooler with a K. But yeah, you're free to submit stuff to the Discord. There will be a long-form critique of one of my buddies on stream Mr. Random Knees and right after that I'll be taking crits from the community What are my credentials? Not much, I'm a decent artist uh, People seem to enjoy the way I break stuff down People enjoy my process So, while I cannot make you an incredible artist I can at least at the very beginning At the very beginning I can make you as good as I am And that I'm confident in So anyway, feel free to submit stuff to that Discord No issues whatsoever Break it down dog, hell yeah like getting myself back into our studies, just starting my noggin out. Hey, start the noggin out, man. Start it out. So again, let's not go too, too deep in the south over here. We're just getting some initial ideas going. We don't want to commit just yet. Because our major, major ideas are going to be done with our big, fat, juicy shapes. That we're going to put, be putting into these, uh, this drawing really soon. So let's just go ahead and set up for those big, fat, juicy shapes. It's going to be happening real soon. Create a, cre create a crit stream with critical in chat. Hey guys, what's up? It's critical. Today we're going to be drawing some uh, some dogs. Doing my own stuff, but holy hell am I bad. I just started learning a few days ago. Hey, don't worry about it, man. All skill levels welcome. And the worse you are, the better I can make you, right? Because you got more room for improvement. So you can try to look, there's just way more to learn, man. When it comes down to learning art, you'll find a lot of the times that uh, the better you get, the less improvement you'll make for every, like, instant of time. Because, you know, it's like a diminishing exponential curve, right? So... If you think about it, you can learn way more in a day than I ever could hope to. So there you go, dude. You got that uh, you got that experience boost right now running. That XP boost running in the background. There you go. Alright, confirm some negative negative shapes before we continue. So we go BBM and then we go BBM here, and then we are pretty much done with that initial part. So now let's start to lay in some beautiful, beautiful colors. Now this is the fun part, right? We get to throw some stuff around like a chimp on my canvas. Yeah, go ahead and submit to the Discord, man. Or you can just hold on to it uh, for me, but Discord is probably the best. Exclamation mark Discord or whatever. So now we get to choose, right? So here's what we're going to do. 
we're gonna go ahead and paint in some base value. I'm not gonna follow the colors on the reference exactly, because like I said, I wanna switch around the lights a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch this light up top to a cooler light, and I'm gonna make the ambient of the environment a little bit warmer. But we'll start with some basic colors, right? So a question I can often get is, how do I kind of start a piece, right? Do I start a piece in color? Do I start a piece in value? Ultimately, kind of up to you. You don't really have to worry too much about it either way. It depends on what you're more comfortable with. But here's a good tip if you kind of want to start in color. Don't start with saturated colors. The reason is, is because the saturated colors will give you a little oh, bit of a kind of a weird feeling. Done this. It'll give you a little bit of a strange feeling, mainly because of the fact that there's something called perceived value, which basically means that the more saturated something else something is, the darker it's going to seem. And the lighter something is, the more, um, the more, the more uh, less saturated something is, the lighter is going to seem, right? So ultimately, what that ends up happening is that you can't really evaluate with any sort of strong sense of certainty what something really is. But if everything's the same amount of desaturation, you can kind of navigate a piece a little bit better. So consider just painting a little bit of desat at the beginning, just to kind of find your bearings, right? Top dog. Nah, man, don't you worry about it. It's gonna be fine. Go from level one to level five in a week. There you go. The the grind, the end game for art is really, really uh, busted. The devs need to patch this shit ASAP. I'm gonna go with a dull kind of desac green on this guy. I'm gonna make an evaluation and see if I like that. Maybe I don't. Maybe it ruins the harmony of the piece, right? So we can go dull desat and then hit it with a red, and that that looks okay. We can go with that. Maybe even a purple. Where do you want me to send the stuff? On the Discord's fine. Discord's where I recommend sending the stuff. Okay, so let's just go ahead and make some big, large strokes. Look at the size of that brush. Look at this brush this guy's using. It's crazy. It's huge. Enormous. All right, big strokes. Not afraid to use that eraser. I got an eraser. I'm not afraid to use it. There we go. Just fill that stuff out nice and easy. Okay. Guy on the bottom. Let's go with um, something of a cooler color. A dull, desaturated. Let's go with a semi-dark pink. Uh, maybe around there. The thing is, you don't gotta match those colors, man. Remember, if you solve this whole painting in value, you'll be perfectly alright. Oh, solve the whole I thing in value, and this. you'll be good. So there you go. Dull, desat, purple. That's what I say it is. It's what it's gonna be. Okay? So a couple of changes we're gonna make to the background. We're gonna go ahead and hit it with a lower dark gradient. But bam Right? Easy enough. That looks a little bit boring, don't you think? It's just a smooth gradient. Let's do that again, but we'll do it uh, kind of spicy. So I'm gonna grab your... Uh, your you know, your typical art station. Oh, look at me, I got a new brush pack. I'm gonna grab one of those, because I have a, quite a few of them laying around my brush selector. Oh, do I have any of those that would fit the situation? Uh, let's see. I think I have just a thing. Go with uh, that. Ah, oh, spicy. Alright, we can do that. We can do that. Can do, can do, can do. Alright, so we can add this stuff, and it immediately looks so much, so much worse. It just looks awful. One of the worst decisions we can ever make. But that's okay, because we can manipulate that so that it actually works in our favor. How do we do that? Let's first of all dull what we just did. All I'm looking for really is noise. So once I get that noise, whatever I do with it is fine. So let's play around with it a little bit. That's one of the things you got to think about when evaluating the usage of a texture brush. Kind of think about what it can be used in combination with what. And most of the time it just needs to be unified, it just needs to be modified, it just needs to be played around with. And then eventually kind of end up with a result that is somewhat feasible. So I wanted like an artificially kind of gritty gradient, and I kind of get just that at the end of it. Now, do, did I plan for this? Not really, right? Do, do I really like it? Maybe not the most incredible gradient I've ever done in my life, but it's okay, right? It's not too bad. We can go with that, right? And then we can go ahead and hit it up with some, some more little markings here and there. Straight to you. Discord's fine. Somebody can put the Discord link in there. There you go. But yeah, there is going to be a big, big old crit stream happening later on in the stream. If you guys want me to look over stuff, it's gonna be the gonna be happening pretty soon. You know, I need to send a, a letter to the developers with these brushes, because I actually have a few devs in my contact list, because these brushes kind of break when I hit the corner, you see that? What's happening is it's mixing the transparency of the corner that you can't see, which means it makes everything a little bit messy. So I need to use brushes like this to compensate. Not the biggest deal. Okay, so now we start hitting it with some beautiful, beautiful light colors. Let's first of all start here. Now we can push this a little bit lower. So what am I looking for here? I'm looking for some really large, really thick, saturated, strong statement colors here. Okay, so I sample this value over here. Hit it with some darker, dingier tones. 
go. That looks looking okay, but maybe a little bit too red, so push it up to some orange. That actually can potentially work. I did say I want to warm that area up, so let's warm it up. We're gonna warm it up right there. And remember, we just care about that larger impression of the piece. We'll get to those details later. But this is the area that you want to be spending most of your time in, into the pieces, right? Just ensuring that all this stuff goes in the right way. I hit it with that warm there. Easy enough. Right over here, again, the ambient light is going to be warmer. So I grab a warmer version of this color, a bit more saturated. What we have right there. Goes in, goes in, it's in right there. I can just leave that as a placeholder for right now. It's gonna be okay. All right, easy enough. We'll add in one idea of a color right here. A bit of a lighter version. Maybe that. Maybe this. So here's a good little idea of what we're trying to do here. Right, we're just swatching colors in our palette right now. I'm trying to find something that's gonna fit our requirement. Right, because ultimately. There's no guarantee that what we're seeing on the reference is what we're seeing on the canvas, right? We're not trying to duplicate the reference. We're just trying to make a version of that reference. That's the idea here. I'm going to go ahead and put that little line there. Okay, now we start to break into contrast. So I'll be painting over my lines now. Flash everything into a nice one cohesive layer. Okay, so the lighting is going to be a little bit cooler than the reference. So I'm going to start right there. I'm going to start with this little value over here. Beautiful. Good. Here. In there, in there. Again, care way more about that larger statement here. Larger statement. Put that over there. But do I care too much about this disrupting my lines? Not too much. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. It's fine. How about trying to make the most out of your, your strokes here? Right? It goes a little bit warmer. What's the bottom? I kind of like that little change. So hit the stroke and make that a little bit warmer. Nice. Throw an extra stroke right over here. Yeah, I'm gonna make it a bit more interesting. I'm, I'm gonna do some uh, some squiggly squaggly there. Make that stroke a bit more interesting. So there's some bounce light from the bottom hitting this right over there, right? So this this value over here, I'm gonna leave this as something like um. Well, it's not really a bounce light. Light's coming from that way. So I'm going to leave this as my maybe slightly cooler tone. So let's go ahead and start to cool that up ever so slightly. If I can, I'll, I'll make a judgment call on whether or not I want to keep that. So we'll let that stew a little bit. Let it stew a little bit while I add some additional lines here. Just to make sure everything is in order. I'm going to grab this dark. So I'm going to grab the same dark that's right over here on this doggy. I'm going to put it up here. Again, that's just color reuse. Very, very common. Great little thing to do if you want to speed up your paintings. Okay, so put in an eye there. Grab a slightly less dark value and fill that in the ear. Put that over here. I need a darker value on that snout. Maybe not so desaturated. That's fine. I'm gonna push it a bit cooler. Okay, so it's all about trying to get enough kind of primitive so that I can start sculpting this face. Think about this like I'm grabbing different bits of clay right now. And I'm just trying to get it, get enough of that kind of clay on the canvas to eventually start doing what I want to do with everything. There you go. I hit this with a dull, slightly. These hat yellow. Right over there on that side. I'm starting to cook with some fire here. Easy enough. I think I want this to be a little bit darker. To get that raw material in there. It's gonna be fine. So I'm kind of gonna break this down into very simple initial shapes, but just before we do that, I just wanna rearrange some raw material on this guy. So again, we're just drawing some primitives right now. Very easy to um, get a little bit lost in this process, so we're gonna hard stop it in a second. Let me just get some initial information in there, just so that I know what's gonna happen. So I'm going to draw this occlusion line up there. It should be pretty decent to go for this doggy. I think I have everything that I need for this guy. So besides like some peak values or peak colors, I think I can make this work. I think we can make this work right over here. Should not be too much of an issue. 
Uh, I think I'm missing some highlights. Some peak values that I can probably get, grab from down here, from the top of the eye. But I think we should be good for this guy. So I'm going to go down to the next guy. And then we can start shaping everything together, hopefully. That's the plan. For the back here, I think all that stuff on the back needs to be a little bit darker. So we can settle that in a second. That shouldn't be too hard. Here. There. Alright. Cursor evaluation. I'm going to push one level of light. It seems like it's missing. Again, you can desat stuff to make it look brighter. I'm desatting the current value over there to get that beautiful bright value. Just because I want that whole range, basically. I want that whole range to start uh, really kind of coming in here. How many times can you hit undo while trying to draw a simple circle? Be fairly obligated to swear. Uh, don't worry about drawing circles, man. Ellipses are going to be a pain in the ass, no matter uh, at what stage you're going to be at. Uh, don't worry about it. There's always a circle tool. While you start to uh, power up yourself. Ah, how's it going to do it? Good to see you. And some yellow here. There we go. Yeah, but I think everybody has problems with their circles, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's fine. Push this to deset. We got a lighter value over here. And use that to start shaping up this dog. And I get a slightly brighter value on the bottom side. I'm gonna even push that to a bit of green, maybe. A bit more green. I say green, but this is a value in the yellow right now. But again, it's all relative on a canvas, of course. We've gone over that a few times. All relative. That right there. So I'm going to deal with these uh, issues with values slightly in the future. We're going to do a quick little mask, get things where they need to be. But that's fine for this area. A lot of little intricate things that are spindling around here. I think I need a value for that, so let's go with a slightly bluer internal value like that but a little bit darker that's fine so all i'm doing is i'm swatching on my canvas here just to find the colors that i want and while i'm doing that i'm setting up some landmarks for myself because i like to mix on the canvas whenever i can so that's what i'm doing right now this entire process there are some tricks with circles especially if you're doing them in perspective there's some little tricks here that you can kind of pull off but for the most part, it just takes a lot of practice, a lot of muscle memory. It's just the nature of the game. Lighter value here. Settling that. Up top now, this guy. Push more warmer, push it lighter. And we have this value, which is hmm, close enough. How about that? That's nice. We can go with that. I want it to be a little bit more greener, I feel like. There you go. I watched a recent a YouTuber recently who was telling me he needed to draw thousands of lines before I actually get into proper drawing. I wouldn't agree completely with that. Drawing lines is a great exercise. Um, but the thing is, it is also soulless crushing work. So doing that instead of doing things that you actually are interested in, that might be a step in the wrong direction. Because ultimately, you know what the most important thing to get better is? Just drawing every day. So if you're going to just draw lines every single day and that's all you're going to do, that might really start to um, kill your motivation. So I think it's definitely useful to, uh, to do some line confidence exercises to get nice straight lines. I've done them myself a lot of times. But um, honestly, when you're first starting out, do the stuff that you want to do. Because you want to build up that, um, that regular repetition before you do anything else. And start building up that confidence of, okay, today I'm going to draw and I'm going to draw no matter what. That's the first most important step. Nobody, like, sure, drawing lines might be what could be considered to be an optimized start. But really, the most optimized start is the one that lets you keep doing things for the most amount of time. That's what I believe in. But if it works, it works, right? Cut the sat here. Okay. 
Get a darkness in there. Go. Especially when you're doing perspective stuff, that's when it really does matter. Having the ability to just draw straight confident lines. Because at my school, we um, generally have a lot of perspective assignments, not a lot of them. And I involve using just ink with nothing else. No uh, no rulers and no erasers and no uh, pencil allowed, so... But those kind of assignments does pay a lot of dividends to have a really good ability to just draw straight lines when you need to. Thankfully, that's something that I've uh, gotten fairly good at, pretty confident with my lines these days. With the pen in hand. Get more light in here. I'm pretty cavalier with my brushes. I don't really care what the brush is, I just want to want an interesting mark most of the time. So I'm doing whatever I need to to kind of get an interesting mark on my canvas. Because once you start shaping stuff, you tend to lose a lot of that freeness, which I don't really like. Just a more of a warm. So again, we're just going to act acquiring raw materials here. Just acquiring raw materials so we can start doing the actual painting. For the dark, I'm going to take the dark from my middle dog here. Just so I can unify. Go. We are. Why did my timer stop? Why does it stop at 21 minutes? That's weird. I don't know how much time I spent on this then. Oh, it must be 29 minutes. Alright, we're 29 minutes in there. Probably less than that because I didn't start drawing the second I started the stream. So between 22 and 20, uh, 29, let's just say 25. So I have 35 minutes to finish this. Plenty of time. Okie dokie, got all the primitives in there. I'm gonna do a quick little relight here. Push that down. Oh, sorry about that. Awfully sensitive. Up there, go up here. This is completely up in the contrast of my entire piece. Maybe right over here I can push it a little bit more. And of course in the background I can use some unification. Right there and right there. And down here maybe. A quick little shift from, from that to that. Localize a lot of my stuff. There we go. Do a quick little saturation test. Maybe I can up this out a little bit. Just a little bit, that's fine. Okay, now we can start to mold stuff the way we want to see it. Take a quick drink of water here. And then we can continue. Okie dokie. Now it's all about just manipulating what we already have to get the look that we want, okay? We'll just start with this dog over here. First thing that we do is we'll figure out that shape underneath the eye. Stops right over there. Just about manipulating shapes now. That way, that way, and that way. So I like to think in big solid shapes. That's always what I prefer doing. And whenever I need a new value, I'm just going to grab a new value. So if I need something, that's when I start to look into my palette. Otherwise, I can just continue painting. So for example, I need a slightly lighter value there. And that's going to be it right there. That's my lighter value. That goes across. Oop, lost my value there. Let's grab this one from down here. There you go. Like the more stuff I'm gonna grab from my from my canvas, the more unified everything's gonna look. Oh, there we go. Just trying to unify. Just trying to use shapes as much as I can. Get the maximum usage out of the stuff that I already have on my canvas. So once you kind of find out that full value range, it just becomes a battle of just trying to rearrange stuff the best that you can. And of course, taking note of the edges, saturation, all that stuff does matter. But this is mostly just a value problem right now. And value problems are simple. They're easy enough to solve. We should be pretty good here. That's going to be a slight gradient there, which I'm going to solve with a bit of a round brush, a bit of a ray brush there, easy enough. Grab that light value, the tippity top light value that goes at the center line. That's the center line right there. Easy enough. Goes a bit more rounder than that. 
There we go. Just slowly but surely molding this into the way that we want it to look. Nothing complicated here. Goes there. We have a lot of kind of spickly spackly dark spots, but ultimately it makes the whole area dark. So we can actually wear well in rice to just make the whole area dark with uh, something like this. Right? Kind of get the look we're looking for. Right over there. We'll be fine. Again, I have a light value there, so we can use that to the fullest effect here. Get this dark value down here. Always love these kind of dull, desaturated problems. They're always a little bit tricky. Pretty satisfying to get right. A bit dark there. there go. Again, thinking about the larger shapes here. What's the larger shape? That's the larger shape. That's from right behind the eye. That's the larger shape there. Slowly but surely. Any proportional problems I'll do within a second. Just want to get these values down here. Okay, we have light on this side of the nose. I don't really care about exactly what that light is or what the saturation is really. I just want it to be light right now. That'll help me evaluate a few things down, the, down in the future. Go light down here, light down here. Once I put that eye in, then I'll make my big proportional adjustments. I'm holding off right now. Because I want to get that full value range on here. Because I'll be able to see things a bit clearer. Okay, a deep saturation on the eye. Where are my hard brush? Put the highlight on there. There you go. Now I can do my proportional adjustments on my shape because now I have an anchor point to do so. Right there there. That's really simple adjustments here. Top. Gonna be an arrow. So that, to that, to that, it's gonna be a third. That, to that, to that, it's gonna also gonna be a third, so this gets pulled back. So we move this whole situation a bit downward. Maybe make the entire snout a little bit smaller. That, and then we do this. Oop. Having some organizational issues on my you know, on my program one second. There you go. Just getting everything in order here. Sometimes I press my shotgun so quickly that uh, my program just doesn't respond to them. There you go. Everything kind of settling in here. There we go. Better. There's still some adjustments to be made, but we'll go ahead and start to continue some of this lighting in here. So I have more material to work with. I'm gonna grab some of that warm there on the back. I'm gonna use it in a few areas. So which channel should I put the drawing again? This is a crit section. Go ahead and dump it in there. Probably move that up so it's more clear, but there it is there. Should be uh towards the top of the Discord. I'd rather not show it to everyone due to the fact that I'm hey, don't worry about that, that's not a concern. That shouldn't be a concern. Where's Yaz again? Good to see him. Quit stream very soon, but uh, I'm just doing some painting before we get started with that. It's good to see you there. Hope everything's going alright. There we go. That in there. I'm gonna throw in some lost edges right now, because lost edges are fantastic. What am I gonna lose? I'm going to lose maybe the side of that head right there. I'm gonna lose this guy. Maybe the bottom of his jaw, that's a bit too, too specific. Maybe up here I can lose that, that's fine. I can lose the top of this guy's head maybe. 
Just because I want to get a good little variance of edges here. There go. Just adds a little something something to the piece, you know? Okay. A bit of molding required over here. Get that jaw muscle in order. That's a masseter on the lower jaw. Push that over there. This is going to be one large circular shape like that. It's going to be lit from the bottom side. It creates like a triangular shape just like this. I can just draw the shape out if I need to. I get that triangular shape right there. See that? How it looks so... How it looks like it illuminates the bottom of the jaw right there. Go ahead and make sure that edges aren't too problematic. Push one layer of value on that just to make it nice and standing out. And we can continue. Just rearranging stuff right now. Nothing too fancy. Out. Up there. Okay. Need to get that dark little occlusion near the mall. Happens right about there, I believe. So grab a dark value. I think I don't need a new value for this. I can just use my old values. Right over there is fine. Again, use a value to kind of show the nuzzle. Or the muzzle, rather. Or whatever that's called. Again, I have all the values that I need so far. So again, grab this one for the furrow of the neck. I'm, more, I'm quite comfortable just drawing this shape out if I need to. Usually I like to do this with brushwork, but we can do it either way. I'm actually curious to see what it looks like. Uh, it's not too bad, but I think I do prefer to draw that out. Just grab a hard brush here. It looks like a pipe. Goes up here, goes down here. Simple enough. Grab a like value. Goes across there. That's being very specific. Push the neck across. Again, bottom side of the jaw. I'm gonna get a lot of this stuff in here. Let me just figure out what figure out what I'm looking at here. Right there. That connects to right there. A lot of intricacy here. I don't know if I want to be not simplifying this, but I do want this puppy up here to be the focal point. Push this down here. This can be simplified. Keep that right there. Oh fuck. I can't believe you've done this. Okay, thanks to follow. Grab this darkness in here. Here's that. There's one one layer of extra darkness in there, and that guy is it. This in here, and we have a light value. Let's grab a light value from somewhere else. That's a light value from somewhere else. So put that in there. But most of the time I would always look to my canvas at this stage, because right now we're just in the sculpting stage of our drawing. So we're just looking around the canvas to see if we have the raw material available to us. And then we're just using that raw material to get us the, the result, the look that we want. So I feel like the top of this guy's head's right over there. I mean, that's where the ear kind of sprouts from, right? Just doing some foreshortening in my mind. Should be able to do this. Like that and like that, two strokes. We're looking, I'll be heading off, looking forward to reaching level two. Hey, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. We'll try our best. There we go. Put a bit of light on there. Put a bit of light on there. Making sure that this curvature of this head is kind of sorted out. Get that far profile of the head. Bit more steeper, I feel like. There's that value on there. There's a little bit of a brightness on there because the lighting is coming from that side. We can maybe grab our peak value in here and slope it a bit more. There we go. And maybe push it a bit outward. Okay, for the eyes, we're gonna throw in that dark we just put in the canvas, right over there. These guys usually have some beautiful amount of dark near their eyes. There as well. Okay, 
there. Throw a bit of darkness near the fur of the eye. Additional sculpting for the eyelid. Push that there. Figuring out the bottom of the front jaw now. Or the top jaw rather. There, goes up here. Maybe a little bit too light for my taste. Bracken us again. Here. Pretty good to go there, not bad. Okay, fix the nose shape now. Nose goes up, that shape slightly angled up there. Fine right there. Grab the light values. I'm gonna grab this from the dog down there, because I need an additional sculpting value up here. By the way, that's gonna be serving as the top of my nose. I need one light for this particular area to show the tip or the corner of the nostril. It's gonna be this. I'm here, use me. <laughs> I'm here, use me. There you go. Also, if you wanna if anybody wants to post some crit stuff with the Discord, that's probably what this is gonna stream's gonna be. Great job, by the way. <laughs> we're gonna be doing a crit stream really soon with the Tsar, but right after that, we're gonna be looking over your guys' work. So you're more than welcome to go ahead and start posting that stuff in. We all try our best to help you out. Maybe Ona is gonna be here as well, Angevir. She did share that she'll stop by if she can. A lot of exciting people. Look at him, so cute. All right. Throw some darker values up here, corner of the mouth. I'm gonna stress that mount a little bit backwards here. There you go. Time a little bit. Time is 37 minutes. And continue. We'll maybe consider simplifying just a little bit more, but that's okay. Should still be able to complete. Again, shapes down here. It's gonna be pretty rudimentary. Just need to be completed. To get the full value range there. Looking forward to watch. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna be really fun. Some light on there. Again, most of the time these shapes just need to be completed. Just a little bit of value. And we should be good. This one down here definitely needs a little bit of a pump. A bit more desaturated than that. That's fine. Resolve this guy now. He's okay. He goes all the way up here to his eye. His eye starts oh, right over uh, there. I can't believe you've done this. So there's the darkness up there. So we have the darkest dark value. So we can push that towards the nose. This sculpting is a little bit before I get started. Okay, so how's it going, Mantigar? Good to see you, dude. Okay, so we need a slight little light value up here just to kind of show where the top plane is. So I'm going to grab a value from down there. So now I have a top plane value. I'm going to grab a little bit of this light in here and I'm going to spray it in just to kind of give me a bit more room to maneuver the top of the face. And just to give me a little bit more lightness there. And again, same situation up here. Just to show me exactly where that nose is going to be. That nose is mainly going to be shown through that uh, highlight across the side of it, but it doesn't mean we can't uh, go ahead and throw in a little bit of darkness in there. Just to sort of prime that area. Okay, so let's grab that light now. We'll grab that deep light, which is something like that. About, it's about there. Okay, so now we're going to sculpt with that. This is a little bit clean right there, so what we're going to do instead is we're going to do something with this, maybe. 
This one over here is a little bit more dirty. Uh, okay, I'm okay with using that. I'm gonna grab this guy's value right over there. I'm gonna use it over here. Again, classic example of value reuse. You don't need to be searching and pondering and trying to find the right value on your canvas. I'm sorry, on your palette. You can just, most of the time, just use something off your canvas and that'll work. Just look in that shape as we can. Put in there. The jaw muscle in here, if you want to sort out. Go ahead and add a nice thick stroke for that jaw muscle in there. There's a go, right down here, and right towards the back. Jaw muscle. There's a divot here, so let's put that divot in there. We're gonna have to do that with a bit of a push. Let's push it up there. Let's push that. Let's get that overall gesture there. And don't worry about it, if you want to get a little bit more out of the stream, we're going to be doing a weekly crit stream in uh, in a little bit of time. So we're going to have a, a coaching session with one of my buddies, and then right after we're going to do a crit stream. So if you want to join the Discord and put some work on there, maybe we can help you out. Hello, how's it going, dude? So again, we're, gonna, we're trying to determine everything on this space with just a very, very simple scheme of value here. Nothing too, too complicated. Stuff like this. It was in one big stroke and now it's going to resolve it into a bunch of little strokes. Is there a specific theme? Any work can be submitted. There is no theme. We are open to anything. I have a pretty wide grasp of stuff at, you know, a mediocre level. So if you want a wide, mediocre crit, we be able to help you out. Well, how's it going, dude? How's the work? The eye over here, again, the eye does you don't need to draw a whole eye here, just need to get some values in there. So for example, I want to get a bright value. Remember, bright is a contextual term, so this value is really not that bright. Remember, you don't need crazy amounts of brightness within the darkness. It's all about relatives, so that's going to be our bright value up there. So we sculpt the rest of it using that value. And it's fine if it looks a little bit too harsh or incomplete or whatever. We're going to get what we're looking for. Maybe a little bit too dark. Go a little bit lighter than that. Okay, there you go. There you go. Get in there. So all I look for is to add those primitives in there. Once you add those primitives, things should be fine. The eye itself needs to be moved a little bit to the right, but we'll do that in a second. Get a nice thicker stroke in there, maybe. With this brush. I love this brush. That's why they call me a fat can, but wide and mediocre. There you go. Also, how's it going to glow? Good to see you, dude. Yeah, that's exactly the attitude I'm looking for. <laughs> Mac, you'll do fine. Okay, again, same values all throughout. Yeah, just rearranging stuff. Just rearranging stuff. Nothing fancy happening here. We just have a simple scheme of value. I'm just trying to utilize that to the best of our ability here. Uh, it's changing on shapes. I'm working a bit swiftly here because we are on a time limit. We should be able to get something decent out of this. A lot of squiggly squaggly stuff over there. On the very top. We can just approximate that with this brush here. Get that squiggly squaggly in order. All good. I had some furniture to assemble. Finish now. Hey, nice. Is experience streaming two hours? Yeah, I'm selling a bit earlier. A little bit earlier. Just because I was, gonna, I was gonna do some painting anyway, and I thought, you know, why not? Why not just get some people in here to begin with? So we can start this thing off right. And there we go. Okay, nose now. Nose needs to be choppy chopped a little bit. Chop the nose. Goodbye, nose. Now you add in the new augmented nose 2.0. I'll be actually on and off because I'm cooking it. Don't worry about that. Get your get your meals in order. Don't let me stop you. Stuff in there. Of course, get that light value around the nose and around the corner. Okay, some of this needs to be adjusted. 
Actually, the highlights on this side of the nose. We're gonna push that back down. There's a clearer hierarchy there. Should be good. I see some new people. It's a good call. Yeah, there you go. Down there. Again, whenever there's a bit of a gradient, I'll put it in there with a fancy little brush. Because I don't want there to be a smooth gradient in there. Like that is fine. Just gotta wiggle around with it a little bit. We get what we're looking for. That needs to be pushed forward. Oop. The whole thing should be pushed back. There we go. This stuff back here, we can probably do with selection tool. Just to cut out some shapes. The Insta is pretty insane. Hey, thank you. I appreciate that. Nice of you to check out the Instagram. I dropped off a mat yesterday. I remember. So now you won't get rid of me? Oh, my oh goodness, what are we gonna do? <laughs> also, we have like a shit ton of friends in common? Really? Who do you know? Tell me your secrets. Unwheel your... There you go. That's a selection tool there. Just cutting out those shapes. You see how kind of kind of cool that looks? Looks kind of cool. Doesn't look very cool, but it looks kind of cool. And kind of cool you can work with. It's just the raw material right there. Then you kind of play around with the edges, play around with the value a little bit, get some little highlight pops in there, a little bit of occlusion. And then you got a stew cooking. Socially, I could pan down Lego. I know them. They're good people. Yeah, I think if you spend any time on the art community on Twitch, you tend to get to know everybody. We're a. Uh, Pretty tightly, tightly knit family here. Most of us know most of our friends, and they're all pretty friendly. Except for that one guy, you know who I'm talking about. Get some slight little lights in here. We're we just heavily implying that pooch over here. Did you finish the Pokemon Stadium thing already? Not yet. I uh, did the thumbnails for it. I did finish this one though. So I had a couple of pieces I was working on, so I did this study yesterday. Quick little one hour study while I was talking to some people on Discord. Fun little thing. We have about 12 minutes left in the study. Need to get some light in here. I mean Pokemon, oh my goodness, I have something to show you then. Uh, I did some fun little Pokemon work. How long have you been digital painting? For about a couple of years now. Uh, taking it quite seriously for a couple of years. That's why I'm very confident with uh, my ability to teach people, because it's not really that complicated. You can break it down enough. That's actually fairly straightforward. But I'm going to school right now for um, concept art. Hopefully you'll, uh, you won't see my names in the in the, in the credits of anything, but uh, hopefully you'll see something that I've made in the future. That's the goal right there, to be part of a big production. You see a little James Patel there in the credits. Small, small sized. Video games? Yeah, video games are film. I'm not too picky. There. I like this Pucci over here, he's cool. go okay it turned out pretty good i like this guy on the bottom okay number three number three guy down here oh look at him he's so he just he's just so sad to be here oh need a peak value again need the highlight value to distinguish certain planes there there he seems worried yeah he's he's worried i'll leave him out he's worried because he's the he's the last one to be painted He's worried he's going to be left out. Poor little guy. Can you blame him? Because he's right. He's not going to be painted to anywhere near the same quality. I'm sorry, little guy. But somebody's going to get the short end of the string, and it is you. Okay. 
Do a little bit of wiggly squaggly there. Okay, we need to get the darkest dark. So that's the darkest dark. Do a swishy swish right there. Get that eye in order. Right. It's all about those contrasts. Play with those contrasts to get those eyes eyes looking nice and nice and shiny. So we add this initial this little cup, right? This looks like you're kind of putting um, a cooked egg inside a well of bread, right? You kind of add this little dark crevasse in there, and then you kind of fill it up with some golden, beautiful color like that. What software? It's Krita, K R I T A. I mean, look at how beautiful that, that color is right there. So beautiful. Okay, so fill it up with a beautiful golden color. Oh, it's so good. Looks fantastic. All right, and then we can start to manipulate and mold stuff again. Get that iris in there. Right now it's looking so lizard person. We're gonna add in that light. It's all about how you break this stuff down. Krita's excellent, I really like Krita. Go, just setting stuff up. The more you can simplify the stuff, the better. Just gonna adjust some things that I just did there. Push some lights because I had to put in a bit of airbrush there to add a gradient. Now you can go ahead and throw in a light here. All about kind of playing that light against darkness. So all you're trying to do here, add that dark on top. Again, I'm painting at a significant distance away from my reference and canvas, right? But that's just it's all part of the. Uh, Part of the presentation here, we're just trying to look for the larger ideas. We really care about that larger picture. The dark in there, that's fine. Take a big little zoom out and see what we like, see what we don't like. You made the reference picture? No, that is from the internet. I just grabbed it off of uh, Pinterest. There go, put it in there. Again, just about manipulating the primitives here. Little. What's funny is I've actually worked with this uh, photographer before. I've actually done some of his pieces before. So I know he's kind of cool with me using his stuff. Oh god, I should link his Instagram. Because I painted his work way, way back when. And he was kind of happy about it. So when, I, when I can, I try and get uh, permission. Because it's a nice thing to do, right? It's a decent thing to do. I don't feel two ways about it because ultimately I don't, I don't profit off of any of this work. It's just stuff for personal study. It's a great way to meet people, I gotta say that much. I have a lot of photographers in, on Instagram right now that I can contact. I never have, but it's nice to know that, that they're there, you know? A lot of uh, cosplay photographers, a bunch of people that do armor. Like my friend Kristen, for example, she's uh, an armorer. And it's awesome that she can just uh, send me stuff. Whenever I want to just draw a pretty girl in armor. But I got her with her there. And she actually started drawing recently as well. Can, can go follow her. She's uh, called Wielder of Steel. Wielder of Steel on Instagram. Great girl. There. Got a little bit of this eye in there. Eyebrow. Or eyelid, rather. Okay, some proportional adjustments required. I struggle with armor too. Armor is great. I, I have a lot of fun with armor. It is a little bit tricky, but hey, if you have a if you have a piece with armor in it, I can I can uh, give you the secrets, the the simple secrets to drawing armor because it's not as complicated as you might think. It's just uh, the big thing to kind of realize with armor is how to paint something that's reflective. I can show you. I'll show you when you're doing crits. I feel like there are rules to draw armor, like mechas. No, not as much as you might think. It's it's just um, you gotta identify what what it is really. It's just um, sometimes you channel the wrong amount of fundamentals. Like you do, you paint it like you're painting something matte, for example. But the second you kind of realize how to um, make it reflective, how to paint things that are reflective, everything becomes so much more sensible for armor. Yeah, I'm gonna move that mouth back a little bit. Okay, I have this light down here. Mechas are fun to draw. 
I drew uh, quite a few of them when I was trying to prepare for my Arts Center application because I had a few robots in my application that I want to get better at. They were okay, they were kind of terrible, not gonna lie, but I've gotten a lot better since. They were terrible not because of my poor mecha design, but they were terrible because of the fact that uh, I was very bad with perspective. It's funny, right? I kept drawing more and more of them, and I thought my problem was the fact that I just didn't understand the concept. But it turns out it was perspective I didn't understand. So once I got my perspective back in order, everything became so much easier. Yeah, perspective is a killer. But I think we'll be talking a lot about perspective this stream. Because I think Azar has a few problems. That's the guy that we're going to be doing a very in-depth evaluation of. James is a great mecha teacher. I don't know about that, but I, I do remember helping you out with one of your mechs. There's actually a quiz on my Discord of uh, one of Spod's mechs. Maybe a couple of Spod's mechs, actually. That I helped out with. Nothing too fancy, but I thought I made some good points. A little bit of a uh, highlight right there. That's a, that's a little secret right there for pooches. Putting that little beautiful highlight on the nose. Just about manipulating these principles, manipulating these little primitives. Gonna shift that entire jaw area up a little bit. Make him a little bit more low profile. There you go. Some edge problems up there that I want to resolve. Some of the shapes are a little bit too harsh on my top dog. We should be okay. Again, the, the thing I want to point out here is that I'm not looking to my color mixer at all. Right After a certain point in my piece, it's just about kind of rearranging things on my canvas. It's really important, man, because the more you sort of force colors and values, the more you complicate your piece, the more unruly it becomes. Because I know we've all been in that situation where you, you draw and draw and draw and it just seems like you're drawing yourself into a corner. And it's mostly because of excessive complication. Stick to it simply and then you'll be able to solve complex problems. Usually, whenever you're gonna hit a rut in the piece, it's because, again, things have become a little bit too complicated. Just simplify that stuff down and you should be fine. Okay, again, we've got some core shadow stuff across the nose. Got some secondary shadow stuff that I can put in if I need to. Add my resolution there. Again, there's some stuff across cheekbone. That's a zygomatic bone. On the side of his, of his face, so we can just put that in there really quickly. So this shape's gonna extend upwards, and it's gonna round a little bit around the socket of the eye. Because that's where that zygomatic bone is. Beautiful, beautiful bone. And since it's pushing out in space, it's gonna get a little bit of that bottom highlight. It's really prominent on things like wolves, for example. You see this, uh, this cheekbone really prominently there. On dogs like this, of course, since they're descended from the same, same place, they're gonna have a little bit of that as well. The anatomy is pretty similar. What's funny, funny about anatomy is that if you're going to learn it for just humans or for dogs or for whatever, there are a lot of parallels you find. A lot of parallels. Sometimes things are really weird. Like when you're drawing things like uh, horses, for example. Things are a little bit strange, but um, for the most part you find that everything is... At least has some sort of basis. There. So this is like three dogs in under an hour. We're approaching one hour right now. One hour of work time. We got a lot of work done here. But I'm gonna actually cut the study off in one hour. That's gonna be the, the limit of the study. Just a very quick little experiment. Because you can get a lot done in very little time. It's just uh, the way things usually are. Just a kind of a test of um, how good you are with blocking stuff in. Again, a lot of little issues here with that face up there. I think I slightly should have simplified a bit more with uh, the way that I did this face up here, because I prefer dog number two way more. There's some simplification issues here. Some of the shapes should be a bit stronger. There, a little bit more resolution. A 
Alright. This is all in one layer, by the way. And we can do a final relight here. I'm gonna push some lights. Simple enough, and then we push some darks. There we go. That is one hour and one minute of work. Pretty fun. I'm gonna zoom in on that result there for you. Really quick painting. All the stuff on the top is a little bit uh, scuffy, but yeah, not too bad. <laughs> All right, so in about five or ten minutes, we're going to be getting on call with the Tsar. So uh, we're going to be doing some crits for him. So I uh, should announce again that we are going to be doing a very in-depth crit stream. Um, so if you guys got any pieces that you want me to look at, you're more than welcome to put it up on that Discord channel. Uh, on the Discord, just put everything up there. And I should be able to help you out. I've got a few pieces in there already that we can kind of go through. And of course, most of it's going to be... Um, us looking at your boy, what's his name? Mr. Randomnees, whatever his name is. I'm gonna be looking at his work first. And there you go, how's it going, Azar? You're gonna do an isolated perspective practice and then apply to what you've learned for some mechas? Yeah, the, the isolated perspective stuff is gonna be really important. We'll get into it a little bit more, uh, because if it's a question, then we can go ahead and um, solve that. Because I'll be taking questions at the end of the stream as well. I'll try my best, help you out. Also, I remember you talking about Pokemon. So uh, I can show you some of that, uh, some of that good, good Pokemon stuff we've been doing recently. I went back and I looked at some of the old Pokemons that I've drawn, Pokemons that I've drawn, and uh, my goodness, are those bad? They are horrendous. So um, I'm glad that these ones are actually somewhat decent. Here's some Pokemon that I've drawn for school. I know they're not the original style or whatever, but uh, they're, they're they're interesting. They're kind of cool. I did these for school. I like my Charizard. He's sick. I don't know where I'm getting this fever from, but I've been feeling feverish all day, which is weird because I don't fall sick. The Charizard is so damn expressive, I, <laughs> I think I basically grabbed the... Look, let me show you what my reference was, I guess. My primary reference for the Charizard was... Um, was this... Corona? I don't think so. <laughs> I think it's just... Uh... I'm not quite sure what it is, actually, but I, I have been pulling all-nighters about every day for the last two weeks. But I, I just use this as a basic reference. But then I, I use a bunch of things like Komodo dragons and giant tortoises and things to get some detail in there. But where's Venusaur? Mm. He's not here because, because I hate him. Because only cheesers and losers use Venusaur in Pokemon. Because they want to cheese the first two gyms and I'm not about that life. Charmander all the way. I'm kidding, it's fine. I, I might draw Venusaur in the future. I think he'd be fun to draw. So many textures involved. I think me and Ab's got another fight about it. <laughs> the other strip. That's fun. Hey, look at that read right there, man. Look at our painting and look at the reference. That's a pretty fucking solid read. The one down there is a bit mangy. Uh, you should have the lighting on that, but that's actually not bad. That's a decent uh, thumbnail read. Not too shabby. Get in there, for sure.
I'm probably gonna have to window capture Azar's stream so you guys can see his face on my stream. It's probably gonna be a good idea. Let's do some quick painting while we're waiting. We can do some quick sketch paintings. Take a chug of water first. Let's draw a quick knight in armor. Because some, some of you guys are talking about armor. Let's um let's do something quickly with armor, shall we? While we wait. The tools that are gonna be involved here. I'm gonna use one brush. One opportunity. I'm gonna use this brush over here. It's a round brush with some opacity, alright? I wanted to submit something for critique, but I can't listen for another hour because I'm at work. Yeah, 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 post anyway. Post anyway. I'll I'll make sure to link the vault for you. Wanted to catch you on before I head to bed. Hope all is well, man. All's good, dude. We're doing a crit stream, so um, if you want to post anything, that'll be all good. Let's draw some armor, shall we? So let's go ahead and uh, figure out some details here. Let's give a standard kind of knight helm with a maybe a visor in there. Right? Maybe he's got some chainmail on either side. He's got his initial breastplate. Comes out there. Just the initial drawing, nothing too complicated. Nice and free, nice and open. Just nice and easy. I like how porkly they can sometimes be. Like a porkly knight belly, always cool. Goes down into the armor belt. Got some of these lance supports on both sides. Always helps to kind of know what you're looking at to a certain degree. Oh, we can just deal with that, I think. That's fine. Right, we can maybe add some cloth elements in here. Maybe that can be cloth right there. That'll be fun. Throw some cloth in there. It's gonna be a very front-on, very basic view, but you can see how simple this is gonna to be to um, to paint. So I'm gonna throw some gauntlets down there. We can make it a bit more interesting, add some uh, embroidery and stuff, maybe. But we can stick with just something really straightforward for right now. That attaches right there, simple enough. Okay, so let's imagine that this is what we're going to be painting, right? Just, just as, a, as a quick little idea. So we're going to be painting a knight that looks like that. A really simple design, not too much complication going on here. So let's go ahead and start. First thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to lay in some gradient on the back. Because gradient always looks nice. Nicer to draw on a background that has some amount of variation. So I'm going to hit it with some dark from the top and light from the bottom. Very standard in any sort of painting. Don't worry about that, Kyle. Cheers, canvas. It is nighttime, yes. Hit it with some dark, not that much dark, Jesus Christ, that's a little bit excessive. Just a little bit of dark from the top. And that. Sorry, I'm stick for gradients. There you go. There you go. A little bit too much. Okay, so now that you're done with that little stage there, you can start to lay in some primary stuff. So I'm gonna fill this stuff with value right now. So the armor is gonna generally generally be Maybe about that dark. So I'm just gonna put some larger strokes in there. Large, beautiful strokes. Just to kind of darken up their overall area the armor's gonna occupy. Nothing too complicated. Okay, so here's the first big one. First big one is we wanna add occlusion. Okay? Occlusion is a big thing to make armor look like armor. So there's gonna be places on the armor that are gonna be quite dark. So I wanna ensure that I know where those places are to begin with, okay? I wanna know exactly where those places are to begin with on the armor. So they're gonna be rivets there, they're gonna be plates there, they're gonna be a whole lot of things there. But ultimately, just because of the nature of what armor is, is a reflective surface, you're gonna have these incredible areas of occlusion. So really, one of your first primary goals is to kind of figure out exactly where those armor, or where that particular stuff happens, right? So I'm gonna, first of all, figure that stuff out. So let's just say it goes right there, 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 and there. So I now have these natural areas of occlusion, which are going to really help me find my way through the piece. Okay? So after that, I'm going to put some graphic read element in there, which basically goes about this kind of logic, which is I have cloth right there, so the cloth's going to be brighter than the armor. In You know, just not in, not in general, but in terms of local value. That's going to be cloth right there. And let's just say maybe he has some cloth on his face. Do I want to put that in there? Not really required. Okay, so after that, big thing to, do, to worry about here is light source. So light source is going to come from the top, and what, that's, what is that going to do really? That's going to create a series of shapes on my armor, and the big thing about this is that these shapes are going to be very indicative of that light source itself. So the source, the source value 
and the value on the armor that stuff is going to be really close together and why is that that's because it's a reflective surface so what reflective surfaces do is generally speaking they will emulate that light source as much as they possibly can am i in the wrong layer here ah oh, this that's, that's a problem there we can just do it this way instead so what's going to happen here i'm going to assume that this is going to be my light source value something approximately there so the reason that armor looks the way that it does is because reflective surfaces have a much greater ability to capture exactly what that light source looks like so unlike matte surfaces matte surfaces are going to just give you an impression of what something is because it'll give you like a generalized highlight but a reflective surface will give you everything you need so as long as you kind of know where something is generally pointing you'll be able to get a very strong impression of a reflective surface as long as you ensure that that value contrast is really really high because that's really what happens with a light source so i'm imagining this guy currently in outside in the in the open right he's outside in the open and he's is being lit by the sun and the sky so that big beautiful light right there that's the sun and this secondary light right, right over here that's the sky so basically what i'm doing is i'm just adding sun and sky all throughout this piece and the more i do that the more you get the impression that oh wait a second wait a second this must be armor because nothing else reacts that way nothing else reacts in this particular way so you see we're slowly kind of building up this idea here and there's one more level to this i'll get to that there's one more level to this which is a shadow but we can start right over here and then everything becomes a little bit more sensible same thing over here i throw in a light across i throw in a light across right and i throw in a the, the light of the sky across and everything starts to look a little bit more sensible starts to look a little bit more like the way we want it to I can also talk, talk about the edges here the edges over here get a little bit of light right there edges over here get a bit of light right there again considering that it's going to be going off of the ambient light so your ability to command light and shadow are going to be tantamount to a good or bad piece with armor right so already it's looking kind of armory right maybe i want to instead push this to more of a slightly darker gray how about that okay that's fine now that's one component the second component is the fact that it's not just reflecting the light sources which is the sun and the sky but if there are things around the surroundings that's also going to get reflected that's the second component so number one is the light sources which is sun and sky number two is surrounding so for example imagine this guy is going to be sitting on a pavilion or a plane right he's just minding his own business but ultimately there's going to be a horizon line and there's going to be darkness because the ground is going to be a lot darker than the sky so we can assume there's going to be something like this playing across the armor why is that because essentially what this guy is looking at he's looking at a surrounding which is a horizon line he's looking at the sky and he's looking at a sun in the sky so all of that is being transferred to his helmet so his helmet's like a reflection of what's happening because it's a reflective surface right so his helmet's going to reflect all that stuff so whenever something's kind of pointing a bit horizontal, that stuff can now be pushed towards this, this new value we have right now. So when something's pointing front, frontwards, that can be pushed to this value. Okay, can you push to this value? Easy, easy, easy. Right over there. Right, so we get this value now, kind of playing around things. So this stuff is pointing front, so this can get this value now. So as long as you're very consistent with this, you're gonna be just fine when it comes to painting armor. Now I can push stuff. I can push stuff with specular. I can push stuff with specular right there. The true highlight. I can add things like cost shadow in here, which always serve to kind of help the piece. Ooh, that's a little bit harsh. What's my pressure at? Okay, there you go. It's gonna be some cost shadow down here. Some cost shadow down here. Right? Maybe the. Um, chest is going to cost a little bit down here and we can kind of clean this up a little bit this helmet's going to cost on the face okay and of course this is going to still grab some stuff from the background this little secondary plate here it'll still grab stuff from the background because it's still pointing up despite everything else it's still pointing up even if it's in shadow you're still going to get some sort of lighting characteristic on it. And again, remember that occlusion. Big, big part of armor. Remember that occlusion. Occlusion needs to be there. Right? And this will kind of go back to this value over here when it goes out of the shadow. Same thing over here. 
can be understood. Okay. So throw in this darkness over here. Easy enough. We can also throw in some little divots and, and details over here. Cheers, Rex. Have a good one. That, like that, like that, like that. To add in information about the formation of stuff, how things are bolted together. We can add things like straps inside, that's also totally fine. We can add stuff in there. Alright, then also, now this is the third part. The first part is the main light sources, second part is the ground basically. Now here's the third part, the armor re re reflect off of itself. So for example, get this darkness here, it's supposed to go there. And get this darkness over here, on lightness over there, it's supposed to go there. But for example, um, I can see on this side, maybe if I have some darkness, let me just shade the um, cloth elements here. That goes like that basically. So if I have darkness on either side, like that, and let me get this darkness in here, like I said before, the occlusions really matter. What's going to happen to the armor is the armor is going to see that, oh my goodness, what's right next to me? There's darkness right next to me, and it's going to reflect that as well. So not just the sky or the sun, and not just the background, but also the things that are directly in proximity. So we're going to have stuff like this happen. We're going to get this darkness across the side of the armor. Stuff like that, it's reflecting this stuff. And this applies to even lights. So for example, you'll get a little bit of stuff up here. Very, very common to see this because of the way the armor is built. You'll get a little bit of this light up here, like that. Because that's a reflection of that secondary plate down there. It's reflecting back upwards. Right? Why did Lanza go into? I was looking at your face earlier today. Because I was in the selfie uh, channel of my Discord. Does that make any sense? So again, same thing over here. I can see the, the bottom side of this plate so that goes dark. Right? And of course, there's also a phenomenon called double reflection, but we're not going to get into that right now. It's a little too complicated. But again, I can see the side of my arm right over there, so I can get this darkness right over there. I can see the side of my arm, so I can get this darkness right over there. And you see, slowly but surely, we we'll get a strong read of armor. Right? Again. So again, just the simple logic. This is front-facing, so I can see the ground. Can see the ground here right can see the ground but maybe this side can see a little bit of the sky maybe there's a break or something there's a break in the sky so maybe i'll get a little bit of like lightness up across this side right it ultimately depends on how you want to consider your environment maybe there's the secondary light source somewhere it doesn't really matter but ultimately this is what it's going to look like maybe the this over here perhaps you know and it's all about how you want to maybe build this armor in your head this would be a lot rounder, for example, have a roundish highlight somewhere. But that's the basic idea of how you want to paint any armor. Again, the more you're attentive to this idea, that, oh, if it's near something, it's going to get that as a resorting value, the more like armor it's going to look like. It's all about a game of persistence and diligence. So you're just going to find out where things are. And the more you do it, the better it's going to look. And that. One thing I'm not too sure is why is the circular piece on the left side of his chest is shadow on top? Okay, it's, that's because this this little plate armor, typically on armor, it's it's shaped like this. From the side, it's shaped like that. I'm exaggerating here, but this is how it's shaped. So that the this side actually faces down, and this side faces upwards. So you see how that it, it makes it look like it's kind of curved, like a, like an ear almost, like a like a dented ear. That's just me using value to kind of convey that. That's a very common thing on armor. For that to happen. So I'm actually pulling from uh, from muscle memory there. And you can gonna go ahead and add in some details, like maybe there are trees or something. And go ahead and put that stuff there. And you see, I mean, we're basically all of the all of the way the way there then. And of course, you can put fun little stuff here. Like you can put in belt buckles, for example, to show how things are uh, attached. Right there and right there, for example, show a little bit of that stuff. You can also do lovely things like adding in details. Like, for example, I can do some frilling stuff here. So I can frill the side of the armor, like that. Very, very simple. Simple pattern stuff. Armor detailing is a whole other subject. There's a lot to learn there. But there are some very simple kind of tenants to it. 
like frilling, fluting, embossment, etching. There's a lot of stuff to, to learn in that topic. The same kind of principle still applies, though. since it's still metal, you still have the reflection, you still have the bounce light, and of course you still have that beautiful occlusion. That occlusion really sells it, because nothing else is going to react in that sudden stark way, except for armor. Or metal, rather. So I can just add some detail in there. I'm just doing it really generically. Additional examples of uh, armor detail. This is supposed to look like this, by the way. I'm being really lazy here. It's, um, it's a curved floral pattern. That's one of the things that I've seen on armor a lot of the times. You get this kind of curved kind of rope pattern around certain parts. And of course, when you, once you're going to make that change, make sure it's unified with everything else. So, I'll, I'll unify it by just darkening it up a little bit more, like that. Additional detail stuff can be fluting, for example. You can flute across the side, using these stroke marks, very common on armor. And that can be done fairly easily by just making some lighter marks, and then some darker marks underneath. That's a flute mark. It's basically like armor scoring, I guess. It's a slight little protrusion. Right? Also pretty common is to have glyphs and stuff on the armor. Which is pretty simple to do if you kind of have a good command of a over selection tool, you can draw glyphs on the armor. So basically you would have something like that. To darken it up slightly. Right, and then you can just pull out some glyphs, glyph shapes on top. Just to kind of ensure that the, it looks like it's been marked. Like that. So it goes slightly lighter, maybe slightly lighter than that. Maybe not that light, use an airbrush to control it a bit better. So just like that for example, that's fine. Just for the sake of speed. And we can push this, make it a bit more interesting. Generally speaking, this is going to be glyphed in like Latin. So Latin is like a really spiky, squarey language. So make it like a little bit more Latin-y, I guess. You can add some darkness in there as well. This is just a basic inscription, and then add some darkness on top to make sure that everything fits in. Because it's going to get a bit of kosh out of there. And then maybe add a bit of a lip there if you want. A lip would be like this now, with the light. But there's so many things to go into armor. So many little things. And there's also cloth elements as well, that I can think about. And don't forget these rivets as well, they're going to be everywhere. These rivets are going to be all over the place. And that can be simply done with a bit of a dark and a bit of a light right next to each other. And not to mention, once you're done with that, then comes the beautiful task of staining it. Adding imperfections, so armor is very unclean, generally speaking. So you can add these variety of kind of stains across the side of it to complete stuff. So don't make it so harsh just to change the local value, but enough that it's kind of noticeable. It looks like scoring or scalding or some amount of um, wear and tear. So to that end, you can also add in edge marks, you can add in marks like this, for example, kind of paint in, and then use the existing value to add in a bit of a mark right there. To make it look like it's been used, right? So a whole bunch of techniques here. A lot of stuff that can be used. And lighten this up a little bit. That cloth element right there. There's cloth you can kind of get away with by just adding in some triangular fold shapes. It'll be simple. Yeah, but that's basically everything that you need to do to paint something in armor. I think that look uh, a bit more sensible. Then grab that peak value up there. Peak value up here. Peak value up there. Inclusion. Inclusion. And this is just from my mind, right? So there's no reference in walls, but even with the reference, it'll be crazy. Right there, right there. I remember everything must be radiated, of course, so... That happens later. And some darkness down there, just for shits and giggles. But yeah, you can get a pretty appreciable result really quickly. 
And of course, you can just invent stuff, you know? You can just say, oh, there's a tree there. You know, there's a tree on the side. So there, there we go, this is the tree. That's the tree from seen by the, uh, the, top, the top side of the armor. So you'll also see the tree over here. You'll also see a bit of the tree over here, right? So it's just about thinking about what's in the environment. Just invent stuff if you need to, and then just put it on the armor. But the thing is, it needs to be consistent. Otherwise, it looks like it looks a little bit weird if it's not consistent. You got to be a little bit careful. So yeah, that's basically all you need to know. It's really fun. I love painting armor. So that's the be all end all of it. That'll get darkness right over there. Again, going back to our principles. That'll get darkness right over there. That'll get darkness right over there. And then we can get some reflected light from the bottom. And then the bottom will get a reflected light from the ground. Because the ground closer to the armor will act like a secondary source. Except that, remember, it's going to be a representative of the source. So if the source light is the sun, the ground's going to be much, much darker than the sun. But still lighter. Light enough for you to be able to see it. So again, just like you think about bounce light. If that's my main light, it's going to be less than that. But enough that it kind of creates an effect. That kind of idea. That, that way you can really kind of have a good hierarchy. You're calling me, what? Oh, shit. <laughs> Hello? Yo, what's up? Hey, how's it going? Sorry, I'm explaining something to my stream. Uh, I need to set this up for no, a second. That's okay. You can just keep going. I can keep stalling if you want to. No, no, it's good. It's good. Let me get your stream up on my stream. My stream? Oh, oh, yeah, okay. I oh, I should probably do that. Okay. I'm just going to okay. capture this. What's your stream name again? Oh, uh, okay. Um, Mr. Underscore Random Name. Oh my god, why would you choose something like that? I don't know, man. What's All right, your go. name? Indian Abroad 94. <laughs> this is the first time we actually talk to each other, like, voice to voice. Does that make you feel weird? Uh, no. It's just, yeah, a little bit. I don't know, man. It's just, you know. We've, like, uh... T spoken through streams for like I don't know how long a year and a half we've spoken five times on discord okay true <laughs> true all right um, let me like... uh capture our stream here uh guys bear with me for a second I got uh, invaded by this this nobody uh we're gonna nobody. go ahead and help him out oh. okay thanks thanks I guess I'm gonna add your stream as well um to my stream hang on um where do I do this you know that, um, what's that guy's name? Uh, whatever the guy's, the guy that makes like, the, the fake videos of like mocking people, Ethan Becker. I really wanted yeah, to name yeah. the stream like Fixing Mr. Random News' Trash Art, <laughs> but I thought that's gonna like make too many people mad, so I didn't do it. Oh, uh, no, that, that, would be, that would be good, that would be good. Very clickbaity though. Okay, let me uh, see what I need to do here. Browser source? Let's see. Wait, what the fuck? You guys are getting an ad. Let's see, if I do that, does that work? It's not working. Okay, I can't add your stream onto my stream. It's it, it's scuffed, man, I'm sorry. Okay, let me just try and do yours and mine, hopefully. Otherwise we can just do, um, we probably should have done this off stream. <laughs> One second, guys. Yeah, we should have prepared, but it's okay. Fine, we'll just wing it. What do you have for me, by the way? What are we gonna look at today? Um, so I sent you a couple of uh, uh, pictures on uh, the, in the DMs. I slid in your DMs. All right. And I have a character design. I have an illustration, and then I did a caricature last night. Um, the character I didn't spend too much time on, so I don't know if it's worth critting. But um, I think the design, the character design, and the the finished illustration is probably what I would maybe look at. Can do, can do. Okay, I think I got your stream on my stream. The echo? Is there an echo? Wait, yeah. are you guys watching his stream as well at the same time? If there's an echo, you gotta mute one of the streams. Yeah, no, cause uh, I don't have you open. Wait, no, yeah, I don't have you open on my stream. I, just, I, I only have the voice call. Give me a quick audio check, by the way. Is he audible? Kappa, Kappa, one, two, three. Hello, hello, testing, testing. Can I have a pog champ in the chat? Hello? <laughs> Alright, Pog, <laughs> Pog champs are, are rolling in, that's how I like it. Alright. 
All right. It's a bit scuffed, guys, but you know what? Bear with us, okay? When you have two scuffed boys uh, streaming together, uh, that's how it's going to go. Um, I'm just going to quickly crop have... you. Okay. Wait. Crop me out? Okay. Thanks, I guess. So how are you doing, James? I don't know. I don't know. I have a little bit of a fever running, but uh, nothing too a problematic. Fever? Yeah, yeah. I think it has something to do with all the uh, all nighters that are spent in the past couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes, like you, you know, your body's gonna get sick, but because you're like you know staying busy and keeping yourself stressed, it doesn't get sick. But then once you're done with all your work, it just like that's when you get sick. You know. This random knees guy is cringe as fuck. Okay, thanks. Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. So if you guys aren't uh, familiar with me, my name is Indiana Brody K. James, and I was a study streamer on Twitch. Right now I go to FCD, which is a school for pretentious douchebags because I want to get into the concept art industry. But I have been um, helping people to learn how to draw to at least my level, which is adequate, I guess. So to that end, I've been uh, helping Azar. Uh, he's been my dependent. He's been my ward. I've been his caretaker for the last year and a half, helping him yep. along with uh, with all things art. And, you know, some things in the bedroom as well, but we don't talk about that. But uh, we're going to be trying to um, help him out with something very specific. So I think I got my crop in order. There you go. We should be fine. <coughs> Just, what is that, Azar? Uh, nothing, nothing. All right. I have Azar's stream right there. I'm going to hide my subscribers because <laughs> who cares about those? And... Um, we should be good to go. Okay, so what do you have for me? Run me through these pieces. Okay. All right. Um, so you have my stream open, right? Yep. Okay, so you can see my screen. Mm -hmm. so? I can see your stream. All right, yeah. cool. All right so um, let me just go ahead and open. So the, the first piece, I suppose, is this one here. So um, the finished illustration looks like this um and i just have some symbols in the background um uh which you know are related to um the occupation but essentially what this piece is about um uh, it's about um making specific occupations as uh, superheroes or presenting them that way um we wanted to kind of highlight uh very important jobs especially during corona times uh jobs that people might not think about so um you know, sanitation workers, grocery store workers, obviously doctors and, 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 you know, those jobs are very important, but there's also, you know, jobs that people just don't think about. And so um, a sanitary worker or, a, you know, garbage man is, is what I thought of. Um, and um, so, you know, we, we went through the uh, design process. Um, I made a mistake of like going into silhouettes first because I was trying to like use uh, silhouettes for um, designing an idea. But, uh, you know, James taught me that, um, you know, you silhouette an idea, you don't silhouette for an idea, right? Isn't that what you said? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. The thing with silhouetting without a clear plan, because there's a lot of thinking involved before you actually start drawing. So right now, I mean, I don't think those silhouettes are necessarily bad. But the big issue I find is that you're just playing around with, with like shape with no real like clear goal. Like look at the forearm guy that's holding a bunch of like uh, shopping bags. That guy... You know, while he kind of, kind of looks cool, it's kind of difficult to say what is he even like doing, right? I mean, it's it's looks like a cool kind of variation of shape, but it doesn't apply to you know whatever your design spec is. So you you might be kind of getting cool ideas out there, but they don't really refer back to your original design. So just because it's cool doesn't mean it, it's going to work for your for your requirement. So um, yeah, that's and the idea. also like also like one thing that you also said is because I um, have so little material to go off of because I didn't do my research, what actually ends up happening is that um, I only end up making like four silhouettes before I run out of juice. And they also look very similar to each other because I don't have enough practice under my belt. So I got stuck here. And so you kind of went through um, an entire design process, which you explained in 50 minutes, but it's on his YouTube channel. If you guys are interested, it's very good. And it was super helpful for me. Um, so, you know, I made um, a design board with wish lists. So I had a garbage person, you know, that was what the, the subject was. And I wanted to make some sort of machinery, which would help him clean. So that could either be like a claw oh, attached fuck. to the back of I him can't believe you've done uh, this. to help pick up garbage or maybe a vacuum. 
uh, similar to like this truck over here. Um, and then, uh, you know, thought about like how it would work, you know, but uh, essentially I took this wish list, got some references, made some very shitty thumbnails, as you say. And then um, another thing that you said, which was very important is like, this isn't a linear process where you go from wish list to reference to final thumbnails. It's like a circular process. I don't know what word you used. It was a different mm -hmm. word. Cyclical. Yeah, cyclical. Uh, where you go like back to wish list, then to reference, maybe update your wish list again, and then back to thumbnails, and and so on. So um, you know, eventually I was like, okay, I want like um, you know something on his back, a back mounted vacuum. And it has a uh, joysticks, which is used to control, and he has leg support as a counterweight uh, because the uh, backpack is so heavy. And so eventually, um, I came up with a design like this, which um, is cool, I suppose. But then another important thing that you mentioned is think about um, how the design actually functions. So these are vacuums but they're way too big for these little thin metal arms, right? Mm -hmm. And also, like, when it sucks up the garbage, how is it going to be transferred from here to the backpack when this is just a hunk of metal? So I changed it to a tube instead and made uh, the vacuum part smaller um, and eventually it came to this thing. And you told me that maybe I should make the, the tube bigger because it's quite small, and so... Eventually, I changed it one more time uh, to this here, uh, which uh, finally became this uh, this drawing here. So that's my design. But um, in terms of style, also they wanted a very like comic book kind of a like pop art style, which is not my thing. I I have more of a painterly style, and so I had to do line art, and um, you know. Uh, I was just not very comfortable with the with, with the style, but um, I think we're here to talk about design and, and, and perspective and fundamentals, you know? Okay, so with the question of style, do you want to kind of head towards more of like a what's more usable in the industry right now? Or do you want to focus on that kind of cartoony style that was the initial requirement? Um, I mean, I'm done the assignment, so I don't feel like the need to go back to this cartoony style. I feel like mm -hmm. personally, I would prefer... Um, Focusing something that's more usable using the industry. Yeah. Okay. So would you like to make the focus of this? Uh, this little guided thing you want to let's try and make at least some initial foray into trying to make this Into like a standard. What's a good uh, character render for our character portfolio? Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, we can do that uh, right before that I just want to quickly go through so I, I think I really want to make this the big uh, idea of the stream But right before that I want to quickly talk about your other pieces that we have so I see the yep. uh, the Dolly Parton caricature, so let's go ahead and look at that. I'll just make a couple of notes here, but uh, we're not going to linger here too long. But we'll just try and ensure that we cover all the pieces, first and foremost. Um, Thank you, Interglow. That's sweet. We can do this right now or later, up to you. Because I have a bunch of crits to do anyway for my community. Um, do you want to crit the Dolly Parton one as well? Is that yeah, what you're I, think, I think I'll crit the other two pieces later is what I'm going to do. But we'll talk about the speech right now. Can you open my, my stream on your stream by any chance? Like Window Capture mm. Chrome or something? Um, let's see here. Maybe. Um, hmm, if I do, let's see, if I do this, bear with. I don't know if this is going to work. Um, okay, in the meantime, I'm going to pull up some references. Yeah. Okay. So, let's see if this works here. If I do that. So, right now you guys can only see my hand, I think. Okay, that's not working. Let me just try one more thing. And if that doesn't work, um, okay, let's see here. Okay, that's not working either. Okay, I have I have uh, another solution. Window capture. Let's do this. Actually, no. Let's do. There we go. That should work. Okay. Yeah. I think. I think that's good, and I'll just place you somewhere in the corner there okay 
All right, I'm just grabbing my last reference here. So, whenever you're kind of thinking about a character design in general, right? This is going to be. Oh, it has a gun. Speaking of a good character artist, so this is a kind of good, like really good standardized industry work that we can see in some top studios, right? We got some Riot work and some Overwatch work. Overwatch is generally considered to be like almost like the gold standard of stuff. This is a terrible quality reference, but um, the overall idea is there, right? What do we kind of expect to see? So most of the time for it to be a usable concept you want to kind of think about how things are positioned all throughout so the final product for our character art is generally going to be a turnaround so something like this is a very very common example that's a work by Zeronis who's somebody that works for uh, for Riot for some time now really really good artist but there's some overarching kind of themes that play into this idea right one of the first ones is that the lighting the colors everything is painted in some degree of realism right so that's why I had an initial issue with this whole assignment because they said they wanted to paint stuff in more of a cartoony style which to be fair I've seen in a couple of instances but mostly I see this in thumbnailing but not in final renders right so all of this idea of what it might look good if it's done right ultimately it doesn't really give you all that much when it comes to uh, the eventual product because unless the product is going to go in towards having an animated um, character like maybe Spyro or something like that but most of the time it's for games and movies and games and movies kind of delve into the realism side of things so we want to paint things in some degree of um of realism right mm -hmm. yeah okay so looking at these things what do we kind of see here we see a pretty standardized render one of the things we're going to point out here is since the character is the focus they're trying to make everything be um you know as distinct as possible the goal with these kind of things mainly is that I want to be able to pass this design to the next stage in the pipeline, which is going to be a 3D artist, or might be an animator, could be anything really. But the, the fact is that everything over here needs to be readable, right? That's the that's the big part of all of this stuff. So for games and movies, most of the time, you want to have the main character be very distinct. You want to have all the aspects of him kind of covered, so that he's going to be able to be modeled or created or made in whatever fashion is required. And you'll have callouts, for example, for things that aren't very clear. So we don't have to think too much about callouts right now, this comes maybe a step later. But the major idea over here I want you to think about is, okay, number one, painted in realism. Number two, clarity. That's a big deal because nothing is being hidden over here. Of course, this guy is a monster and he refuses to hide anything. Everything is really clear and his work is ex excellent. But the idea is that everything is quite clear, right? Everything's quite clear, it's distinct and it's rendered well. So, so going, uh, what's, what's a callout? Uh, a callout is when something is maybe not as distinct because you, you, you can only do a certain amount of things uh well when you're kind of showing off a design right you can only show a certain amount of things in one shot but ultimately some things require a bit more clarification so what you do is you call them out or you bring them out and you blow them up so for example this uh, dagger over here is an example of a call out wherein you're uh, supplying additional information for something that might potentially be obscured or might potentially be somewhat diminished by the overall quality of the final presentation Right, so you do use callouts to just clarify even further. So maybe I want to know, maybe the modeler wants to know exactly what the handle looks like, but maybe he's grabbing onto the handle with his hand and is blocking that part. So in order for it to be a fully usable concept, we'll say, okay, well, this is what the handle looks like, and I brought it out. Same thing goes for over here. They call out the face, for instance, because maybe the face is being hidden by the hood, things like that. And of course, you can't show everything of the character in one angle. So that's why I usually have one big version of the character in the three-fourth. And things like that and maybe additional information just for the layout stuff like this is, is usually what you see in most uh, finalized character presentations right so what can we do to make this whole situation better do you have any other finished renders of uh, any characters like full ones like this one full rendered oh um you know i don't i might not actually have any let me oh boy um can i think of any no, I tend to do like torso up illustrations, which aren't really, you know, th those are illustrations, those aren't concepts, you know. Um, and so my answer to that question is actually no, I don't, I don't have uh, any um, full body renders. Okay, then we can just make this the, the first one. So I'm going to script this and tell you what you need to kind of push this towards a bit more realism. And we can talk about some facets over here that are pretty important to kind of figure out uh, that was really going to help. The first one that I want to bring to attention here uh, is just the idea of what do you need to make this look realistic, right? What are the concepts, what are the fundamental ideas to make something look realistic in terms of painting it, right? So before we get there, let's just talk about the design for a couple of seconds here, because I'm not going to go too much into design. We have uh, talked about that at length in the past, so it's not a huge deal. 
um, but I definitely think there are a lot of improvements that were made since we last looked at the design. I think the top over here looks uh, significantly better uh, than we last saw it. I have a lot of issues with uh, the way that a lot of things are drawn here, like the arms and the legs are a little bit too kind of poofy for my liking. And maybe the head's a little bit too small. I sort of understand the fact that you're heading towards that kind of superhero look, but there's a lot of inconsistency with the piece. For instance, for a guy that's this buff with arms this large, I kind of want to expect to see maybe some traps, you know, kind of going from the side of his uh, of his arms all the way up to his neck, as opposed to him looking like um, like he's a very skinny guy piloting a very muscular guy, you know? So I want to see a, a bit more associated musculature uh, with the overall drawing, so that needs to be adjusted for this to be believable. The head in general needs to be enlarged, right, for this to make uh, any sort of sense. I kind of get that it's meant to be more comic-y, but even stuff like Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, all these very common Marvel superheroes and, and DC superheroes, all of them, they still maintain a good sense of proportion, unless you're talking about some really crazy artists that really like to kind of defy the bonds of reality. For the most part, you kind of figure out that um, things are, are painted pretty accurately, they're drawn pretty accurately to, to reality, so the proportion is still maintained. Now, while the people themselves might be really muscular or whatever, it's still within the bounds of reality. So every time you kind of break stuff like that, it tends to make things look a little bit um, amateur. So that's stuff that needs to be adjusted, right? So the overall head over here, I probably increase the size of it a bit more, just so that things tend to fit a bit, bit better on everything else. Right? Just something like that is a, it's a very simple change that can be made. And already it looks like, okay, maybe that's possible now. Maybe it's possible, right? Mm. So yeah, sure. let's talk about the rendering and the lighting for a second. I want you to be thinking about this every time you draw something and every time you render something. The first thing is everything in realism it's kind of bounded in terms of a light. So to something look realistic, even if the drawing is not realistic, it needs to be lit realistically for you to kind of believe it. So every time you draw something, I want you to think about what your light sources are. And I think you could pay a bit better attention over here to what the light source is actually supposed to be. So before you do anything else, sort of decide, right? Sort of decide what light source or what light is gonna best suit your character in terms of both direction and characteristic. Right, because ultimately you go, you want to choose the best angle to show the most interesting things off on your character, as well as you want to choose a color of the light which kind of contrasts well with your character to show off some of those much more juicier elements. And it's it's kind of done all throughout the place, right? You won't use maybe two saturated lights in this kind of design. For example, over here, lights lights are not super super saturated in these examples, but there's still a very clear temperature difference that's happening over here. The lights are going a little bit more towards the warm desat, and the cools are going more towards that cooler sort of reddish purple, and that happens consistently across the entire image, right? So you want to have that temperature difference across your piece, and right now, it seems like everything is just um, maybe a darker version of the local color, which I think. Wait, wait. So go um, wait, go back to that piece. Yep. Um. Like, like the rendered one mm -hmm. uh, no, no yeah that one that one um so the warms are what'd you say desaturated yeah. orange or yeah you have a desaturated it's almost like a desat maybe reddish orange but it's, it's desaturated so it's hard to tell but it's just it's just yeah. a desat pulled up version of that local color okay so and the cools are and the cools the cools are slightly more saturated and they go towards the reddish purples there 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 pretty consistently across the piece that's pretty interesting and the reason they do this and you don't want to kind of go you don't want to stray too far it's okay for accent lights which are lights you're going to push from the sides i guess but the reason you do this is because when you pass this to a modeler you don't want to kind of trick him into thinking that something is the wrong local color basically right because ultimately something has an intrinsic color to it we call it the local color and you generally model stuff in that local color and then you light it with whatever lights you want but you don't want to shine like a bright orange light and then make your character look way more red than it's supposed to be right so you light stuff fairly neutrally but there needs to be a temperature difference for it to just look like a good piece of art in general right so kind of consider where your light switch is swinging and consider where your secondaries for example your diffuse light where that's going and then consider also where your additionals, like your bounce light and your accent light are going. Do you know what an accent light is? Um, isn't it, isn't it kind of like what I already have near the arms? Uh, uh, like on the under, underside of his arms? Um, that is more like a bounce, I guess. 
Uh, but it's it's okay. really hard to tell because really though this one I would much prefer it to be just like this because yeah. it, it, it kind of uh, suits better and then add maybe nice. a little bit of light up there so an accent is just a light that you kind of push from either side of the image it's usually a very sheer light that hits from one side or the other and it's just kind of meant to give an additional bit of flair uh, it's an illustration trick that's used pretty often in a variety of circumstances but i'll show you on some sort of my work so on the charizard that i did over there By the way, uh, if anybody in my chat has any questions, you can type it in the chat and I'll uh, say it to him. Or you can just, yeah, you know, because because I'm, I'm watching chat as I go, you know, but... Um... So this over here on the side, that's an accent light. It's just a light that I pull from the side just to kind of clarify certain areas or to just give it a little bit of flair, right? So for example, oh, that, that's oh. a very common example. And you'll see it in a few pieces. It depends on who the artist is. I don't think either of the artists over here that I've presented have any sort of accents on their work. But I've seen it in enough character designs that I know it's a thing. It's just to kind of help with the overall presentation, right? It's pretty. It's not that uncommon. Okay. So okay. for 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 like um, characters like these, um, is there like is there any specific light direction that is more normal or maybe recommended? Uh, like, I guess my question is like, what kind of lighting is good for? For these for these characters i mean you kind of already went through that but so i don't know i, tr I tried like lighting from above a little bit but i don't know lighting from above is perfectly fine because the majority of cases we kind of expect there to be something like this which is um a light on the top and then a half tone half tone value and then a shadow value so we expect there to be something like this in just about everything that we do a top light condition with some sort of slight direction to it that's what you see most of the time in the majority of character renders majority of rendering of anything really most of the time you will have this condition there are certain exceptions for like dynamic poses for example but for example in our school we are recommended almost always to light things from the top whenever we can right so top is really really common we can observe the stuff that we've, uh, we have here as examples so here observing by the shadows on the face you know on the breasts on the legs this is also top lit right you have the cast shadows pretty clearly same thing over here things are being lit pretty pretty top down and like i said before you'll have a slight amount of direction there for example just to get a bit more of a of a difference across the features maybe a slight skew towards the left and the right that's completely reasonable but for the most part top lighting is pretty much a standard and you'll probably use it just about in every piece that you do okay so yeah. Major things that are missing from this piece that we're going to try and work on right now. First one is cast shadow. Really important. Now, it's debatable depending on purpose, but if the purpose is just to show a design of, um, of a character, then you need to have a cast shadow in there. For example, that one up there, since the guy's levitating, he has a little bit of a, of a darkness down there, right? But for things like Mei or I'm not Mercy, Mercy doesn't have one. Reaper, for example, or any of the other characters, you'll see that's a pretty decent cast shadow on there. For the lead characters, of course, it's mandatory for the studio to have it. It just kind of helps the overall presentation. I, I very much do like the way it looks, and as does most people, right? So it's really important to ground the character with the cast shadow. And just in general, even if it's not a requirement, I want people, I want you particularly to start doing it more often because it, it sort of really verifies your understanding of space in three dimensions. So even as a, as a general practice, putting shadows on things is really important. Because again, it, we're very used to kind of drawing things in space, but we're not kind of used to grounding characters. Like this is a quick sketch that I did for Azar for this character, just to kind of show you uh, what things could be or could, could look like. And even here, I put a, a basic idea of a cast shadow. And even though my work is like literally like 10 minutes of work, mine sits on the, on the canvas way harder than yours sits on this gray background. Yeah. So it occupies more space, it has more weight. So that cast shadow, I think, is something that's important, and not just. So I like the fact that it's kind of all over the place. That you're um, you're thinking about the cast most of the time in this piece. I think that most of them are okay. Um, but for example, sometimes I think I feel like you're pulling some punches here, like right over there. That probably cast a bit more. The shadow shapes themselves. It's kind of up to you, but just be consistent about the direction. So if it's gonna cast, like for instance, if this hand casts about that much, and if this casts about that much. There's really no reason for the nose to not cast. There's really no reason for the hair to not cast as much. I see a little bit of it there. I see a little bit of it there, but not nearly enough for it to be convincing, right? So 
the cast shadows and the ambient occlusion are going to be two really really big things so how familiar are you with ambient occlusion how familiar i mean i know what it is um right but um it's not something that i keep in mind very often when i'm drawing like if i'm doing a, a, a portrait you know i'll think about it like okay in the nose uh corners of the mouth etc but it's not something i've practiced okay so uh, people have uh, when, when it comes to the question of nomenclature people have different ideas of what something is but i'll just tell you in my view uh what ao is and we can kind of go from there so basically when we're trying to describe a form because that's all we're trying to do right if we have no reference we want to make something look realistic i think half the time we try to kind of use as many tools as we can in order to get a really good read right so the reads can be achieved through ideas of light and ideas of dark so cast shadows and form shadows are the biggest ones to kind of give you how something is is um proportion how something moves in space but beyond that something that's really important is the idea of ambient occlusion so basically the idea of AO goes like this if i have two objects that are very close to each other right so i'll draw two spheres right there almost irrespective of where the lighting the light's coming from here so almost irrespective of that so let's just say it's, these are lit from the top like that i'll quickly light this up so right over there right over there I'm just, uh, I'm just, so I'm reading chat, by the way, guys, but um, I might not uh, respond vocally because I don't want to interrupt, but um, I, I see you guys. I see you. So if we have two spheres over here, so what I just did there was I just applied the form shadow, right? So form shadow is the shadow that appears by virtue of how something is shaped. And of course, you'll also have a car shadow based on what something is blocking. So shadow is just absence of light. And that can happen from two conditions, which is form and cast. Either I am blocking it based on how I am formed, or either or the other option is I am blocking somebody else from receiving it based on how I'm positioned. Right? So there are two options for shadows. Let's just assume that that's going to be the case. Okay? So let's go ahead and shadow that up nice and simple. So there are other options to kind of include darkness oh, in here. Look, and one of the options this. is this. So when things are closely in proximity to each other, the amount of light that can actually see into these areas is greatly reduced. So while over here, if I was just to draw the light, which travels in straight lines, so if I was just to draw the light like that, kind of coming towards my object, right? If you kind of think about it, in the space between these two objects, how much light can really be seen in comparison to right over here, which is very much in the open, right? So this is in the open, nothing next to it, and this is right next to something else. So there has to be a clear visual distinction between this area and this area. And that's really what the AO is trying to tell you, right? So ambient occlusion means that the ambient light is being occluded in a general sense. But I don't think about it as ambient light particularly. I just think about it as just light in general, right? So the general illumination of the entire piece is going to be slightly occluded, which is going to create stuff like this, basically. Which is right next to right next to the contact point you're gonna see just a little bit more shadow right over there it's a very common trick that you use to light stuff but you're gonna see a little bit of that happening see that a little bit of that happening and this can really go a long way so this might be a very simple example but it goes a really long way in trying to basically spatially convey two objects so we use this all the time in basic character renders and I think it's important to think about. So in your whole piece, right, all of these little, little divots, all of these crevices, all of these um, areas that are very closely packed, you know, all these metallic components that are pressed against the, um, the fabric, all of these things, because of how close they are to something else, they're going to be affecting the overall lighting profile of that area. And including that in your piece greatly, greatly increases the realism of it because that's one level of stuff that's above just traditional lighting stuff with just car shadow and just form shadow because ultimately we're going back to a very fundamental topic here with all sorts of um, rendering and that just goes like this it's very simple it's just called the principle of industrial rendering so this is from a craig mullins class that i took and it's really simple the idea is this it's just, it's just gas, 
you gradiate all surfaces like no matter what you're doing this is not strict illustration you can make your character designs really illustrative that's totally fine but i think it's really important to understand this concept which is every surface is going to have some amount of gradation to it because this is the characteristic of realistic lighting scenarios everything that you see around you in real life is going to have some amount of gradation to it gradation just means there's going to be a fall off or maybe a slight increase a gradual increase but it's going to be a change right there has to be a change so this goes back and i can i can link this to illustration in illustration we have concepts that go like there's no form change without value change there is no color change without value change etc etc we talk about this stuff all the time in illustration but the idea is is that all surfaces need to be gradiated right in this kind of this kind of work so going back to the professional look that, we, that we see here i mean this has an entirely different feeling and characteristic to what we're talking about right the reason is is because of the fact that everything is being taken care of all of those elements we kind of expect are being taken care of so we talked about ambient occlusion let me point it out for you right here so within this car shadow you see that there's been an attempt or a willful direction here i don't have the full quality image but see right over there why does that go darker within the car shadow right why does that go dark within the car shadow that's that's simply because of the idea that we're thinking more about the ambient occlusion right oh fuck Jesus. that's the idea oh how's it going how's it going Poku? <laughs> oh so we're going over some um some work from uh mr randomese over here we're doing a kind of a dual evaluation stream welcome guys. guys how's it going <laughs> good to see you um, oh fuck I can't yeah, believe Indian Abroad is uh, roasting my art today. Um, so it's a collaboration stream. We're gonna look through some pieces. Subs are also welcome to share their work, and we can look through that. Uh, welcome, readers. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Much love. Yeah, this is an example of the kind of work that I have been doing for some of my school assignments. But uh, welcome, guys. Spoke of what you're working on. Can I uh, quickly get some work there before we continue here? But yeah, we're just looking at this character design oh, thing, fuck. trying to help uh, Azar out this. with some concepts. So if you guys have your own character design stuff, then uh, hopefully you'll learn something from the stream. Oh, fuck. What is yeah. the idea? I can't believe you've done this. Looking at... Kayla says uh, she loves you, also. But, um, looking at, um... Like, when I thought about ambient occlusion, I always oh, thought about fuck. things that, like, are touching each other. And I didn't know that, okay, even if they're kind of close to each other, there's still gonna be some ambient occlusion. But I think also, like, a big reason to why I don't really get my oh, lighting fuck. right is because I can't believe I've you've done this. this before my understanding of form how things are in space is like it's just lacking like for example when i'm trying to like you know draw a cylinder in space in a very specific angle just like a basic cylinder or a box or just you know rotate it it's just, my mind just can't understand it you know and i think that also hinders me a lot from understanding how the light would interact with forms because I don't understand form, you know? Okay, so if form is going to be the issue, then how do you feel about doing stuff like what I'm showing on the screen right now? How do you feel about doing some form painting today? That'll be really good. Uh, let's see, there's a slight delay. Oh yeah, no, I would love to do that. Yeah, I, I think this is going to really help you out. I think Poku's working on a comic. Post it up in the chat, Poku. I will check it out uh, whenever I can. But post, post whatever you want. I really appreciate the raid. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate you. I try and lurk over yours whenever I can. I feel You're like in. even something like this is very complicated even though you know i mean you finished it so it looks it, it looks you know quite simple but you know if i have a blank canvas and i'm like okay let me do this like it would i don't i don't know where to start you know oh fuck mm, okay fine so here's what we'll do right after we finish our discussion and breakdown let's grab a reference of basically anything we don't really mind but uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna trace over the reference and see if we can break it down to simpler shapes and then we'll evaluate exactly what the problem is because i feel like the problem might just be in perspective uh trying to figure out things in perspective so we might have to do some perspective stuff later on but that stuff takes a little bit of time to get used to so we'll see where you're at and then i'll try and tell you exactly what you might need to do to get better at everything okay mm -hmm. okay there you go everybody click poku's uh, link in the chat her webtoons is right over there click it Let's see uh, okay so let's let's try and do something like this i think it'll be really really helpful because i remember you trying to turn things in space and there was a little bit of problem behind it also to kind of point out the ambient occlusion here uh areas like this basically so even though this is kind of like a very forced idea idea of ambient occlusion when you're doing like a really basic form render you try and grab as many elements as you can as much as you can 
to try and get something to look three-dimensional to get it to look real so you almost force it in certain places uh, even if it doesn't make too much sense so there's some thought behind how many shadows do i want to cast does that really make any sense but ultimately that kind of decision is governed by whether it looks good or not whether it makes sense or not that's about it right so you don't really care too much about that but yeah this goes back to what we were talking about earlier which is just gradienting all the surfaces and to do that we think about the ambient occlusion a bit more right so with this kind of character render to make it more realistic we have to think about gradient, gradiating stuff right so let me actually walk you through that so we can talk about that uh in a second let's just move on to stuff that you're missing uh beyond that so in in terms of just your basic design over here you could kind of maybe do a lot a lot more in terms of variations in local value variations in local color all these things can be improved right you can have a lot more kind of patches you can have a lot more information just because it's a comic style doesn't mean you have to pull the detail even more than that i feel like your shapes for example across the entire the um the jacket over here you can have much more expressive shapes across everything to kind of make everything look like it's more three-dimensional to kind of give it a much more sense of material things like that and we'll talk about material in a second here but stuff like this is really easy to do it doesn't cost you too much time and it gives you way more of a kind of lived in look to the painting and i think you can really benefit from that because when it comes to these kind of really graphic shapes they're done all the time in comic work and they're really really important to do right because you don't have a very limited kind of use of value in that kind of uh, production right you have very limited value to use so you see they pay a lot of attention to how they use their shapes even on the face for example we can easily have some much stronger kind of shapes here these very evocative kind of cheekbone shapes and under the under the lip right there and over the eyes like we can really start to harden all the stuff up to make sure that everything sort of reads in a decent manner right because you, you add so much more form to everything right you give so much more context to everything and it just makes everything look a lot better right so even in just to kind of stylized approach these things are really really important because all you had for me before were just lines but remember that when you're transferring like a line drawing to more, more of a finished product like what are the lines going to imply what are they actually doing to the form like these are good questions to kind of answer because what i saw you doing when you were uh, lining this out is you weren't really adding anything to your under sketch like you were just kind of tracing over it and just kind of cleaning it up and while i think that's a, it's a perfectly kind of fine thing to do especially because you don't want to be thinking too much maybe consider designing shapes and maybe consider the impact of your lines while you're doing that because it's a very monotonous process to line stuff out i know it is a very monotonous process but really you can use that time to think about how you want to maybe approach things right because i think this is a very clear and very easily solvable oversight even stuff like this right just the basic understanding of the way that shadows are going to be cast i feel like that could be better and this is why i think when you do this exercise that we're going to do really soon I think it's going to really tell you where you stand when it comes to um, exactly what are you missing because uh, one of the biggest things to consider when uh, rendering anything realistically is again as you said before how is something positioned in space and how, therefore how does it react to your light source right so i think to that end it's going to be really helpful to just break these things down into much more simpler shapes and then we can think about how you render those shapes and then we'll figure out okay do you really understand how these shapes work in space or do we need to go back into perspective and then help you kind of figure out how these are actually shaped and then think about shading them later on okay does it make any All sense right. oh boy i'm scared yeah i'm out yeah that makes sense that makes sense so let me run you through some stuff right now because it's going to be really uh useful to know just some really basic information but it's really important so is this going to be as fundamental as i can make it see you poku thank you so much for the raid i really appreciate it i'm sorry that i couldn't uh Take care, guys. Chat a Thanks bit up. more, but we are in the middle of this. Yeah, this is a five-head uh, art stream for sure. It's for the big brains in the world. But, Cheers, um, Spooky. Have a very good night. So Take care. we're talking about some very basic shapes here. I don't think you have too much of an issue with the square shapes and the um, the cube shapes and all that stuff. Uh, but we're going to do it anyway. So let's learn how to render three things. Okay, we'll do cubes. We'll do spheres. I can't spell spheres and we'll do cylinders okay I can't read. Yeah. oh my god it's so windy outside i'm gonna close my window jesus okay how's the weather in singapore oh Not too bad. i can't believe you've done this you good 
Uh, yeah, hang on. I'm just opening up your chat. Actually, no. I... All right, all right. There we go. Do you feel well done or medium rare for from the roast? Uh, he hasn't roasted me too hard yet, so uh, so far, so far, we're good. We're good. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about how you render these things in space. These are really boring things, but ultimately, I mean, what is this thing kind of based on? It's just based on cubes, cylinders, and spheres, right? So if you can do this, then things should be all right. Now, the first step in any of these things is actually how do I draw this in space, right? So this is where your perspective comes into uh, a big place, right? It's going to be really important. So being able to draw a cube in perspective is going to be really important. Let me just go ahead and clean my canvas up a little bit. Because we don't need this stuff anymore. I'm just going to demo this for you, and then we'll see how you can do. Okay. Okay, so cube. Really, really simple. So we'll go from start to finish here, okay? You're dropping frames? I think I am, aren't I? Let me look for a yeah, second. it's a bit slow. It must be a lot for your computer at once. Hold on. Let me change the quality of your stream on my computer. Okay, I'm actually going to close your stream here. Uh, you can keep mine open. But yeah. uh, I'm going to save some frames because I don't need to look at your uh, screen right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah most of... Uh, I mean, I'm just watching your screen, so your, your own stream is actually popping up twice on your own stream, which is not necessary. Okay, we're good then. All right. So here's what we do for, for a basic cube from start to finish. There are some concepts that I want to talk to you about, but we'll talk about them while we're using them, okay? So the first thing is just simply simply draw the draw the uh, the initial idea for the cube so you can use line tool or whatever that's fine but very simple stuff you can draw one side right there keep perspective accurate and set over there i want to have a discussion with you at some point about how do you even use perspective in a drawing to begin with um, because i see some issues there with figuring out how the vanishing points work and things like that let's just assume this is a good cube so how do i render a cube out so i'll give you a good step-by-step -step process on how to think about rendering anything and you can kind of just utilize that however you want. This is the process that was taught to me in school. And while I personally don't use it all that often, I think if at any point you are struggling to render something out, going back to one of these points is going to help you, you know, complete the drawing, basically, to complete the painting. So the first step is always going to be the drawing. So you need to draw what you're going to be painting because you want to know where things are supposed to go. This is going to be really important when it comes to rendering out your cylinders and, your cylinders and spheres. Because we're going to be talking about something called cross contour, which we talk about all the time. Um, but that's going to really define whether or not you understand um, accurate shapes. So I'm going to be looking for that in your in your work. So the first step is just to draw it forehead, and second step <laughs> is just a simple idea of one, two, three, read. Really common that comes from the Scott Robinson textbook. The next step is simple idea of gradation. We gradiate the surfaces. The next step is simple ideas of cast shadow and AO. The next step after that is edges, right? And the last step you can just call it clean up. Clean stuff up, get stuff out of the order. There are more steps for things like spheres and cylinders. The reason why is because the things that are cube shaped are generally a lot easier because they are kind of locked into where they're looking at. This side is looking this way, this side is looking this way, this side is looking this way, right? Wait, so... so go ahead. Uh, no, no, uh, you, you can just finish up. I'll just ask you after. Okay, no problem then. So, once I've drawn everything, it might be useful to kind of cast a shadow as well to kind of figure out the lighting direction, that's fine. But we'll do the one, two, three read. Now, I am in a vacuum right now. I'm in a vacuum, and I don't know what value I want so... to pick. So what's the one to three read again? I, I, I missed that. I missed that. So I haven't explained any of these things. We'll, we'll talk about it right now. So okay. the one to three read basically means that I'm, I'm going to be able to separate one face from another face from another face. So basically phase are phase one, phase two, and phase three. Mm -hmm. I'll be able to visually separate these out in good contrast in natural looking light. Then. That's the whole goal over here. Okay. And it's a super common goal, it's a super common expression in any sort of like industrial rendering textbook, you'll see it all the time. So how do I make anything look like it's well contrasted and real? To aid us in this kind of effort, I want to talk to you about something called halfway to black, okay? Come on, bro. Okay. Halfway to black is a very simple concept, okay? And it goes like this, I think I might have to show you my palette. Let me just make sure I can do that.
this is so much information my head's being like you know blown up but um you know this is you know there's a vod and you can always go back and look through it again half white to black so i'm just noting everything down which is why i'm kind of like going on my laptop over here on the side here if anybody's wondering <clears throat> Okay, so if you ever had a, a condition with any sort of painting that you ever did, right? Where you ask yourself, okay, that is not well contrasted. Or if you ever have a worry about contrast, this is a wonderful little thing to always kind of check to ensure that things are within good contrast. And it goes like this, okay? It's very simple. So you can see my, uh, my color select from my screen, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I choose any value like this, for example, and if I travel between this value and the darkest value over there, and I cut that distance by half, so right about there, then this new value will always contrast that old value. To put it very, very simply, from this value halfway to the black, that's my contrasting value. That's my shadow value, basically, okay? And this is a very kind of surface level idea. It's just to get you thinking in the right way. By no means is this gonna solve your shadows on any piece. But what it will do is it will always ensure that the second value you pick will always contrast the first value in a way that will make it a shadow because shadows and lights need to be separate in order for us to have good contrast okay so halfway to black is a very simple way of ensuring that we have that contrast in our shadows and lights okay so let me demonstrate this really quickly the one decision you make with your piece or with anything that you light is going to be one of your faces because every other face is going to be handled by our principal over here okay let me show you what that means i will say that this particular cube over here is going to be this value in the light okay now i want you to pay a little bit of attention to the wording there it's going to be this value in the light so whatever this is it's going to be this value in the light okay oh okay in in, in the light so that's not local color that's just like in the light okay. yeah that's the value in the light now this is the big principle that we have to talk about here so the other faces are going to be in the dark right so if i want to find the corresponding value of this face in the darkness and have it still belong to the same object basically all i have to do is take that and cut it in half so i get this value and that's going to be my shadow value okay now there's so much more to kind of delve into. There's so many more factors that play into this, like ambient light, bounce light. Uh, there's so many things that play play into this, this sort of situation, but we can just consider that, that over there, to be the shadow value with respect to this light value, okay? So then we have a question of the third phase, right? The third phase. Now th this is an illustration. So we don't have the option of saying, oh, both of these are gonna be the same value. We want all of the faces to be clear, because again, in like, in any of these examples that I have over here, everything is quite clear. Everything that you see is well defined. So we can't just hide stuff. So this third face, so number number two, so this is one, two, and then that's three, two, um, over two. here. This last face is just our half tone or intermediate face. And it's just gonna be a little bit less than this primary face over here. Now there's some subtlety over here. You have to play it a little bit by ear depending on where things are facing, but ultimately, if you look at this, we have one, two, and three, and every face over here is very clearly defined, okay? And how do we define okay. it? The first one we chose, the second one halfway to black, and the third one is just a value that's close to the first one, basically the half tone value. For any okay, of the, so, uh, go ahead. So, okay, I'm just gonna try to explain it myself so to see if I understand it correctly. So the triangle, right? If you take the distance from white to black, right? um let's just say that you know we have that distance and you cut that in half and then let's say that you choose um that light or or, or or that value that you have on the top right uh and then for the shadow you took that half distance um towards the, the dark uh did i get that right I, I kind of it was a scuffed explanation but did i get that right you just took like that distance but halved it and then went towards the dark. Is that is that it is it? Or Basically, yeah. So whenever you have a light, you can just cut that distance from the dark by just cut it in half, and whatever value you end up with is going to be your uh, corresponding shadow value in this very simplified version of thinking about light. Okay. So, so basically, I'll I'll iterate with this cube. Let me just uh, add a background to this cube really quickly. 
Think about this. So I'm quickly gonna hit this with the background here. We should also talk about background, it's a big part of this, but we'll come to that in a second. So background and floor are also components that we should actively be thinking about. Because everything, like I said, um, everything is a package. Oh, fuck. I render like this. I can't believe you've done so, this. Well, I'll just light the floor a little bit here. Okay, so here's what I want you to think about. This top face over here, all right, this top face, I can change the value of it. Let's make it even lighter, okay? Let's make it even lighter. So now it's going to be this value over here. Like super blown. Of course you would never use this kind of value. So now you tell me where that shadow value is going to be. Um, okay, that shadow value is going to be like pretty much half. Yeah, it'll just be um, half the, the entire triangle. So it'll be this value. It's like a corresponding decent shadow for this like value. Yeah. So the, the kind of goal here is to, because obviously I could choose any value, I could just go here and, ha and say this is the shadow, but the goal here is to kind of achieve something like a natural looking contrast with any light value, basically. Right? So as long as you do this kind of idea, you're never going to be stuck in a situation which basically is going to be like, oh, I don't have enough contrast and things aren't very clear. Because again, it's naturally going to be clearer because of the fact that it's, it's halfway through the entire um, range of values. Okay? Yeah, because... When I was doing my 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 character, um, I tried applying a gray background, and the values for my character and the gray background were so similar. And then I tried finding some sort of um, a gradient which would like make it more readable. Mm -hmm. But essentially, like I went for a light gray that didn't work. I went for a dark gray that didn't work, um, because like you know yeah. And then um, eventually I went for like a gradient which kind of worked in the end but uh yeah yeah it's not too 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 bad we'll talk about the background the thing is what i'm explaining to you right now doesn't solve that issue that's uh, an issue of just background and floor so we'll come to that at the very end um okay. but this is just for internal contrast right for just like maybe not the the edge over here but maybe stuff like um why does this look like a shadow against this basically right So internal stuff. So this is internal contrast. We'll talk about the external stuff in a second here. So here's the steps. So one, two, three, read. We finished that. We explained halfway to black. And now it's just a simple question of gradi gradiating this stuff, right? And you can do that whichever way you want. There's no right or wrong way to do this. I generally will gradiate this maybe with an airbrush, but for anybody that doesn't want to do that, you can also gradiate it with just an idea of just a standard all round brush. It's still perfectly possible. Right, so the question is how do things gradiate because it's a really big thing to kind of explain, right? Because everything, if I said every, everything's going to have gradation, then where does that gradation even come from? Well, the answer is it comes from either the light source, be it the direct light or the bounce light or even the diffuse light. But gradation comes from that light source, right? So the shadows, generally speaking, the shadow doesn't get any darker because of the fact that it's a shadow. Shadows are just the absence of light, right? So it's not like more shadow is going to make things more darker. It's just a question of whether or not there's going to be light interacting with that area, which therefore creates a gradation. So for example, on the top over here for this face, which is still in the light, by the way, you can kind of assume that, okay, if it's still in the light, then it's going to have some sort of gradation in the light. So we're going to have a gradation like this, basically. So I can think about it gradating from the top. So I'm going to do this very manually just to show you. So we'll have this kind of gradation from the top, okay? So we have a very kind of subtle gradation from top to bottom. Very simple. This one over here, which is in the darkness, it's a different question. Right? It's a different different kind of idea because simply that doesn't see the light source at all. It doesn't see the light source at all. So where does this gradient from? The answer is in the bounce light. So you can think about the shadows as being gradiated from the bounce light. Okay, so we add a bounce light in here. Choose a value. So again, sim simple rules of illustration apply. So this bounce light value won't be close to that top value we shouldn't be close to each other All right that's a bounce light value and then lastly even the face that's in the light is also going to get radiation so it's going to get radiated from one side to the other so it'd be lighter on one side basically and it goes darker 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 so we gradiated every single surface over here okay Hmm. 
Okay, interesting. So this is in isolation, basically. If I have no reference, I have no idea, um, you know, how to um, bring this into a render, then this is how you do that, right? You just simply choose that first value, you determine what that value is going to be in the light, and you go halfway to black, you find that shadow value, you find that mid-tone value, and then you gradiate it depending on where it is positioned uh, based on the light source. But the idea is that you want to see this gradation, right? You don't want there to be like ridiculously flat surfaces. You don't want things to be flatly lit. You want this kind of idea around the entire painting. Now, how much of this you actually see in your painting will kind of depend on you. But the idea is that it's always there. Whether you choose to accept that it's there or choose to show that it's there, it's up to you. But it is there. Everything around us right now, in reality, has this kind of gradation on it. It is just a fact of the way the light works. Everything's going to have this gradation. So while in like my full paintings, for example, you don't always see, like maybe the lights don't gradate always, just by virtue of the fact that we can't just paint everything this way. Ideally, you do want to show this eventually in some degree or the other. And this happens to be really, really important when you're doing hard surface design. So when you're painting things like cars or mechs, for example, that's when this really matters because those usually have flat surfaces and those look really really out of place unless they're gradated like this okay for organic forms you can kind of get away with it a little bit not so much but the principle still applies to them okay okay so for inorganic forms there will be more gradation or less it'll be about the same so gradation is just caused by form change and light sources but just yeah. just because of the fact that for things like a for, for a cube for example we can't just flatly light this cube and make it look good, right? So we have to use every tool in our arsenal to make it look good, to make it look realistic. So we add in these elements that are going to exist anyway. It's just that when you're doing organic services like the stars out over here, we can kind of get away with not having as much, right? We can get away with not having as much, not so important. Because we have such crazy amounts of differences in lighting and, and shadow, there's enough information there, there's enough light sources kind of active on there that you don't really need such strict kind of gradation. But you don't have all that all the option when you're gonna going to go in for um, for hard surface stuff because, like I said, they're kind of locked in position. Okay. Mm. Okay. So once you're done with what you wanted to read, based on halfway to black, and you gradiate, you think about your cast shadow, right? So you can cast. I'm not going to go into how to cast a shadow, but very simply, you're going to cast a shadow. Now this is a very big thing to kind of realize, is that the shadow over here that you choose. Remember this shadow. And I want you to, to, to kind of listen to this. The shadow over here is simply going to be halfway to black from the floor value. Okay? So this is just going to be this value. And this is why this, this principle is really important because it really solves a lot of things for you. A lot of thinking is going to solve here. This is going to be a natural shadow value for that light. Because if you ever had a concern or a question about what should I use as my shadow value, this kind of gets you thinking in the right direction. Okay? So basically what's happening here is you can think about this floor as a giant cube, basically. This floor is a giant cube. And this is that cube's face in the light. Okay? So it's sitting on a giant cube in the light. And that means that this value of the floor is just a number one. So if it's in shadow, it's going to be the number three of that particular number one, which is just halfway to black from this one. So I know that's going to be a little bit complicated, so I'm going to explain it to you in a much more simpler sense. If I was to place another one of these cubes on top of this first cube, let me draw it for you. So just very simply, it's just this. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'm, I'm so lost. <laughs> I'll explain it to you. So this is, the, to this is the one big thing that kind of people get caught up in, but it's not that hard. So if I just draw a simple cube, Kyle, welcome back, man. And how's it going, Nels? So if I just go ahead and draw another cube on top, right? Let's just light this cube up in a different way. But let's say I'll choose a darker value. This is my value in light, okay? Yeah. Okay. The, dark, no. the dark value will be, will be what now? It will be halfway to black. So it'll be this value. Because it's a different local value, you see. It's a different local value. This value over here, the half tone, is just going to be close to the first value, right over here. Wait, so the the top of the head, or uh, sorry, the top of the box, it has a has a different local value. Is that why it's darker? Yes, exactly. But isn't isn't it going to be like 
still affected by the light though because um i mean i guess it is but more because or am i just wrong here no i mean we're just saying that this local value is going to be this light in this lighting condition right okay. so why okay. would it be more or less it is what it is right it is what it is so i can say any of these things any of these things are going to be this light in the darkness just imagine like for example look at your room there are going to be things that are really really bright and they're going to be things that are really really dark but they're under the same lighting condition so why is that like why why is my 15 year old logitech mouse why is that so dark in comparison to my table which is white why is my wacom tablet so dark compared to my wall that is white it's just because simply things have different local colors it doesn't mean that they're not affected by the light it just means the effect of light is going to look different on them their version of light is going to be different than a light versions a, a light objects version of light you see yeah yeah so the that way makes you, sense. the way you unify all of this stuff because my mouse is black there you go um <laughs> so the shadow now this is going to be your our challenge right now what is going to be the shadow value over here um it will be halfway of the floor mm -hmm. so if you shoot if you color pick the floor i don't know what color it is uh, yeah and then go halfway yeah so it will it will be not completely in the middle but a little bit darker than the middle uh, yeah, right around there yeah yeah so now what we just did is we lit this little micro cube onto this light surface so basically i did the exact same thing for this if you imagine this big cube on an even bigger cube with this as its surface value do you see now uh wait so, can you say that again so this what i'm what i'm zoomed in into right now is literally the same as this except that you can't see the gigantic cube that this is sitting on right right yeah, yeah makes yeah, sense yeah. yeah exactly yeah okay so basically whenever and now i had another cube <laughs> i should but so oh, shit, we go. haven't gone into how to deal with the shadow and make it look more shadowy but this is a big thing right because we've accomplished some two very very important things here the first one is that we've learned how to paint something of a diff different local value in the same lighting condition right same lighting condition also we kind of have an idea of how to kind of keep our shadows consistent because remember a cast shadow it's determined by what it's casting on, not what it's casting it. A very common issue I see is that people will be like, oh, well, this is a darker object, so therefore the cast shadow is going to be darker. Or the issue that you had, which is basically saying, well, this is a really light object, then why isn't this light? Why is this also not light, light like that? It's in the same scene, isn't it? But this is how you maintain that good amount of value contrast, right? This is how you maintain that. This is how you keep those local values in the same environment but also maintain them for what they are because for example i mean you can talk about a whole lot of principles here like oh there's no way that a dark object is going to have a lighter light than a lighter object but really you can just simplify all of that stuff by just saying i am going to choose my first face and i'm going to halfway to black it i will choose the second face and i'm going to halfway to black it. you see the only decision we made in this entire image we have made exactly two decisions which is number one and number one everything else in this entire piece has been done in respect to two decisions and two decisions are, is easy anybody can make two decisions and everything else is just principle over principle over principle you see mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay so to run everybody through that again i chose the light value based on that halfway to black is the dark value close to this first value is the second value and halfway to black off the floor is a shadow value same thing up here okay so what do we do for the cast shadow to make it look more realistic because it's a little bit, little bit flat don't you think so a few things to talk about in the cast shadow to make your shadows look more like shadows the first thing to consider is the fact that there's going to be a little bit of ambient occlusion so now we come into that realm so what is the ambient occlusion telling us it's telling us that well the shadow is not going to be the same all throughout even though the value in general is correct there's something a little bit awkward about it especially considering the gradation of this stuff over here so what do we do to make our shadows look more realistic very simple we think about the ambient occlusion and we think about the lights the light fall off for example so we talk about ao first the way that this was explained to me at the very beginning is kind of think about there being two armies one is the army of light and then one is the army of dark basically and they're both fighting against each other so basically this shadow casting face is the castle of the army of dark so the closer you get to that casting face or the less occluded that area is 
I'm sorry, the more occluded that area is, the darker it's going to be. So most of the time, you're going to see a little bit of this happening. So as it comes closer and closer to that face over there, you're going to see it get a little bit darker. Like this. Yes, you can argue that there are gradients in shadow, like... Well... The reason you added gradients before is because of how light interacts, and then in the shadow you don't have light, so I guess... I guess that gradation that you added, or, or, or whatever, um, that's from the ambient occlusion rather than the light. Okay, so there's many ways of thinking about this, right? But ultimately, I'll tell you why there's a gradation in the, in the shadow. It's because the shadow is being exposed to different amounts of light. So remember the shadow over here, and this is a very general principle, the shadow in all sorts of lighting and all sorts of drawings is not the absolute absence of light. The shadow will still see a certain amount of light, okay? It'll still see a certain amount of light, and that's just the ambient light. Let me explain this in a second. So let me just draw a diagram for you to make, just make sure this makes any sense. So here's a semicircle representing the flat earth because we all know the earth, earth is flat and yeah, we, yeah, have, we have let's just say you're standing over here right and you're casting right. a shadow and the sun is in the sky the sun is going to illuminate you directly on this side of you is going to get illuminated right but the shadow right. over here is that just going to be absolutely dark well no because we have a condition called ambient light, which means that the sun is not the only light source. We have an enormous light source in the form of the sky that maybe is not as strong as the sun, but it's illuminating everything in my, in my entire picture. So what is this light going to do? Even though it can't play really strongly in the realm of the lights, in the shadow, even though this main light that's cast in the shadow can't see the shadow, in the shadow, that's where the diffused light or the ambient light is going to play. So that's, that's why every shadow you can still see things inside the shadow, it's not pitch black. This is in space, right? It's not space. So in space, when something is in shadow, you'll see that it's actually in pitch black shadow. But everywhere else in reality, you can still see things that are quote-unquote in shadow. Because it's not technically in shadow, it's just being lit by a different light, if you think about it, right? It's being occluded from my main light, but it's still being lit by my ambient light, okay? So... Ambient light is more noticeable in the shadows yes because you can think about so direct light is like a chad right it's an omega chad so whenever you have a beta light like ambient light in front of the chad the chad light the chad light's always going to overpower it because it's just pure alpha pure rage so you're never going to yeah. see too much of the ambient light in the, the area of direct light but in the shadow the shadow is just the ultra melvin nerd of the entire high school right so even the ambient light can bully the shadow because the shadow is just weak is weak nothing null. It's going to be able to be bullied by the ambient light. Okay. Question in the chat: In normal lighting conditions, is it it's it's always halfway to black, or is this a rule of thumb? It's just a rule of thumb. I can go into the specifics later, but the idea is it's just a rule of thumb, right? Because ultimately, what is the value of that shadow is going to be determined entirely by the ambient light. This shadow over here is not the absence of light. Okay, it's just going to be less oh, light. Fuck. I can't okay, you've done it's going to be less light. So that's exactly why there's going to be a gradation in the shadow. Because if I have this light that's playing, so this is not the only light oh, source, fuck. right? I can't believe you've done this. So this thing that's hitting it directly, I have this major, so this is the Chad light hitting it from the side. But I also have this other light that's saying, oh, please, can I play too? And he's coming in here. He's also kind of attacking over here, but he can't get the goose over here. So he's also attacking the shadows over here. He sees everything basically, oh, fuck. except for the I small localized this. area near, near that the casting phase, because that prevents a certain amount of ambient light from hitting. Because if you think about it, if I have these bombardment of rays all around my object, the amount of rays coming from this particular angle is lessened because I have this face over here. So that means that I have this area that's being somewhat blocked by that main light. By the, by the, uh, by the main object. Over here, maybe not so much. But here it's being kind of blocked. And of course it's a very gradual block. More and more light can gradually see more and more of the shadow surface. Oh, 
okay. that's why it's called ambient occlusion. There you go. Oh my god. That's some five head shit. That's crazy. Okay. You should also explain the five value system. I think I want to refrain from five value. I think I, I prefer to explain that in uh, illustration. We can talk about it later on the stream if people are uh, interested. But this is the idea, okay? Of ambient occlusion. So the ambient light, which can only play mostly in the shadows, that is, is being pushed and pulled back and forth based on the proximal objects to create darker and lighter radiation. Okay? Oh, yes. Very, very simple. What's more about the shadow is that the edge, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the it edge of the shadow. Three brain cells to figure that out. Oh my god! Because okay. you know there is much of a core shadow because of this is a cube. Yeah, it's okay. We're gonna go into the spheres and cylinders really, really, really soon. So we'll talk about it there. But the the edges of the shadow are also gonna be played up. So to simply explain this, I'm just gonna hit it with a gauss blur. But the edges of that shadow. Oh Jesus Christ! What happened? So we're going to lower that. So again, the second I do that, you see how it looks a little bit more natural. Now, even this has a gradation. Remember when I said gradiate everything, I mean everything. So for example, really close to that object, so re really close to that particular casting face, that's going to be quite sharp. It's going to be quite sharp, and then it'll go gradually less and less sharp the further away it gets. And why is that? It's because more of that dirty, stinky light can infiltrate can infiltrate my shadow and make it less of a shadow basically right so this little sharpness there makes a lot of sense it's really important when you do spherical shapes there are more elements to think about yeah we're going to talk about all of them don't, don't you worry we're going we're to go over it what's going on we are guiding mr anonese with um, some advice on basic kind of painting just how to render something in uh, in a vacuum thanks in glove wait so the thing okay so the shadow near the object is going to be sharper mm -hmm. than further away because can, can you just repeat that one more time okay you, so remember that all this stuff is going to have an impact right just because there's going to be a lighter area doesn't mean that's going to be the be all end all because if more light is affecting the shadow that means that everything's going to get affected so not just the shadow value but also the shadow edge so the more lighter that shadow gets the more blurrier you can kind of imagine that car shadow gets okay oh. so that's that stuff's gonna happen like that and of course you can have way more lightness the way the further away it gets it's a whole bunch of things to talk about here and in fact the reverse situation actually happens with light sources we call that light fall off but that's a bit too complicated we're not, we're not going to talk about that right now um but yeah this is just the general idea of how to make a shadow look like a shadow that's crazy okay so that's your that's your cast shadow and your ao dealt with okay simple concepts this is as simple as you can get so up here again same principle kind of applies we're going to get a little bit of that uh that fall off happening over here right it'll kind of blur the edges doing this with a blur brush is, is simple enough but i think using an airbrush is also totally fine so just eroding that shadow to make it look more natural right so now we have a cube on top of a cube with a shadow now i want you to pay attention to something over here which is the floor I chose this floor value almost randomly, but you want to be choosing like a floor and a background that best kind of suits your image, okay? So we'll get into that a little bit later because it's, we can talk about that when we're talking about spheres, but it's a very simple idea. Uh, just be aware that everything that I'm showing you right now is a full package. So don't just do this on top of like a, a random value. Have some thought towards that value because you, you told me about how things in your uh, drawing were being a little bit lost right so that's a problem that you have to figure out with your background so don't choose a background that's just random your background has to support your main drawing okay it has to support it so what does that basically mean i'll give you an example here it means that for example if i have a lighter face on this side and i want to support it it's a very simple thing that i can do i can just grab a little bit of darkness and i can just spray a little bit of darkness on the back side of this of this uh, cube so i need to manage my layers here for a second let me show you what i mean basically let's grab this area so i can just use my sneaky little airbrush here and i can add a bit more darkness to the top right there and that'll make that light look even more lighter a little bit of a subtle change there to the background 
right? And how you how you're able to mask this is up to you. But you see how that goes from let me just remove my selection there. So from from this initial to this, mm. it pops a little bit more, yeah. right? And you'll see that concept artists are really sneaky because they do this all the time to get better reads on their entire drawing. So they get they put the lighter stuff near their darks and their darker stuff near their lights, even if there's not really that much of an excuse to do so. They're going to invent an excuse to do this, and this is a really good just general concept to think about it's just the idea of how do i make my background best show what i have in my foreground because it's, it's all a package one of the most criminally like bereft things to do in a piece is to draw a beautiful value piece put so much effort into it and then just slam it on a really white porcelain background like excellent job you just ruined your entire drawing because that value space outside does not support your value space inside even slightly so that's why it's always recommended to choose a background that best lets your foreground elements um, be the best they, the, that they can be, right? I was speaking to Cynix the other day about this. Yeah. So Cynix is on YouTube, and I asked him, hey Cynix, so is there any condition that you can think about where you want to use a very bright background, a, a clear white background? He said, no, never. <laughs> and it's basically that. There's never a good reason. To just blow out your background okay so i know you're not a victim to this but in general people in the chat for example if you're drawing stuff really consider really consider what that background value is because you are providing a package to your viewer to yourself okay so everything is involved in a package it's not just your one two three it's not just your gradient it's a whole thing yeah, yeah i'm on his discord um so that's just how it is okay so, so the background like do you do you do the background like after you draw your object or do you kind of like just keep it in mind while you're drawing your object so you kind of do it at the same time usually i put in an initial idea and then i'll always manipulate it later on to ensure okay. that things are looking the way that i needed to so it's a very right, common right. thing i remember the cyclical thing we talked about in design it's a very similar idea over here where it's just the idea that i'll have an initial assumption so i'll put in I'll put in like an initial gradient, but see like across these two pieces, uh, I, I did them both in this exact same file, but you see how the gradient, the gradient on the left is way darker than the gradient on the right? That just means I changed it to better suit my image. So it's not like I didn't have one, I had one initially, and I changed it ever so slightly to suit my needs, okay? So being nimble on your canvas is, is pretty much one of the biggest steps you can take to going from a beginner to an intermediate. It's just being willing to change stuff because things don't look very good. Okay, so you play it by ear, basically. Let me submit art. Yes, 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 submit to the Discord whenever you want. Oh boy, okay, yeah. I mean, I, 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 fo I, I am following along. I, you haven't, uh, I'm still here, I'm still here. Okay, if this That's is, a lot of if, information. If this is know, too much, we can stop it at cubes. We don't have to go to spheres, because spheres has even more stuff to talk about. We'll talk about no, um, the final two things, okay? Yeah. So remember, I'm gonna walk everybody through what we just did. We drew the object that we wanna render. We did the one, two, three read, remember? The decision is for number one, how the object appears in the light. And then the number three is just halfway to black of number one. And then number two is just a similar value, a close value to number one. And again, the main goal here is clarity. So I'm not gonna choose a gradation. I'm not gonna choose a value for a side that's in any way gonna impact the overall read. And let it be known and let it be clear that this can always happen, right? You can choose something accidentally or something with, res with respect to your background. For whatever reason, it can happen that something isn't clear enough. So what do you do when it's not clear enough? You just change it. You make it darker or you make it lighter or you change the background or you add more gradation. You do whatever you need to in the realm of possibility to make sure you get your goddamn read because the read is what's most important here. So these are all just tools, right? I can say halfway to black till the cows come home, but the idea is it's just a tool for you to use, right? So if that's not doing it, right? If halfway to black for whatever reason is not giving you what you what you need, then just up it to 60% or 70% or whatever you need to get it to read the way you want it to read. So these are just initial guidelines, but ultimately nobody's gonna award anybody for following rules, right? If the result isn't good. So while everything looks good in, in the way that I did it and I follow the rules almost exactly, it's it's almost like it's just good fortune that everything reads right but if they if they didn't i would just simply change stuff i would change stuff in the bounds 
maybe up and down because it's not going to be so much right it's not like we're resetting the drawing it's just that this one two three stuff this gradation stuff it'll get you in a really good position and to get that additional push you have to take some liberty yourself to say okay i'm gonna make it a little bit darker a little bit lighter all that stuff okay so ultimately you as the artist have the ultimate say in your pieces you're responsible for your work right so you have to think about whether or not you're getting read because for example i can assist this and say you know what that number two this one right over here looking a little bit too light i feel like with, res with respect to the background i could say that right so it's my responsibility to say okay let's just take that and let's just lower it but how do i lower it not so much as to impact my number three and i can't increase it so much to impact my number one so something in between i just lower it slightly like that maybe and there you go still maintained still maintained and now the read is even stronger what are the other options i could have done i could have made the background here i could have made that much lighter or much darker depending on my needs to make sure that that, that reads actually coming through so i can make it lighter over here for example and that makes that face look more contrasted okay this is something that's beyond the simple rules but it's something that i always want people to think about it's that when something is on your canvas it's your duty to make sure that stuff reads the way it needs to read right you can't just abandon things because you follow the rules okay so i'm giving really strong rules here but the way you're going to use them it shouldn't be you shouldn't be a slave to them right it's just a tool like one of my ad's always says there's no rules they're only tools so you just use them as a tool let's we'll talk about the edges now edges are really important go ahead no, uh, someone was just uh, saying in the chat uh, the perspective on the shadow. I guess uh, I guess they're commenting on how it's inconsistent with the top cube and the bottom. Yeah, or, yeah, it's it's uh, wonky. It's for, it's for sure wonky. Yeah, yeah. All right, I can fix that later on. Go ahead, edges. Yeah. Yeah. So edges, I think it's a fair comment. Totally fine. So this was just a quick little selection tool to explain stuff. But um, edges are simply something we do to make sure things look more natural. Because one of the things we kind of fight in all sorts of illustration or painting in general. Is the fact that we fight things looking too stiff so in order to kind of prevent things from looking too stiff we do a few things to the edge the outside contour so for example when things are excessively sharp we cut them off like that we, we kind of round off the edges the little nibs there just to ensure that things don't look too strong because this is a genuine problem by the way when you're doing any sort of hard surface rendering things looking hyper crisp will take you out of the image like nothing else right even further than that even further than that the transition between these edges they're not hyper crisp it's not a transition like this which goes basically like a light to a dark that's not how things work in reality there's usually going to be a transitionary value in between the two of them what i like to do personally is i like to just grab this value right, and this value and i just pick something in between and i'll choose that as my intermediate and i'll go ahead and just line that and line that in just like that see so abs take care abs I'll just line in between. Same thing over here. I'll just pick an intermediate value. So you just want some value on the side there that just prevents you from having to be stuck with razor sharp edges because that stuff will take you out of a cube like nothing else. Okay, so it's just something to kind of offset those razor sharp edges. Again, this stuff should also be gradiated, by the way. The edges, and I keep saying the word gradiated, but it's important to realize just how much it's important. I'll show you how to do that. A simple technique is just to kind of grab a light value, make a new layer basically. Put in that, that edge value, no matter how light. So we can expect this to be maybe the highlight value, for example. So if, if that edge is, is highlighted over there, if that edge is highlighted right over there, for example, we can just make that on a new layer and use our airbrush and then just tone it back until it looks Why natural. Why are you making your edge lighter? So this is just artistic liberty, basically. I can because I have no clear idea or basically the viewer has no idea about where that light source actually is right so in terms of industrial rendering the top face is kind of like it's open season basically it's free real estate so this this is up to us to decide so I can really say there's gonna be a gradation from this way to that way or that way to this way this is kind of really up to you to decide you get to take some artistic liberty that's like that's word for word was explained to me in in my uh, uh, high level rendering class, word for word. That's what he said. He said the top phase you can take a lot more liberty. Do you do this stuff all the time? Yeah, basically all the time. So I can choose where my highlight is. Remember, what is the concept of highlight? Like, where does highlight even come from? 
the highlight is just a light source reflecting off the object, right? And it's hitting the eye of the observer. So really, the highlight is, is dependent on where you're looking at things. So as long as the highlights themselves are consistent in the image, it's totally fine to put them wherever you want, right? You can't go crazy and put the highlight in a shadow, but on the edges of a lightest square or the lightest edge, or the lightest face rather, you can put it wherever you want, basically. Just whatever looks good and consistent. There's, there's of course a logic to it, there's of course logic to it, but at this point, I think it's fine to just be a little bit more open to this particular area, okay? There's definitely a logic with highlights, there's a consistent logic with them, but I think it's worth considering that this comes under the category of things that you can kind of play around with on your piece. You as the artist get to decide where your highlights are going to be. It's not kind of saying, that, okay, the light's from the top, so therefore the highlight must be over here. You get to play around with it a little bit more, okay? So in the concept of edges, I want to talk to you about um, contact shadow. Very important, okay, and it's missing in your painting. When something is in close proximity or close contact with something else, you tend to have something like this happen. We have a kind of a deep dark fantasy, a deep dark line right there. Right there, in between. That's what I thought ambient occlusion kind of was. Like, I've heard people say, no, that's not really what it is. Like, um, but basically, I just imagine when two things like touch each other, like if you put your hands together, it's very dark in the middle. That's what I, that's what I imagined it as, uh, you know. Okay, so it's a gradual process, right? So this technically is still ambient occlusion. It's just technically re regular occlusion. So what's really happening over here? What's happening is that this face is just so close to this floor that any light in this particular area, right underneath that cube, a very small sliver of it can be observed by us, is going to get really dark. Because that is about as close to true shadow as you can achieve in a piece because it has such minimal amount of light affecting it. Because really, this area over here, even though it's ambiently occluded, it's not like there are no lights there, right? There's still light there, it's just less light. It's like less light over here, even less light over here, and under the bottom, that's basically as close to no light as you're gonna get, you know, at least in this particular idea, okay? So this is gonna be the darkest, generally the darkest area that you're gonna get for one particular image. And even this, by the way, is radiated right we have a slight amount of gradation there but you see it, it makes a difference see that that to that makes it look like it stands way stronger so you can call this a contact shadow you can call this an occlusion you can call it an ambient occlusion doesn't matter but it needs to be there on your piece okay mm -hmm. so that stuff i put it under my edges because it's, it's like a straight line basically in a cube so I, I do that stage in the edge in the edge stage okay and that's basically the final thing. So same thing goes up here, same thing goes up here. I'm gonna have a little bit of that shadow in here. Don't worry, Sammy. A little bit of that shadow up there to act as a contact shadow, okay? And that's it. Anything beyond that is just making sure your work is clean. Make sure it's a good presentation. If you have any um, weird shapes or you have any weird lines or whatever, clean that shit up, okay? But ultimately then it's just cleaning up the presentation making sure that for example the adjustment that i made earlier that would happen right now i would say oh wait a second i did all the steps but then something doesn't look right so i'm not going to adjust stuff i'm going to make things darker i'm going to make things lighter okay all right so that's when you do stuff and it's, it's really important to do this step i wouldn't even call it cleanup you can just call it a review if you'd like because remember it's not enough to just follow rules it's important to always always stand there and say okay this is what you need to do. This is what I have. Am I doing what I set out to do? This is important no matter what you're doing. We might just be painting cubes here, but this is important in all painting. Step back and figure out what exactly has happened, right? And then think about whether or not that's achieving your goals. Is it doing what you want it to do? Does it look good? These larger questions have to be asked, okay? All right, oh boy. So, um. If you're afraid of like going to spheres or cylinders, don't be for my sake because I'm still following 100%. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to put that out there uh, just in case you were concerned. Okay, we can talk about spheres. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's, uh, it is a lot of information. So you learned all of this in school, but is there any other place that you uh, learned this? Yeah, yeah, of course. I knew this mostly before school. The process that I'm saying is from mostly my lecture. Some of it's my own editions. But you can just yeah. look at this from the Scott Robertson book. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's called Robinson How to Render. Buy it online. Borrow it from a friend. So how to render and how to draw are great books. This comes from how how to render. Halfway to black, that phenomenon comes from this book. Mm. So Scott Robinson, of course, a crazy guy in the industry. Yeah, he's all right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> so we can talk about um, cubes now. Oh, I'm sorry, spheres now. So any questions about cubes before we move on? Anybody in the chat uh, had any questions about this? You can talk, talk to me about it. Uh, whoever pointed out that the shadows are inconsistent, totally right, by the way. Completely right. They are inconsistent. So I should change that up. But if there are any questions about cubes, now's the time, guys. And then we can move on to spheres. So if you don't understand this part, spheres are going to be even harder. Because we have to talk about a bunch more things for spheres. So, um... If you, if you can go back to um, that woman knight thing that you did sure. um, after you're done uh, texting that shadow, um, does does she only consist of uh, spheres, cylinders, and cubes? Well, yes. Uh, anything is going to be be able to break. Um, you're going to be able to break anything down to very simple stuff like that. There's one additional okay. layer here, which is complex shapes, which in this particular case, I don't think there are any. Um, but I can show you how to do that later on. Um, I think let's try and do this first. Let's not load too much information because if you can't do a sphere, you can't do a complex shape. Yeah. But th the principle is still the same, okay? So let's talk about spheres since I think everybody's okay with uh, cubes. Let's talk about spheres really quickly. Let me just get rid of this. <gasps> no! How could you? Okay, so step number one, of, of course, always add a background. Alright. What was that? What is happening? Oh, that's my canvas, never mind. The RuneScape music? Yeah, I was inspired by Indian Abroad's stream uh, the other day. He was playing RuneScape music, and I grew up on that game, so... Hi Ace, welcome. Okay, so this is how to render a sphere from start to beginning. Step number one, draw the sphere and fail a hundred times because the drawing sphere is horrible. Nobody wants to draw a circle. Step number two is use a selection tool because you're a filthy cheater. Step number three, I'm gonna define. So what do we do? What's the first step for cubes, right? After drawing them, what's the first step? One, two, three, right? Yeah. So the one, two, three of the sphere is very similar. So I can do this in a multiple ways. I'm just going to do it with a round brush because I think it'll be easier to explain stuff. So the first thing that I choose is the number one. I'm going to choose this as my number one value. Okay? That's my number one. For anybody in the chat that it doesn't keep up with this stuff, or I wasn't listening, I wasn't there, number one is just the value of that particular object in the light. So this is my light value already. Okay? The number two, what do I choose, Azar? What is my shadow value? Um, Halfway... So, uh, from where you are, so not completely in the middle, but a little bit more. Yeah, so right over there, and I can just choose it as my shadow value. Now, this is a very, very big thing to talk about right now, and it's going to make the difference between a good sphere and a bad sphere. We're going to talk about cross contour, or just simply contour lines, cross contour lines. This is where perspective plays into huge dividends whenever you're drawing anything, and this is why perspective is kind of important for painting, at least a cursory understanding of stuff. When light is going to affect an object that distorts in 3D space, the shape of the shadow and the shape of the light are going to be dictated by the shape of the object, okay? So if this particular object is spherical, that means that all of the shapes on this object are going to be spherically oriented, okay? So you're going to get shapes like this. The second you render a sphere and you make these edges flat like that, that's the second you lose all sense of roundness, okay? It has to respect, and of course there are certain angles you can view this at, which makes this core shadow much more flatter or whatever, but it's really important to consider the fact that this stuff, it's really, really important to consider the fact that this stuff is always going to follow the contour. If you guys are wondering what the contour basically is, I'll draw it for you. So in perspective, right, I can consider a cross-sectional area, of the sphere to be something like this. Crosses in the center and it goes around. Right, that's my, that's my 
hemispherical my hemispherical cut of the uh, of the circle of the, of the um, sphere, and there are going to be so many more of that, right? The higher I go, it's going to be flatter, flatter. So I get to determine exactly the way that's going to respond to my light. That's just the the contour of it, right? You can think about this almost like grid lines that are going to run across the surface of your object. If you're able to draw these kind of lines to basically say what is going to be the shape of that object in that particular area, if you can do this in perspective, you can paint anything. Okay, you can paint basically anything. So to what give you, a, you call these again, I just call them. Lines? I call them cross contour lines. That's what they call the illustration. So basically, whenever you do any sort of gradation, when you draw any sort of shape on these objects, right? You are going to be following these cross contour lines. You're going to be following the surface or the way that this is shaped. You're going to be following that stuff. And if you don't do that, then everything is for naught, right? Everything is for naught if you don't accomplish this particular feat. Let me just show you an aside example why this is important. If I draw a bicep, for example, and I wireframe the bicep, this is, a, this is the center line. If the bicep is shaped like this, I cut it in half, I cut it in, in three fourths, and if I light stuff on the bicep, so if that's, that's the other contour of it. If, if, if I can wireframe something like that, I can light it from any angle I want. So if the light's coming from this side, what does that mean? That means that the, the planes or whatever that's facing away are going to be in shadow, like this. And I know what the shadow is going to be shaped like because I understand the contour. So that's going to be in darkness right over there. And these ones that are facing upwards, shaped like this, are going to be the light. It's going to get light over there. So you can make anything look three-dimensional. You can make anything look like it has volume based on these contour lines. So if you're able to picture what these look like, if you're going to be able to picture what that looks like in space, you're always going to be able to render something realistically. Okay? So this is that's beyond great. the concept of core shadow and bounce light. Of course, that's also important. But how do these things even come into being, right? How do they even come into being? And that's how this comes, it comes into being. The simple idea that everything follows that contour. Because that contour is just a line that you drew yourself to help you describe what that looks like. If anybody is familiar with constructing curves in perspective, um, this is called a rib. And this is called a spine. So I'll mark it out for you. That's red is a rib, and red is a spine, and this blue is going to be a rib. So if you can rib and spine everything, you are 100% going to be able to paint everything accurately. Okay? Okay, so essentially what you're doing is you're taking... Um, an object that doesn't really have these uh, obvious uh, faces, such as a cube, and, and you're kind of breaking it down to show that there are not necessarily faces, but um, when, when you put this object against light, you can show which, which part of it is hitting the light and which isn't. Mm, basically, yeah. Okay. It's just an exercise to see what things are shaped like in that particular area of the object, right? Because if you don't keep track of this, spheres don't look like spheres, cubes don't look like cubes, nothing looks like anything. Because ultimately, you're drawing, you're not really respecting the, um, what the drawing actually means, right? Because remember, when you draw a circle, anything could happen in that circle, right? Like, for example, I could have a weird dent, for example, in the circle, a weird dent in here. Who knows, right? I could have it. But the fact that I don't see that dent in these outside lines, right? That basically means that if I don't account for this idea in the contour, I'm not going to be able to paint it accurately, right? So basically, you are kind of showing yourself how things are going to be shaped inside that object. And then based on that, you're going to be painting it, right? For a sphere, it's really simple, right? It's just a matter of just getting that kind of horizontal circular idea through the entire piece. Really, really simple stuff. But this will be really, really important the more you start to paint complex objects. Because you want to understand how things are curving, how things are shaped at every stage of that whole object, right? How does it look like in perspective? And drawing these, these ideas is really important. Now, I'm not going to ask you to draw them, but I am going to ask you to pay attention to them when you do so. Because it's really important for this next step, okay? And the next step is just this gradation step, right? 
and this is where it's really important to make something look like a cube or make something look like a sphere so i'm going to get rid of this but keep it in mind so every time i add a band of gradation every time i do that so let me just go ahead and make a larger sphere here so i can get more of a room to play around with stuff so from the very beginning right the, even the core shadow i think about that curve has to be there the less you do this the less round anything becomes okay it all starts from this first little shape and what am i doing here i'm just following that surface i'm following that contour in that particular area i'm saying that in space this particular sphere is curved like that okay that's all i'm saying and then now is the question of just applying your ideas of gradation right so again i can throw in my half tone value now is this a value close to the light so we'll put that, put that right over there okay and then it's just gradation time right and every time i gradiate i'm not going to do it flat on like that i'm not going to do anything like that all i'm going to do is i'm going to follow it at every stage the lines we drew before here's where they used okay so curve it around right curve it around curve it around curve it around curve it around okay same thing goes for that bounce light right bounce light does its exact same thing so if i get the bounce light value over here that also kind of curves around like that and it curves around even further and even further than that okay. so it always follows that contour it follows the contour no matter what stage is going to be at so this is the big deal with being able to draw and kind of figure out how things work in perspective because this is how you can translate that knowledge to kind of help you shade stuff to help you add value to stuff okay so i, I can play around with this a little bit so i'm, I'm basically rendering a cube with um, or a sphere with just my round brush but it's perfectly possible there are a few little things to kind of pay uh, attention to right of course over here remember what i said earlier if things aren't reading well you have to change stuff so let me make that background a bit darker towards the bottom get a good little read here okay so again just for the round brush now i can say okay maybe i want to get a bit more roundness in the core shadow but what am i doing here i'm just kind of following that contour i'm just imagining so, what a slice would look like in perspective go ahead um yeah no eve is asking if there's a schedule to the stream so uh for those of you who are tuning in uh right now we're kind of going through um this which is understanding form and and stuff like that and light and uh shadows and so on uh and we're going to be doing a crit of one of my pieces and then after that um we're going to look at a couple of pieces and then after that uh subs and stuff they can submit on his discord um uh, i think and, i made it like everybody can submit today so everybody can submit today it's fine everybody okay yeah then uh, if you guys want to um uh, you know uh get critted then um join his discord if you're in my stream exclamation point indian and they will give the link to his uh stream and you can go from there and uh yeah so I don't know how long we're going to be streaming. I don't know the exact schedule, but we do have a plan at least. So, yeah. Okay. So, moving on, you have to play a little bit, a few things by ear here. So, for example, if that contrast is a bit too much, it can tend to look like things don't really respect um, the way spheres are. So, I'll make some adjustments just to ensure that things aren't crazy contrasted. It can perfectly work for more like reflective circumstances, but again, this is something that you have to play around with. Okay, but again, no matter what you do, you have to ensure that it follows that contour at every stage. All right, so now that was just a round brush, right? And now we're kind of looking pretty spherical already. But there's so many more things to kind of add here. Okay, the first thing that a lot of people miss here is you want to be thinking about your core shadow as not just a very static kind of object, but your core shadow also has a little bit of gradation to it. So I'm going to do it the very hard way, and you don't have to ever worry about this. If you're going to use an airbrush but if you want to do the very hard way which is just using round brush you're going to add a little bit of that core shadow with your with your round brush here so let me just grab a, a 50 percent brush here so again i don't really mind people doing this with that brush but again if you want to do the hard way how come how come your uh core shadow has um such a hard edge maybe you explain that but i must have missed it um so core shadows are always going to have a little bit of a hardness to them and that's basically it's always because of the fact that um so maybe not on this side that's, that's how i probably have to deal with it a bit more but um on this side towards the light side 
that's always going to be pretty hard just because of the fact that the shadow jumps from the light right so it's always going to be a bounce from the light that, that should be pretty familiar to you by now from your illustration work but things don't just go from shadow to light gradually it's always a big little jump from shadow to light right that's because it's called that separation of light and dark in, in illustration but it's never a gradual change it's it goes light less light less light less light and then boom shadow Huh. That's after circles, it would be gradual, you know? Uh, it, it is gradual, and it can be even more gradual than what we have right here, right? We could have a bit more radiation. It's ultimately up to you, right? Because this is governed by a, a few factors. Um, so nothing is necessarily wrong or right beyond just having good contrast. But if you'd like, we can put in a bit more contrast. But really, having a, a strong, pronounced core shadow goes a long way in ensuring okay. that you have a good read for your circles. So basically all that's happening there is that you're kind of playing with the ambient light and re reflectivity of the sphere to kind of give you more or less of that radiation. That's ultimately up to you and that's a bit more of a high level concept, uh, but we don't get into that right now. So kind of play it by ear, but all I kind of care about from you right now is to ensure that this reads really well. So I personally prefer like maybe approximately that, so you can see a spheres from me for example that I've done. So I prefer maybe about that much radiation. That's probably a bad example, that's not a sphere. So this is a sphere over here. So this, this is pretty much what you want to be going for, I guess. It's a decently rendered sphere, even though that's an oh. oval. But it's a natural looking contrast, right? So you see, it's, it's a, big of a bit of a jump right there. Yeah. Huh, I never noticed that. That's interesting. Yeah, and again, this is determined by a lot of things. So it doesn't necessarily have to be this. It's just a good starting point, right? This is a decent starting point to think about. And yeah, it can you can get it with the shoulder pads as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting. So I like that kind of contrast because it's it's a little bit harsher, so it gets me better reads most of the time. Okay, so that's number one. So your your shadow and your gradation. If anybody's wondering how I do my blending um, with round brush, blending is just using um, a round brush set at fifty percent opacity, and I just do standard blending. I just sample, I paint, I sample, I paint, I sample, I paint. Very simple blending. But again, you can use an airbrush if you'd like to. I wouldn't recommend it, maybe. Because you might learn a bit more using round brush, but again, it's up to you. So once you have kind of have this gradation in there, right? Once you have everything in there, you can go ahead and think about your highlights. We'll consider the sphere to be matte. Okay, it'll be a matte sphere. So okay. I'm not going to go into the differences too much between matte and reflective. Let's just take, take everything as matte, or right, maybe slightly glossy, and I'll show you how to do it. Right. So everything has a little bit of a specular. So a matte specular is a much wider, much less impactful specular. So something like this would be a matte specular, right? Just a general spec. It's barely even noticeable, but most objects will have this, right? It's a general matte spec. It's like that. And if you want to make it more glossy, all you have to do is lower the size of your brush. I can gradually put in a much more glossier specular in there. Right, something like that. Perfectly possible. And this is going to help to add more roundness to your overall, overall object. Okay, but this is just done by airbrush. Basically, it's one of the many ways to do specular lighting. Uh, you can use it with, with a, we can use a glossy brush. You can use um, a multiply brush or a, even a dodge brush if you want to do this. Airbrush is fine though. I think it's okay. You can use that um, for most purposes. So how did I do that again? From the start to finish, all I did was I grabbed a large area. That's my general specular. I think in the Robinson book, they separate this out. They have a general specular and then a much more particular specular. So to do the particular one, you go lower in your size of your brush, make a stroke, lower, lower, lower. So all we're doing is we're gradating that specular to make it look more natural. So we get a specular like that, okay? Mm, okay. Then we have a few more things to talk about here. So we talk about things like ambient light slash tangential light. We have a certain condition here, which we don't really see in cubes because a cube is locked into position, but a sphere will see all angles. So a very common situation in spheres is that I can see, I can see the background of the atmosphere around the sphere. So I'll see some sheer lights on either side like that and like that. Now, how much you want to do this, where you want to put this, that's up to you. Because again, it depends on the background and the background is something that you control. But I want to see a few of these lights here because it does really tend to add to the spherical nature of stuff. Okay? Stuff like this. It really does help to make things look more spherical. Are you with me so far? Yeah, yeah. 
And the same thing applies for down there in the shadows. It's also going to be things that are bouncing on the shadows that are going to erode across that core shadow. Very common that you see core shadows are never really a straight line. They tend to be much more like a like a wedge shape. And that's because of these ambient lights, all these tangential lights that are playing across the sides of the cube. Like that. What's a, what's a tangential light, light? How do you say that? So tangential lights basically mean that they're on the tangent. So a tangent on a sphere or a circle is just something like this. That's a tangent. It's on the side, right? On the very side. So a tangential light is just a light that's acting across that very edge. The very edge of that particular sphere. It's a very common phenomenon on any surface. If you look at the very sheer angle of something, it looks a lot brighter. Um, there's a common experiment you can do there where you can just shine a light on your table and it, your table will look kind of kind of light But then you put your eye down to your table level and then look at that table surface. It'll look really bright for some reason Oh, Interesting, right? yeah, and that's just a phenomenon of light, right? So how it can look so the second I add that Starts to look a lot more natural. So we added Fresnel effect might be might be uh, Gust it could be I'm not quite sure about the exact science of it, but it's one of the many things you can add to um, to this side. I know Fresnel lighting for um, for hair and stuff like that, but I don't know if I equate them. I'm not quite sure. I can only speak what I know. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure about that. But I want to point out something over here that I did there that I wasn't explaining while I was doing this, which is simply when I put that light in there, I did it on a new layer. So I'm going to explain it with uh, a red here. Isn't it similar to rim lighting? To a certain extent, the thing, the difference, okay, I'm going to explain this to E for a second, but rim lighting is like that, right? It's stuff that kind of fixes on the contour, right over there, it kind of highlights stuff. To a certain degree, it's similar, but this is a little bit more subtle than that. Rim usually happens when something oh, is superimposed against a light source, okay? Against a light source. But this happens regardless of that, okay? Regardless of that, you have this kind of, this kind of lighting happen. And that's just because of the nature of spherical objects, right? I guess it depends on how you want to interpret the word rim lighting. But if you already know about this, it's perfectly fine. I, I would uh, definitely recommend don't get too stuck on the nomenclature. If this is like what you interpret rim lighting as, I'm not going to disagree, right? Because again, the nomenclature is all over the place. So the, the terms I'm using here mostly come from the Robertson book here. So I'm going to stick to the, the textbook terms. Just so that people read the textbook later on, everything makes sense to you. So to run you through what we just did, we did number one, number three. We put the number two in the between. We gradiated it with respect to the contour. And what I wanted to talk to you about is that when I put anything, when I put anything on the sphere, right? And this will be really important when you do material stuff, but anything on the sphere, I can't just do this because what this is doing is it's destroying the curvature. So what did I say? Everything on the sphere will follow the cross contour of that sphere. Basically, everything will follow the curved surface, or just the surface, just that topo topology, topography, one of the two words, it's going to follow that. So this will never happen. It'll happen like this, right? It, it might follow that contour. It might follow the contour like that. That's possible in the scheme of things. That's possible to curve it like that. And why is that? Because if I, was, if I just wireframe across this entire drawing, what do these vertical things look like? These vertical lines look like this, right? They go and they res these all will tell me about that curvature of the object. So I think about this whenever I'm adding anything to the sphere. Everything's going to respect these lines, right? These lines are going to dictate everything. So if you're able to kind of draw these lines across your object accurately, you're going to be able to add and remove anything that you need to that object and make it look real. Okay? Everything respects that surface. So remember that bicep thing we talked about? Same thing, I can draw lines wherever I want on top of that because I know how it's shaped. And based on those lines, that's how the lighting is going to affect stuff. That's how the material is going to affect stuff because that's just telling you about the surface. So in um, perspective curve surfaces, we call it skinning. So you skin the object. So basically when I draw these lines, I'm drawing it across the skin. Right? And these lines are based on perspective, by the way, because again, what is this line? We talk about it fundamentally. What is this line? This line is one half of a complete semicircle in perspective. Okay? So if I draw the whole circle, it's a little bit scuffed. Let me redraw it. So the whole circle is like, like that. But because I'm not drawing through, you can't see the other side. Okay, I'm not drawing through. 
but this means that I'm looking slightly down at my circle or at my sphere rather does that make sense I'm looking slightly down at that so basically what this means is that if I have a horizon line it's gonna be somewhere over there okay right it's gonna be on top which means that the, the sphere up here so let me draw the entire contour for you to make the best sense out of this the sphere up here is gonna be really you're gonna see barely any distortion and the, the further down we go the more of it we can see and this is where perspective plays into painting where the further down I go the more round that's going to get right the more round it's going to get because I'm going to be able to see more of that surface so right over there there's a bit messily this is crazy okay <laughs> So basically what that means is that all the way down here I can see the most of that surface so this is going to be like that a super curved contour mm -hmm. are you familiar with moving semicircles or moving planes in perspective um I think that's one of the things that I I, I think I need to do more of because uh, uh my answer is no I I don't think so okay well we can talk about that later but uh if you think about this in terms of vanishing point it's really simple so let me just uh just because you asked the question i'll show you this show, i'll show this to you through construction so okay. if i drew planes continuously if i had the same plane the closer this plane gets to the um, to the horizon line to my vanishing point right the smaller that top face is going to become so you're familiar with this right if that's the same distance it's going to look like that basically so yeah, yeah. in perspective the stuff that is lower on the horizon line you're looking down at more right can you agree right so yeah. if i'm going to look down at something more and that something is a cross section of a sphere that means i'm looking down at a circle much more so that means that if i look at a, a sphere and the bottom section of that sphere that bottom section is going to be way more circular than the topmost section because it's much mm -hmm. further away from the horizon line Okay? Right. Okay. So that's why this is happening. So I can see much more of this stuff. And I think this is something that it gets, it gets easier to realize when you construct a lot of stuff in perspective. So construct a lot of cubes. Okay? So we are okay so far. Get rid of that layer. What else are we missing over here? Of course, we missed something really important, which is just the shadow. Shadow's going to be down here. I'm not going to talk about too much shadow projection here, but again, same rules apply. Same rules apply. So halfway to black off the surrounding. Again, do maybe better layer management than I am, because I need to do a lot of stuff with selection tool here. Down there. So that goes into darkness. James, just passing to say that I, that I kind of love you for dumbing down this complicated knowledge to a completely understandable level. Hey, don't worry about it. It's all good. It's what I do. True. Shout out to James. True. Okay. So that's going to be the cast shadow. And how did I choose that? Remember what we talked about over here for the cube? It's just halfway to black of that floor value, right? So ba bam. That's your cast shadow. Somebody in the chat said ambient occlusion, and he's completely right. We're going to add some of that ambient occlusion here. So remember, what is ambient occlusion? It's just that simple idea we talked about earlier. The simple idea that the closer I get, the less light that I can see, the darker something's going to get. So I can immediately assume that this little central circle over here, it's going to get darker and darker and darker the closer I get to this bottom, right? Because again, less light. The shadow isn't just no light, it's just less light, right? The shadow as we kind of consider it in all painting is just the things that are kind of blocked from the main light source. But the main light source is not the only light source we have so many more in every single scene so a bit more ambient over there ambient down below and of course we can even do the reverse way we can kind of make the shadow a bit lighter the further away it gets really really common to see this and remember if you want to make your shadows look really nice always consider thinking about the way that that blurring happens the softening happens because remember the light around this that's invading the army of the darkness in the shadow it doesn't just take it and convert it to a lighter version it also erodes the edges of it right so it's going to have a little bit of blurring there to make it look good 
right? And this is, again, blurring is just the tool I'm using, but the concept remains the same. And the concept is simply the idea that it's going to make things look a little bit less clear, okay? And again, the same concept applies if, for example, any one of these edges were too close to the main sphere, those edges would be much sharper than the edges that are further away, okay? Mm -hmm. So we add that, that stuff in. And again, I want you to think about something over here, the concept of contact shadow we talked about earlier, or just the occlusion. On the cube that we drew, this was a line, right? On the cube that we drew was a line. Where is the cube that we drew? I have no idea. It's gone. <laughs> you destroyed it. Okay, whatever. So, <laughs> uh, the little contact shadow on the very bottom of the sphere, that's going to really sell certain things, right? It's really going to make it grounded. So you look for this stuff. So again, that is about as close. That is about as close as super darkness that you can get on any one of your pieces. Right? Now, of course, it's going to vary in terms of local value and whatever, but in the context of what we're just talking about here, this stuff is going to be gold to make sure that things look like they're sitting on, on other things. It's a contact shadow, basically. And it's a big deal. It really grounds stuff. Okay, so I can show you some spheres that I've done for material studies. Uh, let's go ahead and grab some of those. But here are some simple examples of material spheres. Just because I need to show you some spheres in general. Will there also be bounce light from the object onto the ground? For sure, um, yeah. So will that happen like in the shadow? Like, will you have light, ha like, light from the object in the shadow as well? Or yeah, you will have a little bit of that. That's called a phenomenon of double bounce. And I don't tend to talk about double double bounce at this stage. But the second you show me some good spheres, then we can talk yeah. about double bounce. Because otherwise okay. it gets a little bit too much. Most of the time I've seen when people get into double bonds too quickly, uh, this, this area becomes a fucking mess. So I'm just yeah. simplifying it. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just wondering. Yeah, so the, okay. the more you do that, the more realistic it becomes. If anybody in here uses Blender or uses any 3D software, um, there are options to toggle number of bounces of your light. And you'll notice that every time you up the number of bounces, things become real, more real, more real, and it almost becomes hyper-realistic to the end of it. Because that's really the levels of like complexity you want to play around with with rendering. So same thing applies over here, okay? So it'll look, look more realistic, but it's also a little bit harder to kind of uh, figure out. So I don't want to bring that to you right now. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's okay. okay, so, and that's basically it for uh, for spheres. I'm going to think about if I'm missing anything over here. Not too much. Uh, be a little bit careful about this edge. Don't make it too super uh, perfect again. That's something we, we oftentimes fight against. So I can just blur up this edge or use a bit of airbrush. Because that just looks better, right? This looks like it's uh, more natural. Mm -hmm. That kind of idea is there. And of course, don't ever be afraid to go back and say, oh, listen, my core shadow is not very core shadowy. So I can make it a bit darker. That's also totally fair. So the roundness. Should the bottom part of the ball be darker because of ambient occlusion? It does actually happen. And that's actually included in this, in the, in the choosing of this particular shadow. So there's something that I haven't talked about yet on the stream, which is directional bounce light. But again, I'm going to leave this for right now. I think this understanding is good enough for the current for the current time. But bounce that is actually directional, so it doesn't just happen everywhere on the bottom. But I think at this stage, I'm going to leave it at this at this degree of complexity. I think it's uh, a bit easier to kind of stomach. But um, I'm not going to disagree. I think Gus makes a great point that the there's going to be an effect of everything. Like this darkness over here is going to actually reduce the bounce that over there. But um, we'll leave it as is. I think this is a decent decent enough render for a sphere. So any questions on this, guys, on what was explained? Because we can move on to the last part, which is cylinders. And then I can give Azar his little assignment. And then move on to crits. Yeah. Oh, God. It's crazy how uh, something as simple as a, a cube or a sphere can, can all of a sudden become very complicated. But at the same time, still simple, you know? It's yeah. Just... I mean, the thing that we're doing here is we're rendering something like crazy or rendering something um with no preference whatsoever so something from imagination which is rendering that completely so we need to show everything so we need to keep track of everything i found the bottom is lighter or is just for showing purpose so the bottom over here i think it's it's definitely a bit too light the way i've shown it because i added the, the shadow in later but the bottom is just from bounce light basically so it's just a bounce light from the bottom so maybe in retrospect what i would do to correct that is i would just grab this area Trying out 3D programs helps a lot? Yeah, definitely. 
I think definitely everybody should try out Blender or SketchUp or something like that. I think it really helps because you can pose things in multiple angles. So to kind of do a bit of an addendum here, I would think about doing something like this maybe to make things look a bit more natural. But definitely there's going to be some bounce. There's going to be some bounce there. But that's just bounce light basically. And the reason we're doing that by the way is because that's one of the major factors that is keeping us, us from having flat shadows because remember everything matters so the bounce that's giving me additional excuses to have this kind of round roundness happening on my piece right it's giving me ad additional excuses would the guidelines look if the light is directly in the center would they look more circular or more vertically but bent if the light is directly in the center so right over here you mean so if the light was hitting right over here let me just draw over so you're saying that the light is hitting right over here, for example. Is that the question? Okay, so what is, what's going to happen there is that the whole uh, entire drawing changes, but I'll show you how it changes. So all you have to think about is the fact that I can draw one contour over there. I can draw a second contour around there. I can draw a third contour around there. So I'm just thinking about how the contours look. And again, fourth contour around there. It's just the same situation, but now it's flipped on the side. So what's going to happen over here is that I'm going to get a core shadow on the back, right? Because that's, that's going to be my core shadow. It's the, it's the side that's facing away from my light. That's going to be in shadow now. This highlight or this light is going to be right over there. And there's going to be less light. And then less light. So... I know also like, um, you know, before you went to FZD, you tend to uh, just work on one layer. People in my chat are asking me about um, your layer usage, if you if you use uh, multiple layers or if you use maybe more layers now than before, or are you using more layers now just to demonstrate? Like, Okay, so the question about layer usage, um, it is completely up to you, but for this particular kind of thing, I find myself using a lot more layers than I usually would. Because here's the thing, right? I don't know what's, what software people use, but there's a very cool thing you can do with layers that you can't do in traditional, which is sculpt things on a different layer with the eraser. So for example, I can show you this um, on a different layer maybe. Uh, let me just show you a very classic example of things that I do, right? So if I want to light this tangentially, let's say, a tangential light, here's something that I can't do without layers, that I need layers for basically. So if I use my airbrush, and I just light the side of this over here. And I need to erase you know, in order to make sure that this um, follows a contour, right? Because everything follows a contour. Remember we talked about that? If I need to erase that, I basically erase off my own layer. And if I want to use my existing values on my uh, sphere, it kills my existing radiation. It's a really complicated to do. Okay, so it's a very difficult fix. So instead of doing that stuff, what I tend to do, and this is one of the few places I use extra layers, is I just hit Control Shift N for a new layer, I draw in my tangential light, for example, and then I sculpt it with my eraser, right? I sculpt it with my eraser, I get it to where I want it to be, right? And then I can just collapse it. So I use layers just if it's gonna preserve my existing stuff. So if I need to do some manipulation with my next stroke, it's gonna ruin my existing part of my drawing, then I'm gonna use a layer. Otherwise, all of these paintings you see over here that I've done personally, um, I think it might be because of my background, but these are all, all of them have been done with one layer, basically. All of these are done with one layer. But things like this, for example, like there's a tangential light, so now you know what that is because I explained the spheres to you. This is an example of a tangential light, but when I put this light in, I did it on a different layer because I already had some amount of gradation on this helmet. So I made a new layer, I made a light, I made a light on the side of this, I erased it according to the contour of it, and then I collapsed it and I continue working on the same layer. So it's a very situational thing for me. The reason is simply because I want to be in my piece, I want to be focused on my piece, and I don't want to be in that situation where whatever I do doesn't affect what I'm looking at. So I tend to have everything on the same layer, except for the background and sometimes the shadow. But everything on that object is going to be on the same layer for me. But layer management is up to you. Uh, probably the more the better if you're new to this idea. So use as many as you need. But I don't need that many, so I don't use that many. Mm -hmm. 
but that's front life. So that's spheres, okay? So um, I think I answered a couple of questions there. But that's basic sphere rendering 101. All the things that you need to make it look spherical. The should biggest. No, go ahead, go ahead. The biggest thing I want people to be aware of here is just that idea of contour because that's something that is beyond spheres, completely beyond spheres. It's so important to realize that the way you put lights and shadows, including the gradation of lights and shadows, all of that is determined by how something curves in space, how something appears in space. And that's governed by perspective. Okay? So even if you don't have excellent perspective knowledge, you should be able to just wireframe something on the drop of a hat. You should be able to wireframe something at any point and say, this is what it looks like wireframed. Because if you can do that, you can 100% light it. Without a doubt, you can light it if you can do this. If you can wireframe around something. And that's why for the assignment that I'm going to give uh, Azar over here and anybody else is free to do it, I'm going to ask him to do this kind of wireframing stuff around his, his shapes. I'm going to ask him to draw everything. Okay, because I'm, I'm going to look at that and say, okay, your perspective is fine. You can continue painting or there's problems with your perspective. We're going to work on your perspective later. Okay, so that's fierce. The last is, one here. Go ahead. Is the wireframe the same thing as a draw through? Like when you have like a cube, you, you draw the the faces or the lines that you don't see yeah yeah you know, it's the same thing i'm just because most people are not familiar with the word draw through i try i try to use things that make more sense right yeah but it's called draw through in, in concept art okay okay that's spheres pretty easy last one cylinders a lot easier than spheres actually same concept uh, i should probably have done cylinders first but uh we can still accomplish that let me just make a new layer here So first step is always drawing. I'm going to point out a couple of things that I see that are very common mistakes when people draw cylinders. The first one, let's just draw a simple one, right? So maybe parallel to the light. The first one that people make a bit, bit of a mistake with cylinders, uh, let's just do one like that maybe, is that when they draw the circle for a cylinder, they tend to make it really weird in the sense that they tend to make it terminate right over there, for example. I'm trying to do it wrong intentionally here. Uh, <laughs> when you're too, when you're too good at art, I actually I get this wrong all the time, but I'm thinking about it right now. So this is a very common example of our incorrect cylinder. What's the problem here? The problem is is that you have to consider the way that this edge happens. This edge is terminating. You have to think about this terminating in a certain way that it actually makes a full circle. This isn't a circle, right? This this in front face looks like that. To make things look really cylindrical. Consider drawing a little bit more around these areas. Draw around them. Because you want to see everything ultimately culminate in a circle. And then you can kind of finish the drawing like that. A very common mistake that I see in most cylinders is this. People don't tend to think about the fact that it needs to be a circle. So think about that stuff whenever you're drawing a cylinder. So draw a little bit more than you need. And then connect it. Don't just draw, uh, draw it arbitrarily. What I tried doing, so for, for the portal piece that I did, and we can look at it later, uh, we, I, I tried drawing a pillar, and I was, um, it's in two points per, two point perspective, so I was kind of scared of, like, doing this uh, cylinder, so what I did was I drew, like, a box, and then I tried, like, putting a circle in the box, if that makes sense, and then making a cylinder out of that. I don't know if it worked, but... That's totally fine. You can do it if you don't want to freehand stuff. I'm just assuming people understand a good amount of perspective before doing this, but uh, thanks for the bits, by the way. I appreciate that, Baroda. But um, I think Gus brings it up as well. Um, I'm just going to go quickly over this because it's not really the uh, part of the stream, but we can go over it. If you want to draw a circle in a square, it's very simple. First, draw a square. Okay. And then oh, draw a diagonal. I can't believe you've done this. Okay. Here's the quicker way of doing it. The quicker way is to divide this diagonal into thirds. This is a cheaty way of doing it. And of course you need one of these. And one of these. So these points, if you connect them theoretically, these points over here, you're going to make a circle. Okay? Which is going to usually be uh, not usually, this, this is, this is uh, irrespective of perspective, so no matter how this square is in perspective, that's going to create a circle, okay? 
that's one way of doing it. The full way of doing this is a little bit more complicated, but I can show that as well. You want to draw a circle in perspective. You divide the entire square into quadrants. This is going to be a little bit boring, so, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. So you divide the square into quadrants, right? You divide the quadrant into eights. So this is just an alternative way of doing it? Yeah, if you really struggle with drawing circles, this is the way you do it. Yeah. And again, this is uh, irrespective of perspective, no matter how the square is angled, this will work. And then what you do is ones and twos. So you mark a point over here, which is one, and you travel one, two, over there. So one space, and then two space. Right over there, right over there. Right over there, right over there. Oh, you travel in an L, kind of? Yeah, in an L, which is basically one high and then two long. Yeah, yeah okay. Right, and if you do that, you get an ellipse or a circle if the square is actually a square. Which, if you just round this corner over here, if you round it out, you get a perfect ellipse around that particular square or um, squarish shape. That's how you can always, so as long as you can draw a square, you can probably draw this idea. That's how, that's the hardest, most thorough method of drawing an ellipse. <laughs> that's possible. So basically draw quadrants, draw eights, and then do ones and twos. And then draw around uh, the corresponding uh, intersection point. So again, I, I went through that really quickly. You're welcome to go back and look at that. Uh, anybody that has, that, that has issues there. But that's the hard way of doing things in perspective. I just freehand it because I'm comfortable enough with doing that. So let's assume you get to this point, okay? You get to the point where you have a cylinder. It's actually quite simple now. Thanks, Robert. I appreciate that, dude. Very much appreciate it. Thank you for the bits. So, same thing happens here, right? Same thing happens here. If I was going to shape this, I need to understand where that um, the contours are, right? So what is a cylindrical contour? Across the major axis, it's this. Yeah. So I know that. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. Across the minor axis, it's this. Okay. Okay. So what did I say? I said that if you can do this in your mind or you can do this on your canvas, you're going to be able to render anything. So if a light's attacking the cylinder from this side, right? I can tell myself that my number one, my number one read, is going to have to follow these lines over here because it's, it's, it's getting hit tangential to, uh, tangential to the uh, major axis. So now that's going to be my light right there. Okay, really simple. And then I can say that the corresponding darkness will be that. So that'll be my darkness value. Maybe this is a little bit too darkness, like maybe it's too much darkness there, so I'll make it a bit more even. So everything is kind of evenly represented. So that's can one. your major and your minor contour change? Like, like let's say that you had light coming from, um, how do I say it? Um, kind of like from the top of the cylinder, right? Mm -hmm. Down. Would that would that would that change your uh, major and minor contours? Like, would it become the opposite? So the contours are irrespective of the lighting. I want you to kind of figure that out. So the contours okay. are based on the structure, which is based on the perspective and the drawing. So the way that the light interacts with stuff is based on the contour. The way the contour interacts uh, with the object that's based on your drawing. Okay. So the light's actually a victim of the contour, not the other way around. Okay. Contour just okay. contour is literally just a structure. Like if you if you're going to build this object with wireframe or with with uh, plaster of Paris, you would first start with like a wireframe build of it, all right? And then you'd put this these uh, things on top. You'd skin it, okay? So think about it that way. So the construction is just in the contour. So it's much more fundamental to the object than the lighting. Lighting can change, but the object's construction never changes. The same way that. The lighting on the face can change, but the structure of a face always is the same, right? Mm -hmm. Make sense yeah. so far? That makes sense, yeah. Okay. So, 
same ideas happen over here, right? Same ideas happen over here, which is, so I'm going to breeze through this because we have explained this already. We'll put a cast shadow in there just really quickly. Again, this cast shadow value is going to be the dark halfway to black on my floor. It's going to be that value. My cast shadow. Big question over here. What about this face? What is this face going to be? Here's, here's an interesting question. What? So we talked about contour lines and cross contour lines. What are the cross contours for this face? Any ideas? Cross contour? Yeah. Uh, isn't it minor? A minor one? Well, what is it going to look like? Um... So basically, if I was going to draw lines across, so like maybe in, in this angle, if I was going to draw lines below and wouldn't above, it, what would it look like? Wouldn't it kind of be similar to like the circle? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question. So basically, remember how I drew lines across a circle and I drew lines across a cylinder? I'm asking you, if I was going to draw lines across this particular plane, what would it look like? A lot of people in the chat okay. got the answer, I think. Um, I would draw it like horizontally following the circular shape, if that makes sense. Kind of like how you did on the circle earlier, or the sphere earlier. So you're saying something like this? Uh, let me see, there's a delay, but let me just see what you're doing. No. Okay. Like if you, if you do it the... If you flip it like 90 degrees, kind of. So like, um, like that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, so let me tell you why this is a problem. So a lot of people in the chat got it. Uh, it's just going to be flat, okay? It's going to be this. Yeah, yeah. So tell me why. Let's say yeah. Tell me why. Um, because it's a, it's it's a, it's a flat plane, right? Exactly. It's, right. it's just a flat plane. So technically, the direction doesn't even matter. I can do any direction. It's just a flat plane. So yeah, I think, a lot I, think people... I overthought that a lot, you know, because yeah. we've gone through some. <laughs> but here's the interesting part about that, right? You're the artist, so you get to decide what those actually look like, right? So if you were to say that the contour lines were like this, it's not really wrong. It's only wrong because we said it's a cylinder. But it could actually be like this. So what, what would that be? It would just be a cylinder with a bit of a circular, I'm sorry, spherical um, side edge, right? So when I light that, when I light that particular thing, because I, I, I can think about it as whatever I said it was, which is like a slightly pushed out spherical um, side plane, I can light it accurately to make it look like that. Like I had the liberty. So it's not like you did a wrong answer, but we said it's a cylinder. So in that case, it's wrong. Okay. But remember, because I understand how to see these things in cross contour, I can make you see what I want you to see in value. Because this looks like it's, it's got like a pushed out edge, right? It's got a pushed out um, side edge. Looks semi spherical. That's only because yeah. I, I followed your answer. I followed your answer about what it's supposed to be, which is not straight but curved. So then it becomes curved, and this is Wait, the. I'm seeing, I'm seeing like a like a PVC pipe or something, like hollow. Oh, okay, hold on. Let me just. Wait, how am I? I don't know. My brain right now is not functioning. Okay, so I'm not gonna draw through here. So right now this is just flat. Wait, isn't it a flat plane? Isn't the flat plane always one value, light or dark? I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. So whoever said straight lines is right, by the way, the straight lines. So it's basically, I can draw it out for you. So I'm drawing in there. So basically, this is what you answered me. Something like this. Oh, okay. This is what you basically looked at it as. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. okay? okay. So like a yeah, yeah, yeah. push. The reason I drew it inside is because I, I want to make a point here that, and this is like a larger point for art in general, this is the real power of contour lines and understanding how space works. It's simply that if I draw a square, if I draw a square, if I draw it, and you tell me, if I draw this with no context whatsoever, and I say, what is that? Is that a flat plane? Is it a curved plane? With no lighting whatsoever, what is that? Without drawing the cross contour lines, or without even thinking about them, there is no correct answer. It could be a billion different things, right? It could be a flat plane for sure, 
It's a circle, okay. Um, it could be a flat plane. It could be a plane with a hole in it. It could be a plane with a bulge in it. It could be a plane that is... Oh, it's, yeah. it's a sheer plane that goes in, in between. It's like an angle plane. This is like an open box. And that's the problem. Because we have not a clear idea about what something is without thinking about the internal structure. And we think about the internal structure through those lines. Right? Because I can, I can change this a billion different ways and show you a billion different uh, shapes, right? That's just it. So, to light this side, remember, this is going to be my half tone. Remember our cube that we drew? Mm -hmm. So, just like we drew the cube earlier, I don't know where it is. Is it dead? It's here. So, remember, the top face is light, this face is dark. This, this middle face over here is just going to be a value that's kind of close to the top face. Yeah. So we just choose this value over here. We can paint it in. Right now it's pretty close to my background value. And so I can just darken it a bit more. So yeah, would you change your background value then? You can change basically anything in there, right? So I would just make this value a little bit darker because I get to decide what it is, right? Right, okay. But I could, I could definitely change my background value. No big deal. So once you're happy with this, Apply the same things we applied for the sphere and for the, um, for these, what's it called, the cube, right? So, radiation still happens, right? Still goes from light to dark. So, we have a light, and it goes darker and darker and darker. Let me switch to my blending brush here. Over there. And the same thing down here happens, right? Bounce light on the bottom. Oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. Bounce light from the bottom here, there, 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 and there. Just gradi gradation on all surfaces, so that's what we're concerned about. Mm. It's bounce light, it's main light. And of course, if this looks a little bit too stark, because right now it's almost reflective, remember, exercise good judgment there and say, okay, I'm going to make sure that that's not super gradiated. I'm going to add a bit more darkness there to make sure that my cylinder is not super, super contrasted. Okay, and remember same thing as we talked about in spheres, the core shadow, even though it's very harsh, it's going to be a little bit of gradation there. A little bit of gradation on the core shadow. Legion, how's it going, dude? And thanks for the follow, by the way. A little bit over there. So this stuff is really important. It won't be a problem if you're doing this with airbrush, but if anybody's going to follow this with round brush, make sure to do this, it's important. Does, um... So to me, this cylinder oh, looks fuck. like I can't believe you've done this. A bit more glossy because you have such like a um a oh, fuck. Uh, I can't believe you've shadow, done this. Right, but if it's if it's a matte uh material, is 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 the is the transition gonna be like softer from light to dark, or is it still gonna be like you're gonna have like a strong shadow? Yeah, this is a little bit more of a glossy, so. Uh, I can show you some cylinders over here, for example. For a matte object, it'll look, look more like this, so a lot closer. These are some matte cylinders that I've done for my uh, foam painting. Alright, yeah. Right? So yeah. a little bit closer. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Remember, somebody was asking about the flat face. It is not going to be one single value, okay? It's going to be a gradated value, again, because everything is gradated. So we go ahead and select that. Okay, go ahead and select that manually because I'm not painting at 100% opacity apparently. And again, we hit it with the gradient from the left hand side, like that. Because again, when things are just super hot surface, it's really important to consider every little, every little area that you can add a gradient from. And it does indeed happen there. In illustration, we don't care too much about that, but when you're doing just regular, um, Realistic painting of hard surface is really important to think about every possible option to add in gradation to add in some variation in light. Okay, so, so we, I, I gradiate that just like I gradiate um, a sphere. Uh, I'm sorry, a square. Like, this is a regular but, square. Go ahead. Like the uh, you made like uh, the top oh, of the I can't of believe that you've plane. Done this. Like you made it lighter. Why can't you do, for example, the left side of that? Plane lighter and then oh fuck uh, i can't believe you've done this towards the right it gets darker is, is it because you're following um th the light which is hitting 
the main part of the cylinder? To a certain okay. degree, yeah. But the thing about the the way the light, the gradations in light go, is that it depends heavily on where that light source is actually positioned. So it's kind of up to okay. you, and that's why you have artistic liberty in the lights, because the shadows are kind of locked in based on the general direction of the light. But where the light kind of blooms and becomes much lighter, you can kind of play around with that as an artist and say this is exactly where it happens. I'll give you a common example of this. Maybe grab a desk lamp and um, put the desk lamp on top of your of your table, right? Yeah. So what's going to happen is there'll be an area on the table that is going to be a little bit more light than everything else on the table. Even though in illustration, right, we just consider all of this stuff to be one single value, right? Which is just bright. In industrial rendering we do it a little bit differently we say okay i know it's going to be in the light but i'm going to say that this particular area is going to be even more light it's going to be even more light right there and even more light even closer to there so it's always going to be a little bit more a little yeah, bit that more makes stuff. Sense. that makes sense okay so we get going to decide yeah no what's funny about art is like once you once you actually start breaking everything down, it's like you get a better understanding of how the world works, as if you were studying something like physics or math instead, which is just kind of you know crazy. <laughs> Questions in the chat: Why do light should reach all the points at the same rate? Only ambient and reflected should affect it. Should affect it? Well, not entirely true, because that's really assuming um, ideal light sources, which with no fall off, because everything has fall off, even in the light in the zone of the light. So a desk lamp, for example, is going to have way more fall off than the sun. And the fall off happens even within the area of light. So even inside, you're assuming ideal lights in your, in your view, it's, it's a very ideal light. But that's not how things happen realistically, right? Realistically, even in the area of light, there's going to be a radiation away from that center. Okay? Another question. If you have a flat square with a tunnel with a funnel in the middle, how would you draw that on a slanted angle? Jesus Christ, okay, let me break that down. <laughs> uh, if you have a flat square with the funnel in the middle, how would you draw that on a slanted angle? A flat square with the funnel in the middle, my goodness. Can you draw that for me and put it on my Discord? We'll talk about it later. <laughs> it's like a mental gymnastic right there. I'm not quite sure what you mean. I got until funnel in the middle, but slanted angle, that part you lost me at. And don't worry too busy, You're, it's, it's all good, man. The bigger the light source, the softer the shadow. There you go. Also a good uh, little small principle to keep in the back of your head. Is that true? To a certain degree, um, if the light source is super strong and super close, it'll tend to... So what does a big light source basically mean, right? It basically means that the light source is a little bit, considering like a little bit further away, you can consider the sun to be a big light source. It depends on your interpretation of it. But generally yeah. speaking, you can kind of affect the fall off in the shadow based on your own requirement. So, if you consider flashing a light onto your uh, hand, for example, and you place that really close to your um, table, that shadow on your hand is going to be really crisp if the light and your hand are really close to the, um, to the, the plane that's capturing the shadow, right? But if you move both of those things, it's like the, sh the shadow puppet phenomenon. If your shadow is being casted from really far away, the shadow itself is going to be really blurry. Right? So distance matters when it comes to casting stuff. Yeah, okay, that makes yeah true. Okay. So again, uh, we have a few things to do over here to complete the drawing. We have to up the core shadow to make things... Whenever things need to get rounder, like if your objective is to make things rounder, here are the common mistakes. People need to up the core shadow. So this core shadow over here, the, the bigger this, this becomes, the much more rounder something's going to look. So core shadow, see how beautiful that looks? Nice and round. Okay, that's going to help a lot. Also, Think about the highlight, the highlight, also I didn't talk about this too much, but the highlight on a sphere is more like a dot, the highlight on the cylinder is going to be more like a line. Why is that? It's simple and it feeds back into what we would talk about the entire night, which is it feeds back into the contour, right? So the contour or the shape of the object will determine what the highlight looks like. So spherical objects will have a small dot highlight and a cylinder will have a long highlight because that's the contour on a cylinder goes nice and long remember the general shut up remember the general <laughs> highlight on the sphere it was big and large and round and circular so that big circular juicy uh, highlight over there is now oh, a line fuck. i okay? can't believe you've done this that's what it looks like 
Okay, and remember, because it's a curved surface, just to wrap things up, we talked about tangential lights before. People are welcome to go back to the VOD when we talked about the circles, but there's going to be a tangential light. I will use a new layer for this. But again, all this is meaning is that since it's a curved surface, it can see more of the world than a straight surface, which is locked in. So maybe there's some light from the atmosphere hitting it on this edge. So this stuff really helps to round stuff out as well. It's a very subtle change that I just did over there. But it doesn't matter. To kind of put that into perspective, back in the sphere that we just did back then, I'll, I'll put an additional um, ambient light there and find my sphere. Okay. So this is how you do an, uh, a tangential light. It's just a matter of putting in a light on the contour. Follow that contour, right? Pick a light that is maybe not super bright, but bright enough to notice. Because again, if you can't notice it, what's the point? So you pick a little bit of a bright there. And then you kind of erase across the contour. Because again, everything follows a contour. And then when you let go of it, you have this beautiful little tangential light there. Maybe it's a bit too bright, I'll darken everything. But that's the idea. And this really helps to make things look more round. Because it makes it seem like something is moving in space. So that's what we call a tangential light. Drew some stupid shit in paint. Don't know if it makes sense. I'm going to keep that open. We'll uh, delve into that right after I leave Azar to his assignment. So we're getting to just about that point. So it's going to be very soon. So that's sphere, cylinder, and... The general cube and how to render every little part of that somebody asked about so, changing light position i'll go into that a little bit right now because i think it's important so for right now i don't want you to consider this too much about the idea that a cylinder will change contour but um just kind of bear in mind that you should be able to draw lines across any object right so if i was going to draw a line across a cylinder here's a very simple idea right if the line is parallel to the major axis, in terminology, this is the major axis of a cylinder, right? That's a major axis, right over here. That means that I can draw straight lines. It's very simple. And the same thing on the other side. It's going to be curved. But if I want to draw a line that's across the cylinder, it's not going to be like this, and it's not going to be like this. It's going to be a combination of both of them. It's going to be a shape like this. It's going to curve around the contour. It's going to curve around the contour, like a candy cane, basically. So I think a candy cane is a great example of that because it's a very clear, very clear indication of a, something that's wrapping around the contour. So think about how a candy cane kind of looks, right? It curves in this fashion. So if I'm going to draw basically a straight line and I'm going to press it against the surface of my cylinder, it'll follow this semi-straight, semi-curved face. And that's exactly how you're going to light it. You're going to light it with this core shadow like this. Okay? Light it like that. Now, I'm not going to make anybody do this right now, because, um, again, it gets a little bit iffy and it gets a little bit uh, strange sometimes, but that's how it's going to happen. Same thing, that little highlight's going to follow it, that's going to follow it, that's going to follow it, that's how it, that's how it happens. Okay, it's really simple. It all depends on whether or not you can draw that contour. If you can draw the contour, it's going to make sense, okay? But you have to be very specific with that outside edge. But that's how you do a cylinder from an angle. But really, I don't tend to do that very often because i think it's just a unnecessary step sometimes um but you can definitely do it there's no issue with it but for my basic form paintings i don't tend to do too much like for and example says, uh, fishnet stockings are a great example of that exactly i think that's a great uh, that's a great uh, suggestion whoever said that good on you so fishnet stockings anything basically anything that wraps around that'll tell you how something is shaped because how can something wrap around something realistically if it doesn't follow the surface of whatever it's wrapping around, right? So if you can think about how it wraps around, you can light anything. Do you mean submit art for crits? Yeah, just just general crits, general crits. I'm doing that at the end of the stream. I so hope that makes sense. For the, for the rest of the stream, is it gonna be like, um, you give me my assignment and I fuck off, at, or is it gonna be like, uh, I kind of do it while while you're still in the call and you follow along. I think uh, then... once I give you the stuff to do, we're just gonna end the call. I think, and then All once right. you're done, whether it's on this stream or later on, I'll give you an evaluation. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. And um, so, with this knowledge, how do I apply it to um, 
uh, the pieces that I gave? Like, are we gonna look at that, or are we? Uh, should I just focus on the character design that I did? Um, I think for right now, since all of this seemed to be, is it fair to say most of this was kind of like newish information? Like maybe you kind of know it, but you don't really know it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if that's 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 the case. Here's gonna be the assignment. So if anybody in the stream is new to the stream, uh, new to these concepts, you can do the same thing if you'd like. I want to see one page off. All right. Yeah, one page. Let's just say, well, it's a good number here. Let's say six cubes. Okay. I want one page of six spheres. And I want one page of six cylinders. Um, when you say six, does that just mean that they have different uh uh local values different lighting and different angles stuff mm -hmm. like that all of that yes okay okay i'm not going to be too critical on your shadow shapes and stuff uh, especially your cast shadow because i haven't like shown you how to cast a shadow yet but uh, this is what i kind of expect so once we do this and i'll show you how this links once you do this and once you can do this well we're going to look at how to break something down into this kind of thing a form painting okay and then we'll render out a couple of form paintings. And if you can do this, I guarantee you, you can paint anything realistically. Okay? Oh, this is exciting, but it's also scary. So right. my suspicion is that there's going to be some perspective problems that are going to sort of affect somewhere in between this and form painting, which is what I just showed you. Yeah. Take care, Hunter. Have a good one. Thanks for hanging out. I appreciate it. Um, oh. Also, like these different cubes and stuff, I assume I should also do them in different like perspective, like different positions, right? Yeah, I'd prefer it if it wasn't the same thing over and over again. Okay. And how, how long do, uh, do you expect uh, someone like me to spend per cube or, or for one page? As long as it takes, man. All right, all right. This, so is, to do this is fundamental skill acquisition, so... I never say take 30 minutes or whatever. Get it get it right. Get it right. There's a technique with perspective where you can find out where the shadows are. Is it just the uh, pole casting method? Because that's uh, what I was taught. I was also taught a different method for uh, different light sources, but that's, uh, I think, beyond the scope of what we're talking about. Just because I feel like half the time I bullshit the cast shadows anyway. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I don't tend to teach it uh, too often. But there you go, Azar. That's what I expect from you. Okay, so I'll be very critical of this because I showed you basically everything you need. You're welcome yeah. to go back to the vault to see how I did stuff and ask me questions. Yeah, maybe, I'll do that. but I have no excuse. Mm. Yeah, so try and do this. It won't take you too long. Um, but try and uh, make these pages, okay? And then, um, if you want a layout idea, just make them in A3, I guess. Okay. And see if you can do that. I don't care if you want to be more interesting with it, right? If you want to make your cube like some character, if you want to make your sphere like a material sphere, for example, like make it kind of cool like this, I don't mind. Um, I'm more than happy to crit that as well, okay? So you, you can make it like leather or fur or whatever if you really are getting bored with it, okay? But um, the baseline requirement is this, six cubes, six spheres, six cylinders, okay? Good? All right, all right. All right, and then we'll transition into form painting. That should be good. All right, any final questions? um let me just think really quickly let's see here um maybe chat has some questions i'm just gonna oh fuck i can't believe you've done this no i th no i think honestly like if i have questions i'll just refer to the vod i think you've covered pretty much anything and right now i don't have any question that pops in mind okay uh so is, is that gonna be it then I, I think that's gonna be it because we can talk about a few more things uh, But let's just try and get this right like maybe your uh, Secret five head and you're able to get all this information really quickly <laughs> So if that's the case, then I'll load you with a whole bunch of stuff maybe the next time we do this, okay? But uh, yeah. maybe by next Saturday. I expect this page if not a lot sooner. So um, We'll look at that page then and I'll, I'll say what's wrong What's right? What do you need to work on and then we'll do a form painting later on, okay? All right. Well, James, again, huge shout out to James. If anybody is watching in my chat, uh, Indian oh, Abroad ninety four, he's taught me done this. a lot of the things that I know, and um, I, uh, you know, I, uh, 
I feel like I owe this guy, you know, but uh, I just got to keep on working, honestly. And um, I don't know. Thank you, James, for taking the time to sit with me and the chat and go through this. Uh, it just speeds everything up. And, you know, sometimes even though the information is out there, you don't know where to find it. Um, so, yeah, just just thank you for uh, pointing us in the right direction. Yeah, no problem. At the very end, I'll, I want to leave you with some literature so you can read about this stuff if you want to. The majority okay. of the information comes from Scott Robertson's books. Uh, these are basically the Bible when it comes to doing any sort of um, concept or illustration or whatever it may be. Uh, they can be a little bit dry, but if anybody can get their hands on these books, uh, they are very good. So try and get these books if you can. They're very, very good. Uh, one of the unfortunate things about the internet right now is that people don't tell you how to do this stuff on YouTube. Because believe me, I've searched when I was struggling myself. So I think the, what's that thing called? Drawbox.com has some good information about drawing this stuff. So you can definitely go over there if you're wondering about perspective and things like that. I think that stuff is going to be quite, quite useful. And in terms of anything else that I want to leave you with, I think these two are going to be fine for right now uh, to learn these basics. Um, I think beyond that, there are certain channels that are geared towards this kind of thinking. So I think Modern Day James, I want to give a shout out to him because he has some good videos about this. But basically, guys, if any of you are going to be um, taking any sort of really in-depth course, about painting this is most likely the first thing that they're going to teach you and I, I don't care how much you're paying for the course if they don't teach you this you're not paying enough i'm sorry you're paying too much because uh, this is what like, i've taken several courses of painting in my lifetime and just about every single one of them had this at the very beginning so learn how to basically how to basically render right after you learn how to basically draw okay so with that said i appreciate azar for uh, hanging out with us and being my yep. guinea pig uh, we're gonna get Thank some you guys. Right. Uh, my name is uh, Mr. Random Knees. For anybody that is wondering, and uh, again, just just thank you. Thank you so much, James. I appreciate it, man. All right, get some work done, buddy, and I'll uh, see All what right. I can do. All right, cheers. All right, thank you. Man. Have a good one. Yeah. Okay, bye. See ya. Okay, questions in the chat. We have some requests for some crits. That's fine. Put in the Discord. Somebody asked for how did you do the shadow casting? I, I think it's like page 25 or something in the Robinson textbook. I forget about it, but um, let me just show you quickly how to cast a shadow. So the idea is this. You are considering two lines, okay? Jesus Christ. Thanks, Azar. I appreciate the gifts, man. Very nice of you. Okay, so this is how to cast a shadow. <laughs> there you go, guys. Enjoy your subs. Your subs, rather. That was a lot of talking, huh? Jesus Christ. Okay. Okay, so this is a simplified way of casting any shadow on anything. You first devolve your drawing into sticks. Okay? Into sticks. You need to update these emails? I'm sorry. Alright? Oh, fuck. <laughs> I can't believe you've done this. So here's how you draw a shadow for anything. I have a stick, okay? And I have to think about two qualities to cast a shadow, okay? The number one is gonna be the direction of my light source, right? So I'm gonna draw that with red. So this is gonna be, this is gonna be my direction of the light source, okay? Very simple. And number two is gonna be the ground direction. Right? The ground direction of the light source. This is called, I think, LGP in the Robinson textbook. So basically, it's the direction of the ground point of that light source, okay? So you can just determine this arbitrarily if you want, okay? You can do this arbitrarily to begin with, but here's how they work together, okay? So I'm going to say that this is going to be my ground direction of my light source. I'll explain more specifics a little bit sooner. Oh, sorry, a little bit later. So I assume these two things are those two quantities. So when I want to cast a shadow on anything, I first draw from the top of the object, I draw this line, which is the direction of my uh, light source, the, the um, direction of the light source in air, basically. And then I draw the second line, the direction of the light source on the ground. And when they intersect, that point all the way back to the base gives me the shadow. I'll do that for a cube really quickly. Here's a, here's a quick little cube. Again, I don't think people should read too much into this because again, it's a very 
It's not super used. It's, it's good to know, but it's not super used. So that's a cube right there. And I want to cast a shadow. Same thing, right? Same thing. I grab this orange. I grab this orange from the top of each one of those little sticks. Grab that orange. And I'm going to draw through, so I grab this orange over here. Let me draw through really quickly. Draw through just means you draw every side. Okay? That's every little side over there. And then, same thing, from the base, I draw that ground angle, which is this way. And that way, that one. It's a little bit this way, right? A little bit this way. Let's keep consistent across the entire piece. So I draw it from each and every corner. And what did we do before? The same little thing, right? I'm going to have the shadow in green. So I draw a line from the base to this point. I draw a line from the base to this point. From the base to this point. And this one I ignore because it's inside the cube. Okay? And then all I have to do is connect these points. Here. 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 And here. And voila. That is shadow. There's a lot of specifics that I'm skipping over here, okay? This is the most simple I can make this. But that's how you cast a shadow. Again, you pick a sky direction and a ground direction. And you make that consistently across the entire piece. Okay? You find the intersection point, And you connect them. And that makes a shadow. It's such a mess if you want to try and cast a shadow on a ball like that. It is an absolute mess. I do not disagree. And I just tend to wing it at that point. What do you mean ground direction? Okay, so the inevitable question, what do you mean ground direction? I'll tell you what I mean ground direction, okay? Uh, I hope you have some perspective basis, otherwise it's not going to make any sense. So, horizon line is here. My light source in the sky is over here. Okay? I have, and my object, for example, is over here. Uh, let's just draw a line. Let's just draw a straight line to begin with. Okay? So this line, let's just say it's levitating above the ground. So it's levitating above the ground a little bit. So we'll have a little bit of, of flyingness here. So it's, it's about that high above the ground. This is the ground point. This is called a projection. Okay? A projection is basically how something that's floating in space looks like when it's reduced onto the ground. So a projection of this is basically going to be a point right over there. Just like a projection of a, of a square is going to be just a square on the ground, you know? Or a cube is just going to be a square on the ground, basically. This kind of idea. So, when you're considering how something is being lit by a source, the source also is going to have a projection. And this is what's called the GP. The LGP, rather. The light ground point. So when you're considering casting shadow, there's a shadow, the first primary line goes there from the light source all the way up to the tip of the object. Second line goes all the way from here through this little object over here. Okay, so I think my light is a little bit too low at this particular point. But let's just imagine, um, maybe I'll make it shorter. Let's just imagine that this, this was my light source, it's a lot higher. So I'll move my light source up so it makes more sense. Otherwise it goes off the page, sorry about that. So right over there. And this goes through here. That is going to be the top point. So when I drew, when, when I talked about the, um, what did you ask for? The ground direction. This is the ground direction of the light source. Same thing. Over here, the bottom point. So ultimately, for this levitating object, this is going to be the shadow. Okay? This requires a little bit of perspective knowledge, but that's how it works. So for a levitating object, that's how you cast a shadow at an angle from the sun. So again, I want to stress the fact that this stuff, uh, this stuff is just a little bit too technical for our understanding as concept artists. You can kind of wing this stuff, and if you're really having a problem, there are ways to calculate it like this. But most of the time, you can just wing it. Just wing it, it'll be fine. That's the LGP, okay? The cool thing about this, by the way, is that for a sun, the sun LGP is on the horizon line. 
but a local light LGP is anywhere in the scene. That's actually how you determine how something is a local light and a, and a sun, basically in, the, in perspective drawing. It's a fun little thing. And of course, this is assuming there, there are, okay, we're going into specifics here, but I can talk about it regardless. Just to, if you want to dump this out of your brain instantly, go ahead. But there's actually three types of light sources in this kind of shadow casting. The first one is infinite sun. The second one is local sun. And the third one is local light. Infinite sun means that the lines are all parallel. Light travels in straight lines after all. That's not what I did just here. What I did over here is local sun. So it's still a sun, but you still have directional ideas over here. Okay? Because it's on the horizon line. Local light is everything. So you have everything being a causing a ruckus. So again, I, I really don't recommend anybody learn this stuff, uh, right now at least. If you want to get really good shadows, then you can, but I'm not going to say it's necessary, because I barely use this for myself. Did a link to painting drawing of a square with... Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I need to look at that, one second. So now is the crit section. I'm going to go over all of those crits that we just talked about. But that's how to cast shadows if you're interested. Uh, where is that? All right. Drew some stupid shit in paint, I can't wait. Okay, I, I think I see now. <laughs> this is what was given to me. So I have a square here. But I understand. I have a square here with a funnel in it. And now it's laying on its, on its side, right? And you want to know how to light this. Do I have it correctly? Okay, quite simple here. Most of it is going to be lit very standard. Okay, so we'll just light this up. Also, the line work is interesting. Okay. So it's going to be like this. We'll start with the line work. How about that? So I'll show you the contours. So again, this has to go deeper into something, right? It's going into space. So I'm going to draw through here. I'm going to draw through a funnel shape right over there. So I I just made this a bit easier for myself. So because it's going to be a funnel shape, I drew a half cone. And then I can contour around it, right? Contour around it, just like we talked about earlier. Contour around it, so it becomes more circular the lower it gets. Okay. And the contours on this plane are just going to be straight up. That's the drawing done with. Now the painting. This is going to be my number one read. So let's just go ahead and do this with selection tool maybe. Bam, 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 bam. Okay. Give me one light value. Durgesh, how's it going, man? Yes, I am Indian. This thing in the middle, inside here, right? That's gonna be quite dark, right? I think my drawing is wrong. I meant that it like gradually sinks in. It gradually sinks in like a person. Oh, now I understand. Okay, let's redraw that. We can still do it though. It's just gonna be a slightly different drawing to that. I'm still gonna draw through, by the way, because it's gonna help you, it's gonna help me. So we just consider there to be a point in space that all of this is going to dipping into, right? It's all dipping into this. So now I'm going to draw that, the contour lines here. Right there. There. Right there. I can kind of assume that there's going to be some sort of semicircular thing happening over here, right? I think that's fair to assume. There's going to be a less severe version of that, what we just talked about. It's going to be a less crazy version of the, um, the cone. I think that cone I, I want to go back to maybe because it's easier to explain but we can still do this this is also fine i don't really mind so again it's going to be a slight kind of maybe a shelf up there so maybe it curves like this so i'm thinking about the profile like this right so here's the principle i want to tell you about the principle is that when light hits this in a sheer angle you're gonna get light on this face and you're gonna get dark on this face, okay? Makes sense so far? Light on that face, dark on this face. And this will be generally light. And this will be generally light. Very, very common. Except that this is gonna happen all throughout the piece, okay? 
So I'll have light on this face. Let's just say we grab this value over here. It's going to be light over there. Light over there, light over there, light over there. In perspective, I can see this graduating very, very slowly, or grading very slowly. Maybe this a little bit, maybe this a little bit, and this face the least, just because that's the face closest to me. So again, I'm going to gradate this out. It's going to be less light. 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 So I'm just drawing two of the faces right now. Okay, this side is going to be a little bit of that. I'm going to see a little bit of that on this side. A little bit of that on that side. A little bit of that on this side. And then none of it in the side closest to us. That's just going to be this. Okay, so let's clean that up a little bit because I'm painting a little bit fast here. That's how that's, that's going to look. Almost like I'm placing a sphere into this particular object. Okay? Again, you gotta think about what's gonna be blocking what here. You can't just draw it straight. Because again, I, there's a lot of perspective involved here. Because some stuff is blocking some other stuff. Oop, that should make a lot of sense to you. Is that about what you wanted? Oh, what you wanted to look at? This kind of situation, right? They're gonna divot. Those more gradations, good. I'm doing, this, I'm doing this with a round brush, by the way. There you go. It's, it's not a, it's not a very easy question to answer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you that because this requires me to have knowledge about the fact that this would be obscured. Because if I just did this kind of flat, it would look wrong. But because I have a lip here, and I have it gradually kind of increasing in size, that tells me a lot more about what I'm actually looking at. So some knowledge required, but um, yeah, that's, hopefully that helps. There you go. That's what that question started out. Next question was... Okay, I think that's it for the stream-related questions. Yeah, the lip is the big one, man. So don't be afraid to just um, make your own reference if you want. But uh, you can go ahead and um, make your own reference. Maybe grab a bit of rubber and poke your finger into it. Or look up just trampolines on YouTube and see if you can... Um, kind of dissect what, it, what it's looking at and why it's looking the way it looks like. So, stuff like that. I'm going to take a quick little five minute break here, guys. When we come back, we're going to be doing um, crits on all of the pieces that you guys have submitted. I see a good number of them already. How do you do four point perspective and make poses good, <laughs> look good in it? Here's, here's the answer, I don't. I do two point and three point if I need to, but never four point perspective of poses. You know why? Because I'm a concept art oriented individual. And you would never do four point perspective for a concept art piece. It's just, it's so distorted. Not so much as maybe uh, fisheye, but it's distorted to the point where it's, it's neglecting or it's removing information from my grasp. So I just tend to not, to not to fuck with it at all. So I can't give you a hard answer because I just don't have the experience with it. Because I, I actively choose not to do that kind of work, you know? If that makes any sense. Um, Durgesh, if you want to post anything particular, in the in my discord you're welcome to i can look at it for you uh but this is like a crit stream so we're trying to be critical of work here yeah but definitely uh, as Batari said post your work in the discord i'm going to quickly take a maybe two minute breather and give my voice some time to recover uh in the meantime i'll play some music maybe and we'll be able to get through all these crits and that'll be the end of the stream hopefully you guys are having a good stream so far hope it's been informative We'll try to get the wads up on YouTube as soon as possible. But yeah, so bear, let's just quickly go into the stuff. Go into the functions on the, on the Discord here, and we'll be ready pretty soon. All right, guys, so be back in, what do you want to call it? Three minutes? Sound fair? Okay, three minutes. Be right back.
Alright, and we are back. I'm sorry, brother. I apologize, man. But thank you for all the support. Uh, what's the word in Russia? Russian? Uh... Spasiba. There you go. I was thinking like Pajalsta, but that's please, right? <laughs> you know, I, I got I got into my last relationship because of Russian. But he was very impressed and then he went on a date. <laughs> okay, crit time, guys. So fun. Let's look at some pieces. There are a lot of them, so I'm gonna try and get through them fairly quickly. First one comes from Eerie Canary. Who's a big Beautiful artist, very very good at what he does. You gonna teach English? Do it man, I think your English is pretty good. I wouldn't even know that you uh, spoke Russian. If you didn't mention it. How loud is that music in the background? Okay, it seems like it's a little bit loud. Okay, piece number one coming right up. Okay. It's got not working on your phone, so please go from the link. Yeah, I will do. No problem. I'm also gonna hard cut the crit set right now, by the way. The time is. 23.30 So uh, I'm gonna hard cut the crits here just so I can get through all of them Alright, so number one beautiful piece by Eerie The associated comment in this particular piece is I was wondering if I could get some tips on composition in general. Is it interesting? This is a scene which is supposed to be dramatic with the face of a dying man being the focal point. Okay, so, some things I can kind of point out in terms of overall composition that I think are good and bad. So, good things. I do like the idea of this hand over here kind of pointing to where's the chest. I think we could maybe do a little bit better with uh, this idea over here. I think this idea is maybe not super supportive. To be fair, I kind of like that hand. Maybe it's not super bad. So, in terms of the way you've positioned everything, lower the music a bit more, can do. And just grab that tab right there. Okay, should be fine now. How to draw an English, two in one lesson. Well, I ho hope I won't make too many grammatical mistakes. So I think the overall drawing, the composition is not too bad. One thing that I want to point out with the way that you've lit things, in fact, several things. We can start with right over here, okay? There's an area of extreme contrast right over here and right over here. And that's kind of removing from the centralized area of interest, which is right over here. So you want to be very concerned in your entire piece about exactly where are you having these areas of high contrast, because this is very much high contrasted. This whole thing is being lit almost like a character, in that you have a key light behind, and you have these kind of pulled out highlights. So I think this particular piece could benefit a lot from a little bit of relighting. So let's relight the piece and let's see what you think, okay? The first thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and push down the overall lights in this piece. Okay, I'm going to push it down. Reduce the contrast everywhere except where I want it to go, okay? Now we're going to start pulling some certain things in here. Now we can start pulling this guy up here. I can add some generalized ideas in the background. Get the contour of the ship going in the right direction right but i want this guy to be the focus maybe this edge to kind of guide his eye a little bit more okay and maybe you can pull out this side if i wanted to a bit more okay but this already is helping us so so much with what is important and what is not important again you can maintain everything at a certain amount of general light general lights should i do cast shadows before i do the gradients uh yeah i don't think that affects too much but yeah i would like you to do one two three and then shadow i think that's generally what's done 
one to three shadow then gradient sounds good okay so we're gonna light this area a little bit more specifically right we can add a sense of general lighting to all of this stuff on the in the background maybe we have the option to but i want to maintain this kind of contrast and now this is the beauty of this right the beauty of this is that if the entire piece is too dark for whatever reason i can now increase the entire piece make it much lighter but i still maintain I still maintain that, that amount of darkness or the amount of contrast that I achieved earlier. So once you achieve that contrast, you can tend to make the read whatever you want to and it's still there. Even though everything is lighter, it's still there because I made everything lighter, oh, which includes the contrast of the this. image, right? So it, it doesn't have to be a dark, grungy piece like this. It can easily be a light piece like this. But what's happening is that the relative values in this side and that side are no longer interrupting my primary focus which is this even further than that you can add in secondary elements to the background to even further this concept fog is a very very useful tool a lot of people use this all the time to ensure that they have a really good solid read about what's supposed to be the focus and what's not the focus of any piece so you can very easily throw in a bunch of fog on the background over there and just make the fog kind of dark you know not so dark as to completely hide your characters but dark enough that it doesn't make those reads on that side of the character so, so intense. So let's just throw in some fog right there. How about we do that? Throw a little bit of fog there, a little bit of fog there. And again, you can make it look like fog how you want to. Mess with the edges if you'd like. Throw a little bit of lighting on there if you'd like. But I just want there to be darkness there, right? And I'm going to justify it through fog. But the principle here is just the principle of saying, okay. I just want that contrast to be reduced. So therefore, I'm going to reduce it simply by adding in some background elements right there. But that cuts that read. That cuts that read. It, it makes me look more over here, right? And that, that's the unifying theme across all of this stuff. I can even choose to bring out some more specular highlights to really enforce the fact that, hey, hey audience, look here. Please look here. This is where I want you to look. So we can make a new layer. I can pull out some of that specular, right? And really make this look nice and clean now how, how much subtlety you want to put here is up to you and can be kind of handled at a later point at a later point but this is the idea okay how much you want to use with this idea is up to you but you see how much that kind of improves the overall piece there everything now the things that we want to look at is just so clearly distinguished I don't have any issue with adding in a secondary light somewhere like if you want to add so one of the issues of the piece is currently everything is almost the same temperature which i don't like so if you wanted to first for example add a warm light near the bow of the of the uh, ship like maybe something like this would make a really interesting kind of warm light like it was crashing next to a port maybe that will be kind of cool uh how do i want to do this i'm just thinking about interesting ways to show this i can do it with color balancing i think so i'll do balancing also a quick oh, note fuck. about how i do i can't um, believe you've done this crits is that I am doing it with a lot of adjustment layers just because I want to retain the brushwork and the detail in the original piece but I don't suggest people always use adjustment tools to fix their problems because you need a good basis in your piece before doing any of this kind of stuff okay so I'm gonna do this I'm gonna solve it with color balancing here because again what did I say a bit of a temperature difference could be nice for this piece is that a solution no but it should be explored it should be explored I'm gonna move this stuff to a much more warmer idea Let's just quickly try and do this in a way that's non-destructive. A little bit warmer, a bit yellower. Like that, for example. Create a filter mask. And now I just have to filter it out. Again, this might be one of the cases that I would probably benefit more from uh, just straight painting it. But, you know, these crits are also for me to learn as well. So I want to know what's good for showing people and what's not good for showing people. I mask things out here. And then I ensure that that background looks semi-unified. So I can throw in stuff like that, right? How do you do that temporary filter mask in Krita? Uh, I just make a new filter layer and I select the option saying make new... Um, make a filter mask so for example let me walk you through it it's just filter adjust color balance let's say and there's an option right next to okay it says create filter mask and that's how you make a quick little filter mask there okay so once you're gonna add that temperature shift maybe i don't like it exactly the way it is so i can hue shift it if i need to 
I just want to be a bit warmer. A bit warmer there. But maybe the front of the ship's on fire or something. But it's, it's possible to include that temperature variance. I'm just saying it's a, it's a possibility in these pieces. And it's, it, it totally kind of adds a bit more to the overall realm of the piece. And of course, once you add that idea, you must, you must unify it. So unify it across here. Unify it across here. And at the same time, always be sure that you're not messing your overall read up. These are just additional things that you can kind of add to increase the um, the scope of colors in your piece, right? Just to just to prevent stuff from being a little bit too monochromatic. I think lanterns. Somebody in the chat that's gust of trust, such as a, a lantern. I think that's a great idea. I definitely don't think that's an issue. In fact, I think somebody in the Discord also added a lantern around here. So the crits are free, are free for anybody to do, by the way. So you can just get on my Discord and help people out yourself. So um, no issues with saying it in the chat as well. Totally fine. But uh, just to point out that I am. This is not an exclusive thing. Um, I am not an expert in anything. So go ahead and uh, put that stuff on the on the Discord if you want to give it a shot. No issues whatsoever. In fact, I encourage it actively. Okay. So same thing over here. Unifying stuff. Unifying stuff there. Unifying stuff there. So what's the theory behind this? Again, why we're doing it is just color temperature. Just adding more color temperature stuff, more variance. And how we're doing this is just simply unifying the light source across our piece. It gives us more opportunity for good silhouetting, it gives us more opportunity for good rim lights, just good in general. So I can add, a, add an interesting color dynamic to the entire piece, right? Something as simple as that. Otherwise, I think things are pretty okay on the piece, not going too badly. Some lighting there would be nice. You see how we can kind of really quickly get that uh, new idea in there. Still some unification required by the way. I think uh, I would probably with this change make the background a little bit warmer. Just to keep this unified. The background will go a little bit warmer. Right there. Unification always important. But that would be the general idea of that change. So that way things are still kept quite central. Okay? But beyond that, I think I fixed your issue with the composition. The overall arrangement of things I have no issue with. I just think that you've got to be a little bit careful about this stuff. Okay? Who are eligible for critique? Just about anybody, but um, for right now I cut the crits off for this stream because I have so many to do. But you can post it still and I will look at it the next stream. Uh, without a doubt. Maybe complementary colors. I don't think it's a bad idea whatsoever. We can test it out just because it's been it's been suggested. So since you're not on the stream, uh, I'll do my best to try and show people what your idea is. We can maybe use a colorize filter and shift it to a bit more red. There you go. A bit more red added to that fire fire. Of course, when you have a reddish light, the red's going to carry over. The most because that's how wavelengths work maybe a paltry example but still something that can be done for the piece very bold stuff but looks good quickly yeah i think, I think it's a it was not a bad decision i think i like this way more than my orange i think my orange is a bit pissy i do like that so thank you for suggesting that it's a good suggestion a bit of unification here and there and we're sitting pretty I think that answers your question. So again, the major theme over here wasn't the temperature. It really was um, the idea that, oh, well, I want to get this focus back here. And we've done that pretty well, just with a bit of relighting. I think overall, I, I love your um, composition lines here. I think everything kind of points the way it should. So that's, that's basically all of that's fine. Um, I think the lighting was the issue. So we fixed that. And now we have a much more interesting piece to show for it. I will save this in a different folder for you. Or I can just put it in the Discord. If people want to see a before and after, I'll show that to you right now. Here is the before. Here's the after. A lot more unified, a lot more stuff happening, a lot more focused. Okay? So basically, we hit it with that concept art filter.
Hope that was helpful. We'll move on to the next one. As soon as I've, uplo I've uploaded this one over here. Of course, comments can be made. What if you want it to be more contrast? That's totally fine, right? Again, these are options that are available to us. Once you have the primitive, I very much encourage playing around with this stuff. Maybe you want to have more contrast. Totally achievable, right? Because maybe some, some studios, some games, some productions have different requirements on how they want things to be lit. That's totally fine. We can go from that to that fairly easily. Completely up to you. I like this kind of DSAT stuff. That's my personal preference. But uh, yeah. We don't want to be pushing the lights too much. So anyway, I'm going to save that in my folder. And we're going to continue with the next one. I'm kind of going to go on order submission here. So the next one is by Parasocial Office. Um, it's a portrait. How could I take this to the next level and make it more interesting and appealing oh, as a portrait? Okay. I can't believe you've done this. Because Uh, the ref is not posted, but we can talk about this, no problem. There's one over here. Here's a portrait that we got. Oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. Thank you for the follows, guys. Okay, so, I think this is a pretty good question, right? How, how are you gonna add that boom, that bing, that bang, that crazy look to your work? So what are the fundamental things that make things look cooler, is the question. Let's go down the list of things that I personally think improve most paintings. The first one is background. I want the background to support my image. But a lot of the times which when you do your paintings, we tend not to think about the background too much because we think about the painting as just what we paint on the canvas. But really it's an entire package, right? You wouldn't have a really beautiful picture, but then have a dog shit frame around it, right? You'd really think about getting a beautiful frame to match a beautiful picture. In the same way, your background frames your entire subject matter. So the worse the background is, or the, the more neglected the background is, it's going to have a negative effect on your piece. So, what, what can we do? Very simple little changes that we can do to, to offset this. Let's just select our background really quickly. I'm going to go ahead and change my options for my selection so it's a little bit closer. Like that really quickly. Simple enough. I learned the hard way for having a plain background. It, it is. It is a nightmare. So here's a simple idea, right? I have light shapes on the top. I have darker shapes on the bottom. So how about I just add a gradient? of dark to light from the top to the bottom okay simple idea just like that and even though it's so shittily done it's so poorly done it's already improving things right it's that simple so the reason i'm doing it very sparsely right now is because i want to explain one more thing here which is your background is not just value it is also color right you want to choose a background value that brings out the colors that you want to see on your painting one of the best artists with color in the world is Nathan Fox. Nathan Fox works for DreamWorks, incredible educator, incredible artist. Look him up if you don't know him. When he's painting something and he asks himself, what is this painting about? What is this painting trying to show me? He picks that color in that area of interest and he picks the opposite, the complementary color. And he paints that as his background value, right? It may not end up that way, but he starts that way. So why is that? It's because he wants to clearly show you what his painting is about. So if this painting is about the skin, right? About the face? I'm going to choose something a bit cooler. That's my background. It's not just dark to light, but dark cool to light. It becomes a bit cooler. You post it in Critique and Paint Tower? Yeah, yeah, you can post it there. Uh, maybe a bit too saturated there. So a beautiful, slightly cool background. This, it takes no time, it's just a simple gradient tool. And it does so much for your painting, man. It does so much. It's a simple little thing to add in there. Okay, I'm going to paint in a little bit here just to kind of affect the contours. Everything's nice and clean. That's the first thing you can do for any painting. Really simple is just add a background. This is the simplest background that you can add. And it, it, it makes the painting look so much more finished because, again, now my lights look like they're lights, my darks look like, like they're darks, so and my skin looks so much warmer because of it. I can adjust the saturation if I want to easily just using adjustment layers totally fine make it more blue if i want to but i'm gonna leave it as is for right now okay what's the next thing you can add to make things look really crazy let's talk about highlights right everybody wants to put in those beautiful juicy highlights on something and it usually makes everything look way more finished and way more professional now i'm not talking about just using the dodge tool and going crazy 
but with a little bit of selective usage of, of highlighting you can really pull this piece to the next level okay so let's grab a brush it could be any brush you can even grab a round brush if you want to let's grab a light value right that's my light we'll push it brighter and brighter let's throw in some of these highlights in there right there maybe right there maybe these are the common ones right putting the highlights in the eyes everybody kind of does that right then right there bring so much life into the image but here are some of the uncommon ones. The matte highlights on the skin, for example. Push that lighter. Here's a common method of doing lights or highlights, if you guys are wondering. Uh, what's a good new way of doing it? Grab a round brush, or grab an airbrush. Do a single stroke at a large brush size. Lower the brush size, make another stroke. Lower the brush size, make another stroke. Lower the brush size, make another stroke. You can make a very natural looking highlight with no dodge. So if you don't want to switch your tools too much, you can still do that. No issue. I'll do the exact same thing I just explained there. A little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And I have a little bit of that lovely dodge there. I can always adjust it later on to make it look like it fits. But this stuff is gold, right? It's really gold. That's a matte highlight, by the way. So it's not a specular highlight. It's not a strong specular highlight. It's a matte highlight. And all over this piece, we can go around and start to add just a little, little push of highlights. And this would work even better it will work even stronger if we had a little bit more attention towards the overall contrast of the piece, which could be increased a little bit more. But you see, just a little bit of attention to these areas, it pays such large dividends for the piece. Makes it look that much more complete. There's some theory around here about how I want to place my highlights, how I want to place my shadows, but I'm not going to go too much into that. Just a little bit of that stuff. It was a long, long way. How long since you've done a portrait? Yesterday, actually. The second I got off school, I did a portrait. You wanna see? It's a quick one hour one. You go really quick I was doing this while uh, talking to some people on discord okay so we talked about the highlights right remember the highlights are gonna be everywhere even if they're not gonna be super reflective I'm not, I'm not saying this guy's wearing like glossy lipstick or something but it's gonna be there it's gonna be there a little bit of it I think I saw this somewhere. Did you show it before? Uh, at the beginning of stream, I did, yeah? A little bit of it. Okay, so that's one of the things you can do. Again, put a bit of highlight in there. It really does make a big difference. It's a small little thing to do, but it makes a big, big impact, okay? What's the third thing you can do to make this look more kind of crazy, right? So you can kind of add a bit more attention to the overall contrast of the piece. So selectively light stuff. Also, add more temperature. I see the shadows kind of graying in here and what I think you're kind of doing is you're just darkening up the local value to become to make it the shadows but that's not how things work generally speaking when things go into the shadow realm they get more saturated and darker so these shadows can easily be pushed more towards the saturation to make things look more alive All right I'm just gonna do some perfunctory changes here they're not gonna fix the image but I'm just trying to get you thinking in the right way okay these little saturations will kind of help make everything look more alive because right now you see how things look a little bit dead a little bit dying a little bit dead it's because the shadows lack a little bit of that saturation that you want to see you're going to see some of that sad on your paintings right so don't think that dark is just a darker version of things it's, it's it might be darker sure in value but remember when you're doing anything if you can see my selector over here it goes darker so I, i'll pick a dark value for the skin right the skin is here I'll make it darker. This is the big thing here. I change the hue. Change the hue. Right? Make it warmer. And I get this value as my dark, right? Make it saturated. I get this value. And that's a way better, way more lively value for your shadows to use. But think about this. When something goes into shadow, right? It becomes darker for sure. But it also changes the hue because change in light means change in temperature. 
and temperature just means warm and cool so don't ever change the value of something without changing the color of something okay what's something more we can do based on just the shadows and temperature and stuff like that we can do a bit of relighting always makes things look better because when we paint stuff the screen is frozen uh... it should be fine okay that's good cool cool so the last thing we can do is a little bit of relighting right relighting let's push the contrast a bit more right from that to that really letting your contrast show a little bit further right and then even beyond that we can even do selective lighting if you want Again, these are just quick fixes. I don't suggest anybody do this literally for their painting, but just to show you what it looks like when it's being realized. That can be something that's also an option available to you. You need to kind of know the planes a little bit to do this, but it's not too complicated. Just to kind of show the forms a bit more. A bit more contrast. So from that to that. Like a cool, cool beam basically. Okay, from that to that, adding more contrast, and then at the very end, if I make the choice to say, okay, well, I like that contrast, but maybe everything's too dark, again, no issue, and just shift everything up again. Okay, let me show you the initial, we look at the final, make some comments. We went from that to that. It's a lot more things we did, right? Saturation in the shadow, adding highlights, adding a more gradient in general, right? And adding a background. Not that hard, right? But really cool. I do prefer as a as a portrait painter myself, I don't like when people do soft stuff for highlights personally, so I do like to kind of throw my own flare on there if I can. But I'm, not, I'm gonna try not to do that right now. That stuff is very specific to your own tastes. But there you go, hopefully you guys think that's an improvement. I changed the hue for shadows, but I tend not to saturate them too much. Seeing how that works is really nice. Yeah, it, 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 it's at least like worthy of um, exploration, right? Also, we can maybe play around with the colors a little bit if you want. Maybe make the reds a little bit... Um, a bit more redder because overall i think the entire piece could stand for a little bit of saturation so you can maybe saturate a bit more make things look a bit more lively nice nice and simple right okay i'm gonna save this and we're gonna move on that's your question in the chat i'll get to that in a second
What's the theory behind shadow equals cold and light equals warm? Is it mainly because sun equals warm and the sky light hits the spots the sun doesn't directly or indirectly? Or is there some science light ratio going on? Okay, so you have the right of it. Uh, the idea of um, warm light, cool shadow is actually a very superficial understanding of the way that light and shadow works. Ultimately, it's all about direct light versus local color versus ambient light also versus bounce light there's a whole lot more to think about but basically why warm warm lights cool shadows is very familiar and natural is because the sun is warm and the sky is cool but really if you want to break it down and be very specific to your lighting condition it's it's this so the areas of the light are affected by a direct light. The areas of the half tone are, aff are affected by the local color. The areas of the shadows are affected by ambient light. And just about every area is liable to be affected by the bounce light. Okay? I could go deeper right now, but I think this answers your question. If anything is ambiguous, let me know. But that's the, the core fundamental of it. Because warm lights, cool shadows, cool light, warm shadow, it's a superficial idea. But it's good to tell beginners because it gets you thinking about temperature. Which is always good. Next crit. This is from Kyle. He was nice enough to give us a reference. So, some repainting going on here. Let you guys enjoy the piece while I take a swig of water here. Cheers, Durgesh. All right. Next painting over here. We got this internally illuminated jar by Kyle. First of all, I think really good piece. Overall, not too bad. I want to talk about a couple of things over here that we're going to go into. The first one being your edges. I want you to be a little bit more particular with how you use your edges because ultimately everything in the piece is heading towards a slightly muddy area. I think some things are done really well. Like around here, I think that's pretty okay on the top but i think it's going a little bit crazy in here i feel like um there's like an internal logic here for sure but it's not being respected too much in a sense that i see sharp highlights over there i see sharp highlights across the side of the um the jar but for some reason this is almost randomly done the uh, highlights on top of the the jelly beans or whatever's in here i think that could be a bit more controlled i don't mind if it's a little bit crazy but not so much that it starts to break the form because it tends to make things a little bit messy i feel like so I want a little bit more control on those edges. It's fine to have a logic in the piece, I think. So if the piece logic is highlights get that little bit of a, of a craziness, fuzziness go going about, I think that's totally fine. But in order to kind of maintain a good kind of hierarchical understanding of things, I think I would restrict that to just the highlights uh, and just areas in the light maybe. So I'll keep the darks a bit sharper. The reason is because if, if everything has that kind of idea, the piece tends to blur out a bit more. But overall, I think this jar is kind of saving you a lot in this piece because uh, I really like the way some, some things are done over here like I think this portion is quite well it's quite well done um, because it has the fuzziness but you have the sharpness in here to save you and that's why it looks good why this doesn't, doesn't look as good is because I have that fuzziness but I really am looking for that sharpness to save me here but I don't have it I don't see it which is tending to be a problem right also I think the overall kind of lighting situation it's being a little bit impacted so I'm just trying to change the light position over here, right? So you're trying to show a logic of saying that there's light coming from this side, I'm assuming. But there are certain inconsistencies in this idea. I think these are fine over here. And this one over here is a little bit questionable, but okay, maybe it's the glass or something. It's, it's still questionable. But I think you could get away a lot in this piece by just casting more shadows in general. I think just going ahead and casting shadows would make this entire piece look a little bit stronger in general. 
And also, a secondary note before we get into that, try and choose primary and secondary light sources in your head before you start a piece, okay? Because that's going to make everything seem a little bit more orderly in the way the piece is going to be read. It's a mistake that I make all the time, but I want you to think about which one of these you want to show stronger in your piece. Is it the main primary light that's kind of illuminating from this side? Or is it going to be this, this internal light that's illuminating the inside of my of my object. Why is that important? It's because it's going to tell you exactly where your cast shadows need to go. Okay? Because right now we say over here that okay there's going to be a shadow over here. But then you also have this light over here affecting the shadow. But here's the unfortunate part over here, right? I don't have any sort of clear cast in here to give me any sort of information or what these things actually look like. Right? So this kind of cast shadow, let me just add a few to show you what I mean. I think that's going to really help the piece kind of live in space a bit better. Okay, so don't forget that the shadows are a big component of all of this stuff. Don't just make your shadows kind of equal across the piece. So if you're considering that to be your light, then I want to see a shadow down here. It's not even a shadow, just maybe an ambient occlusion down there. So things need to constant on other things. So I want to see a shadow down here. I want to see a shadow down here. So it's just going, going across the entire piece and being cons consistent about this. It's going to give you an additional kind of realm of things to play around with, okay? But you can't make that decision with any degree of confidence if you don't pick a primary light source, okay? You're missing some AO here between individual uh, beans or whatever you want to call it. So it is going to get darker. They are going to get a little bit darker as it gets closer and closer. That's going to help things look like they actually fit together. And there's no reason not to add in some contact shadows wherever appropriate. Like right over there, you can throw in a bit of contact. Just because it'll make things look a little bit more sen sensibly uh, oriented. But overall, I think it's a pretty successful piece. Um, definitely a good a good challenging piece to kind of work with but I think contact shadows ambient occlusion and cast shadows are gonna make everything in this seem a lot more realistic there's a lot of color interplay that's my next thing that I want to get into I think the colors and the way they play across the surface of these objects can be done a lot better I see some severe inconsistencies and this is the second major problem with the piece this is, this is a blue light and this over here is like a red local color right red and pink this will never mix into green. What's going to happen to this piece is it's going to mix into desaturated. So I, I much more expect something like this to happen here. Where it's going to be a little bit blue maybe. A little bit blue maybe. Of course it's going to be quite light. So this is your color theory. It's going to gradient towards this red. But right now it almost seems like there's a local variation. It's like the red things are becoming green and then being lit green is what's happening there but i don't see this light actually interacting naturally so i want you to go back and read a little bit about your color theory figure out how to go from blue to red and the answer is it's, it goes through gray so you know what i'm going to do really quickly a, a quick little idea the stones would have been yellow maybe the green exactly so the stones were yellow i think the green would be a bit more appropriate but red is almost contradictory to the blue here's a, here's a fix that i might try out I'm just going to go ahead and desat this whole area. Let's see that it fix, fixes things a little bit. See what's crazy there is I brought everything closer to gray and it looks more blue now. That's just color theory, right? That's how it works. Because again, they're contradictory or complementary, or what do you want to say there? But that makes way, way more sense than that. Right? Of course, you can up the value a little bit to make sure that it still looks like a light. Right? That's perfectly plausible. When I make it bluish, so again, I'm going to get to that in a second here. We're going to get to exactly where we can put the blues here. But I think the general light needs to be a lot more desaturated. Now, to John's point, this is the next immediate next step, which is in areas that are right next to right next to that uh, particular uh, glowing object, that can be pushed towards the blue. I think that's okay. That can be pushed towards the blue to give a little bit of context. Right near the contact point, I think that's okay. But I think that overall fits way better than what you had earlier. I think earlier things were a little bit non-unified. That's one thing that I want to point out there. Otherwise, I think really good job. I think it's a good painting. 
a lot of challenging stuff happening over here. Same interactions things happen over here. I think this is kind of better because it's warm on warm. Straightforward. But think about your cast shadows. Think about your AO. And uh, be a bit more consistent with your edges. And color theory. Be a little bit careful about that stuff. Okay? And also your lights. Try and order them. Pick a primary, pick a secondary. It'll make things in your head a lot easier. Overall, good job. I think it's a good painting. No worries, buddy. Next up is Eve. Been working on a character design for a graphic novel. Would really help in any improvements for readability, shape, design, color, etc. Any critique would help. Okay. As a piece there, first thing you know I'm going to say it already, but uh, background, do not make it white. You want a gray I'm, I'm okay with? Cheers Dave, how's it going? You're a very competent artist. A workout. Alright, I'm going to cut that white because it's blinding. Alright, let's talk about the design itself. So, I'm not quite sure the process you went through this. I think on stream I saw you kind of drawing the final versions of it. But we can just talk about some elements over here in design. Um, so first thing is, I want you to kind of write out what you want the character to be. So if you want this to be a design crit, I need to know what your problem statement is. So what is your um, your brief on the character? What is it supposed to be? Um, if you want, I can tell you what I think she's supposed to be. Um, since it's not provided. So it seems like she's some member of... Maybe not royalty, but high class. So she's got a, 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 a bit of elegance to her, but she's also a warrior from that plate. Plate mail and the greaves and everything. So I guess some sort of like uh, nobility slash princess that has a flair for battle is my evaluation. So I don't know if that fits with your idea of her. But that's what I kind of read from, uh, from what you've done. Her smirk gives a bit of uh, cockiness in there, right? But let me know how that uh, worked out. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and ask or critique a couple of these things over here for the design elements. So I know that these are going to be meant for a graphic novel, and I think that's okay for the most part, but I think what would benefit you a lot over here, I really like this, this, this one over here, I wish that was larger on the page. Um, I, think, I think that's a bit more successful than this one over here, because all my personality, but I get that you want to show a front view. That's totally fair. Um, so I want you to think one level deeper about how all of this stuff fits together, okay? So I want you to think a little bit more about where those leather straps are gonna go. I want you to think about where there's vo uh, weaving in the um, in the leather. I want you to think about how this leather, how this entire pollen fits, the entire um, van brace, how it fits onto her body, because right now it's just sitting on top. I want you to figure out where those straps are. I want to figure out where those bolts are. And you can just swap it directly off of reference but here's the reason why you do that stuff because when you have close-up shots of the character in the novel you want there to be enough visual bite that you can also say oh jesus christ that's what it looks like that's so cool that's so interesting figure out where the hemlines are for this stuff because when you're designing stuff ultimately you want to be very very clear about what's happening with the character right so i think this is a great level one analysis of what your character should look like but i think you can go a bit deeper i don't know if this is supposed to be the final style of the character and if it is, if indeed it is then maybe you can get it with a, with a bit less maybe less straps and maybe less hemlines you don't need all that stuff in this kind of rendering style but if it's going to be like this right people kind of expect that to happen because when you do this undoubtedly what's going to happen is you're going to have a beautiful lovely painted face because you're good at faces but then when you transition to the armor things are going to be a little bit lackluster Right? So you're going to have to pull up all sorts of things to try and figure out how to make that armor look more interesting. Right? So it's important to do a little bit more maybe specific research with your elements on your character over here. And try and really figure out what those look like. Right? Because I like the axe, I like the look of it, but right now it seems a little bit surface level. And I want you to go a little bit deeper on it. So again, this is dependent on the production that you have in mind, so I don't know the specifics. But if it's going to involve anything that's semi-painterly with any amount of detail, this is a very important step to do because it's part of the design, right? You're here to kind of solve problems. So solving how this thing fits on our arm is a problem that needs to be solved, right? Like solving how these grease actually gets in and out of these grease is an important idea. 
Looks like a happy teen, beyond wise, beyond her years. Likes to teach people when drawn into combat. She's very violent. Okay. So, let's think about incorporating some of those elements. I did not write the description, by the way. Hey, fair enough. But I want you to think a little bit more about fitting these things onto the character, okay? I think it's going to be kind of important to do. Because it's just part of generalism. I don't know about your specific project, but in general character design, these are the kind of things that you think about, right? It's not just about just laying things on top of other things. How do things fit? And it takes a little bit of research, but I know you can do it. It's not going to be an issue. About the actual shapes and stuff like this, I wish this was referenced a bit more. I think the pollen is okay. Like the uh, the embrace is okay on the character. I think the dress looks kind of cool, right? This thing kind of kills me over here. I think this could be drawn a lot better about what it is, what it's supposed to be. Like I get it's like a stylized kind of greaves over here but i just think it's a little bit a little bit strange like i think one of the reasons why this this drawing over here looks so much better to me is that these smaller details are kind of handled a little bit better so maybe consider referencing a little bit more see what people actually wear in that age and stylize on top of that because right now this is a little bit strange and it might just be because i've drawn enough armor to expect certain things to happen but um I kind of want to maybe push this up, make it a bit more in terms of uh, like a knee protection, and then have this be shin, and then have straps around it maybe, are things that I'm thinking about right now. But maybe reference the bottom a bit better. I think the top's pretty okay, I love the face as well, I think the expression kind of suits what you're looking for, right? So looks like a happy teen beyond, why is beyond her ears? Okay, so I think that's going to be probably said mostly through the eyes and maybe a bit of sophistication in the way she dresses. I think that's basically accomplished by these two things. When drawn into combat, she's very violent. I would like to see much more scoring, much more battle wearing on the axe. Maybe I don't want to put something so crazy as like face paint and like blood marks and stuff like that. Might be a bit too ha uh, heavy handed. But I think you can think a little bit of, about the materials here, right? I think that's not too much to ask. So some more weathering. So let's say her dress could be really perfect because she wears it when she's having a good time and everything, everything like that. But her armor, that can be really scored. It can be really dented. It can be really kind of stained. Because when she does fight, she fights horrendously. She fights dirty. Right? She fights strongly. And that's how you kind of have visual storytelling. Okay? It does the overall silhouette. Yeah, not too bad. Standard, uh, standard girl over there. Um, I have no no two issues about that. Yeah, the smaller elements I feel like could be handled a little bit better. I think this would be a great thing to show Ona. Because I think she'll be able to give you some great advice on how to get this clothing to fit well. And how to get that armor to fit well. I think some initial thought that you've given over here is good. Like you're thinking about her having um, like this, this little guard on top. So the armor fits on. I think that's great. Good ideation there. One more level is important be it like a strap across her chest right and some buckles over there some stuff on her uh, waist on the skirt right something like that so one level deeper of ideation is what i kind of expect right now and think about the weathering stuff to add to the overall character it gives more life to stuff just drawing in an interesting axe sometimes a little bit surface level again so add scoring add weathering add frayed edges things like that and of course i want you to filter all this stuff based on what your requirement is for your story but i think in terms of general character design these are all very good things to think about okay same thing goes over here for the shirt you can kind of add little additional details here to show that maybe how it would be fastened so very kind of common thing to do is to kind of add this these corset bodice lines like that for example to show how it's fastened because you know who knows whether or not it looks like this you know how it actually looks realistically it just adds one more level of depth to your character you know maybe she unfastens this regularly it's not built like this things like that you get it you know maybe you can have a tattoo kind of hiding over there if, if that's appropriate for the story this kind of thing to show more character but i think overall it's a great kind of overview of your character i just think you need to dive in one more step into the design to just make sure that the information is there if you need it okay it kind of looks a bit pervy, just a bit. I think that kind of fits with her um, kind of rambunctious personality. So I think it, I think it's fine. But I think that's what I have to say, say to you. Bit more referencing, I think. Uh, I would definitely change the design on this bottom thing. That is not convincing to me. Uh, this top one is okay. Uh, just bear in mind. See, I don't know how much functionality we want to be thinking about here. But uh, for this whole arm to kind of bend. So again, I, I, I'm trying to hesitate from being nitpicky here. But for this arm to bend, 
I really hope that this kind of bends like this with this whole plate coming outwards. And even then, it's a little bit awkward to kind of draw. So the way that spoilers are, the way that the braces usually work is that they have a, a space for the elbow that ends there. Because I don't know uh, if you've drawn this, this character in action poses yet, but that might be a little bit of a problem to solve if um, if you need to uh, draw this in like any different poses. How does it actually articulate? So maybe leave a gap near this, maybe add like a hubcap kind of armor plate behind. Alternatively, if you want to go full knight, you can add a knight's elbow, elbow guard right there, which might add to your shape, shape, uh, your shape language a bit more. Totally fine to do this. Right, just a bit of functionality ideas. That seems to be the overall theme. I think you've got a good eye for color and flair and, and uh, faces and things like that. But for other stuff, I think I want you to do a little bit more diving into. A little bit more referencing. It'll do you a lot of good. Okay, something like that will make more sense. I don't know if it fits your character or not, right? But that's the idea. Same thing goes over here. This would go over the other one. Maybe break the silhouette a bit more, you know? Because you can. It's just good design in general. It's good drawing principles to break silhouette if you can. Now, there's, there's plenty of reasons to not do this, of course. But again, it's an option there, available if you missed it. But otherwise, I think we're uh, in a pretty good spot here. Okay? Hopefully that was helpful. Some character design tips. Cool. Next one we're going to go for is... Ace. And it's a drawing. Nicely drawn. The accompanying comment is, how can I take this to the next level? Something feels off to me and I'm not entirely sure what it could be. My guess, my best guess would be my shapes are weak and I'm not sure where to start with that. Anatomy I'm already studying every morning. If there's any areas I send out, I'd appreciate it being pointed out. Okay, cool. How's it going, Ace? We'll start with anatomy issues, okay? So, um, this is almost okay, but since Peck connects all the way there, I would expect there to be something like this. An arm, bicep would go underneath there. A little bit of an awkward position for the arm, I think. So, change it a little bit. Not too off, though. Not too, too off. Right there, maybe, is a little bit better. That will go right over there. I'm gonna probably move this whole situation a little bit higher. Or I can move this a bit lower. I'll play around with this. That makes more sense. Okay, so here's a piece with a lot of very intense lighting, right? And here's my problem with this. Uh, the lighting doesn't look like lighting. And the reason is simply because there's a very much lack of like, what's the difference between light and shadow in this piece? I see some shadows, right? Some little shadows here and there. I think uh, Gust already picked up on it there. But uh, I think this piece could really stand from the light behaving like a light, you know? Because right now, there's, there's so much fire going all around him and it looks really good. I think it's well drawn. The hair looks cool, the face looks cool, the drawing is good. It's just that um, the, the lighting doesn't seem to support it. It just looks like he's having some sort of like weird fur kind of coming out of his body. But it doesn't look like lighting, so I can solve this through shape or to just value repaint. I'll do a little bit of both, I'll try and do the best of both because shapes take a bit more time. But we'll think about it, okay? We'll think about doing both. So, the first thing to show a light, I'm gonna just make everything darker, okay? That's my first step. I'm gonna make everything darker so I can actually show light. What's the first thing that's gonna be lit in my scene, right? The first thing that's gonna be lit in my scene is my light sources. So, sources to get lit.
So now you have uh, one hell of <laughs> of a painting ahead of you because there's so many light sources that almost just like getting rid of a few of them to make your job easier. But I'll try my best to navigate through them. So ultimately, we have some lights that are sheared inside of the face and some lights over here that are going to affect this side of the face. I'm going to try my best here. So when I think about the shapes that I'm going to be placing on this face, I'm going to be trying to follow the anatomy as best as I can. Right over there, for example. Right there. Do that as quickly as I can. Really quickly. This is like some seven dimensional chest that you have me doing over here because there's so many light sources. <laughs> I'm just gonna pick shadows that I think are look, gonna look good. I'm taking a lot of liberty here. So <laughs> if, if you want to point that anybody in the chat, you missed that light source or that light shade that's supposed to go there, you're more than welcome to. You're more than welcome to point that out, <laughs> but I'm not welcome to draw it. <laughs> All right. So it goes from that to that. There's more I want to do here. I'm gonna give you an idea here though. So that's one layer of shadow shapes. Yeah. One layer of shadow shapes. I want to add some rim lighting as well. To show you the things that you need to do here. help a lot how's it going mad cat that rim going to help a lot we're doing a crit stream today that rim going to help a lot to separate that head and same thing goes over here i'm going to have a lot of that rim light i haven't really delved into the temperature situation here but i'm going to keep it as is because i think this is enough to problem solve already we've got firefighters they legit have people uh bursting in flames in the dark there you go. Not a bad idea for referencing. I expect this kind of thing to happen. I think um, maybe designing this a little bit better would be nice, you know? Maybe design this so that you have you don't have to do so much work for your painting. Maybe select it and put this fire somewhere. Maybe all of it's behind him, or most of it's to his side. Something like that might, might really work in your favor. Oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. Thanks for the follow, man. So that stuff really helps, right? That stuff really helps. And of course, we haven't dealt with the color in this piece in general, but you can, can have so much variation in color here. You can kind of play around with it, just make things look a little bit more fiery, a little bit more active. Oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. That stuff's totally okay. Right. But I think your issue with shape might be the fact that you're not adding enough shadow shapes to justify your drawing, okay? Be a, little bit, be a little bit careful. I, I think just designing these flames to be a bit more consistent across the piece might be a good idea because right now they're kind of everywhere and one of the issues with painting is that if everything is lit it just looks boring because we don't have interesting shadow shapes. So I think a great idea would be to selectively place these shapes in a very clever way. I think based on your drawing I think you know a slouch when it comes to the drawing department. So maybe put some of that uh, raw mental fortitude into thinking about exactly where the best place to put these flames would be. 
because I think everywhere is going to lead to a very bad painting. So think about specifics, right? Maybe it's coming from his back area, or maybe it's coming from his chest area to illuminate the bottom of his nose. Like there's so many options available to you. So maybe think about exactly where you want to put it, because if everything is lit, because technically if I want to do this accurately, I would just light everything in this piece. I'll have very minor variations. But I can't do that, right? I can't do that because it's just going to make things look bad. People love shadow shapes. Shadow shapes are great. So, in order to offset that, I've been very selective with how I paint this. To still make it look good, right? Good night, light. Cheers, man. That's an idea, okay? And of course, once you're done with this, you can just go ahead and up everything if you want to. Totally up to you. Right? Make it look nice and uh, nice and neat. Okay, that makes sense. But that, that the main issue was to make your fire look more like fire, as the original. You see what I'm getting at? Hopefully, you agree with those changes. But uh, well drawn piece overall. Now it's lit AF. Yeah, it's lit AF. Also, uh, a quick little thing over here that I would definitely add myself is I would throw in a different color for the cigarette. I'd make it maybe reddish. Right over there. And I'd blast it with some uh, dodge. That kind of thing. Your work is so good. The work on Instagram is so good, and this one is too. I always wanted to get how to make lighting. This is more of a crit, so this is mostly somebody else's work, but uh, I do appreciate the comment. This is the kind of thing that I've been doing lately. Uh, none of these, actually. These are all crits. I don't post too often to Instagram anymore, but uh, if you want to see some stuff that I've done, I painted this earlier on stream in about an hour. Did a quick doggo painting. A one hour piece. Um, I can show you some stuff that I've been doing for school. So I do go to concept art uh, school. I did this uh, char lizard here. I'm a concept artist slash illustrator, I guess. Fun stuff. Definitely helpful. Good, good, good. All right. I'm going to save a version of this for you. I'll put it on the Discord. Let's move on to the next one. Oh boy, a bunch of pieces by Gustas. I'm that Gusta Trust guy. Are you really? Uh, I already asked other people to critique my art, it would be awesome to check out. I just recently tried digital art and I don't fully understand oh, why it kind of looked bad. What a lovely day. Hey, cheers, man. Thank you for the sub. I do appreciate it. I don't fully understand why it kind of looks bad for me. I usually work on one layer. I mean, that's a problem. It's not a problem to work on one layer. Totally fine. I mainly worked traditional before. Here's some examples. Sorry for my English. That's totally fine. Um, I see a consistent problem with your, with your pieces over here. How much longer are you going to be live? I have uh, one, two, three, four. I have four more crits to do. Maybe uh, 20 minutes. Okay, so there's a pretty common problem, I think, in your pieces. Go over that. I'll grab one of them. Grab the other one. Alright, so I'm soon done with my first box. I can send it in. I'm not expecting a crit. You're done with your first box now? <laughs> okay, fair enough. I'm not expecting a crit as you've given me enough help already. Finish the pages. Because I want you to kind of learn what you're doing. Okay, so finish the page. I'll give you one big evaluation at the end of it. Because again, I don't want to be holding your hand here, okay? If that's fair. Here are some pieces by... 
Gust in the chat. I think your command of overall strokes are okay. Not too bad. I think you could do a one step better with lighting on all of these. I think you kind of understand this one is maybe not uh, nearly as good as the other ones because I feel like this is more imaginative. Uh, the big problem with this particular one is everything's too monochromatic. You're not considering the local color of your object. It's a very common issue I see on, on most painters that start out doing their own stuff, but um, things are way too monochromatic unless that's the intention. Uh, it's a problem in this particular piece because this is blending into the background too much and again it just goes from pink to lesser pink to dark right didn't own a crit that piece with the girl i'm not sure i'm not entirely sure but be a bit careful about this remember local color okay so remember the transition of lights of color light to dark it goes like this okay it's really simple but it goes from saturated light source so the saturated light transitions into local color which goes into shadow which is ambient light color okay so you're missing one step here which is just that with this particular piece okay next one for this and this real simple push your values one step higher i think your docks are fine maybe a little bit muddy of the saturation if you can uh it does look traditionally painted though so i'm not going to give you too much shit about it this could do with one extra layer of light just one a like grab your titanium white or whatever and uh, don't put too much uh water into it or don't make it too watered down and this one push of light in all these areas i think would look really fantastic a bit of saturated light down there a bit of saturated light down there it's a good kind of finish it's acrylic cool so it should be even easier but that'll help you get that sharpness right now because again things are a little bit blurry right now just that last little push that final little layer that stuff is going to help your work kind of stand out a bit more than it already is okay uh some issues with the drawing of the fingers the hand i want you to think a bit more about contrast and readability this finger blends almost completely into the into the face so if you need to throw in a cast shadow or a contact shadow in here to make it a bit more separate throw in a light on this side to make it a bit more separate whatever you need to do do it right but make sure that it's more separate because right now it's blending too much the entire hand in fact is blending too much so be aware that uh, i don't know what your reference looks like even if there was a reference but you want things to be kind of clear on your painting so whatever tool you need to grab in order to make that happen that's a good tool to use okay so for example there's a light hitting this face on this angle over there i can use the exact same light exact same value and I'm gonna start putting it on the top of the finger to make it stand out a bit more, right? Same thing on this finger over here, on this finger over here, and maybe even on this entire, on this, this thing over here, right? This uh, hand, I can throw in a bit of that bounce light on top of here. So again, show me a little bit. I, I understand that you wanna go for some lost edges, and I think that is fine, but a bit more separation is what I'm gonna look for, okay? That's for this piece over here. The ref. I see it, I see it. I don't know how accurate you want to be to the reference, but I see a lot of, um, I mean, obvious proportional issues. I don't know if this is supposed to be like a stylization or not. But uh, if it's not supposed to be a stylization, of course, really work on your drawing. There's a lot that uh, could be desired. But your overall proportioning on the piece. So, um, I think I have... Some documents about proportioning things on the discord we can call it a statistician so it wasn't intentional oh my man i think your um your lighting is good okay your painting is good spend a bit more time on the first phase okay because ultimately there's a phrase that we always talk about in painting it's just that drawing is two-thirds painting okay so if the drawing is not great the painting is going to kind of kind of suffer right i think i love how i changed the, the hair color uh, it's not too too bad. I don't think it's it's uh, it's all that uh, poorly done. I think it's fairly okay. I think uh, maybe a little bit towards the back could be unified a bit with your background because right now you got like bam red and then you got bam you got this greenish blue thing. So I think one kind of section over here, one section over here, could be shifted a bit more towards that green. Okay. 
Bit more towards that green. Just to unify a little bit more. So you still have your saturation, you still have your contrast. But again, you don't want this to be so color contrasted that ultimately it ruins your read of your face. Okay? So be a little bit wary about that. Contrast can be a very dangerous thing. Are you saying something's wrong with this style? <laughs> yeah, it's accidental. That's what's wrong with it. Okay. And uh, don't forget to miss out some key elements over here, right? I actually really like how you did this eye. I think it's cool. Uh, just missing a couple of things, right? A couple of things that's going to give you a lot more sharpness. Like, look how good this nose is. Pretty fucking good, right? But right up here, on your eye, it's missing something. It's missing a little bit of that occlusion to sharpen things down. So, for example, in the reference, I see it across the side of the eye. A little tiny stroke here. It goes a long way. And I make sure that things actually have the resolution that they need to live on the canvas. Alright, it goes a long way. Finish up the painting. Okay, some notes about this one. Last one. Again, not too bad. I think this is actually pretty well done. Um, overall, I'm not too unhappy with it. I have issues with uh, partially painting stuff, but I can chalk that up to a quick painting or a quick painting style or whatever. I don't think it's, a, it's an issue. Maybe explore a bit of car shadow one here. Not unreasonable. Some of the drawing could be improved ever so slightly. I think the foreshortening is a little bit awkward. It kind of jumps a step down there. But this one's pretty good for a quick painting. I don't think I, I mind it at all. I like the little uh, variations of color on there. Pretty good. Yeah, not bad at all. You said you were 16? Good for you, man. A lot of work done. The taco down here. No crazy comments on this one. So I guess it's just going to be a general crit. Thank you for submitting. Hopefully some of that was helpful. So there are three pieces. I try to just go over each of them. Okay. Otaku's piece here. Pretty okay. Can't surrender. A couple of notes I want to make over here. Is that you have a full range of value. But you're not using it. To anywhere near the amount that I think you should be. So, I don't see too much idea of light in this piece. Okay, I see some general lighting, some like ambient lighting, but I think this piece could really benefit from some strong directional lighting. To really tell me where things are supposed to go, because right now things look a little bit washed out, and I think we could improve on that. Let's try it. I'm gonna pull some lights out. I'm going to just paint in the mask, so we can kind of de definitely kind of add an idea of light in this space, because right now things are a little bit in the shadow, I feel like. Very common contrasting issue, but we can solve it pretty easily. No shear, so not as much. Up over here, definitely, a lot of light. A little bit of a light note on the nose bit a light note on the eyes right then we can kind of add a bit more light to the face in general make that seem like it's a bit more alive right over there big note over here cast shadow i'm gonna put that in later on we're gonna add some light on the chest over here on the chest across the arm just a bit more gradations, but I think it's going to help you a lot. Right over there. And there's like a magic bone, cheekbone right there. Put it down on there. Put it down on the chin. Right. Tangential light on the house right there. Light on the feet. To the lighting pass here. And same thing goes for your shadows, right? Those could be improved as well. So add a one layer of lights there, really simple. Now you can throw in some car shadows to make everything fit better. Cast the face, 
Maybe a bit of shadow right there is fine. Right? Definitely these areas over here can be improved. A bit more shadow right there. And underneath here should read a bit better. Shadow shapes on the deltoid. Be a little bit lighter than that. Just some lighting shapes. Spooky when your color wheel also goes grayscale, but it's helpful too. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, an inbuilt feature. Again, a bit more ideas we can kind of play around with here. That's what we were looking for. Cast shadow, cast shadow. Right. Cast shadow down here, down here. I see some idea of it, but it's just not strong enough at the current uh, the current version of the painting. Should be up a little bit more. Some ideas around her chest, if you need uh, that to be the case. Can go a little bit in there. The form change. Again, form change. Basically, I'm I'm applying a little bit more light, and by a little bit, I mean a lot more light. The character and be inclusion and be inclusion on this side and that side contact shadow down here and this thing we can just add a general uh, shadow over there I think it's a very simple fix, but just the lighting needs to look more like lighting. Every little bit helps. Push the values a little bit more. Respect to cast shadows, respect to ambient occlusion. And we should be pretty good to go here. Yeah, very small little changes here and there, but you're gonna get the idea, right? But it adds a bunch of the character, makes it look way more readable. And these are very quick changes. So you should be able to do them really uh really swiftly to make your character look good okay give you a quick little before and after here and of course don't ever forget to once you figure out uh, everything needs to go you can always just play around with some of the contrast if you like how that looks Okay, so very quick little fix, but just adding a little bit of lighting there helps a long way. Let me show you the before and after. From there to there, everything lives a lot better on the canvas, right? Just really quick little changes, but helps a lot. Okay, and then you can think about additional things once you add your general lighting, like little highlights and things. Right, you can start to pull out a little bit of stuff here and there. A little bit of highlight right there, if you want. Right, just things to kind of finish the painting. You know, it's, it's a very kind of... Um, how do I put this? Like... Uh, Eastern kind of thing to do. To add like highlights across the muscles and stuff. So you see some lot of like Tsukimi challenge work and things like that. If that can be considered to be Eastern style work. But um, yeah, you can do that if you want. Totally fine. It just kind of helps kind of sell that roundness and of course being able to kind of paint basic shapes kind of really helps here to help with the edges uh if you really want to get bigger that style by the way uh most of your paintings are going to be done with selection tool and airbrush so uh, be a little bit aware of that if at all your edges look a bit harsh because i paint very much like an oil painter so i uh tend to always harden up my stuff again just general ideas of gradients right there like general shadows for the tilt of the form really really goes a long way to solidify your design okay you're good to go i'll leave this on discord for you let's move on to the next one thank you for submitting
You don't have to critique my next insect demon if you don't want to. Um, I think I cut off the crits, but I don't mind doing it next stream because I usually do crits just about every single stream. So you're you're pretty okay. The uh, the one which with the pink with the pink background thing, I did go over that at the very beginning. I don't know if you missed that, but I did go over it. Oh, you mean the next one? Yeah, the next one. I think uh, we can have some notes about it, I guess. I don't mind giving you a small little notes. But yeah, in general, I don't want people to hog the um, crit time, but I don't mind. Since we're at the end of the stream, we can go over it quickly. Okay, for this one particularly, cut the saturation in the background. A little bit too saturated in the background, so it's not letting your colors, your, your wonderful colors on your object, really play well. So a quick little change over here. And I'll desat the background. And I'll reset the image. Makes everything look way more realistic. Real simple. Right? Secondly, more attention to, to cast shadows and form shadows. Again, something that people miss all the time is casting shadows. So, again, let's add some shadows to the piece. See how it looks. Go this one here. Don't worry about that attack you anytime, dude. Get a filter mask here, really easy. And we cast some shadows, right? Really simple. Really helps to kind of spatially put things into place. Anything over here. See that adds a ton. Already doing one over there, that's good. Form shadow, form shadow, form shadow. Right, this stuff lets everything look a bit more realistic. Right? It's a very quick fix, of course. But it already helps. Right? Brings it to much more of a like a understandable location. Making the same mistake as before, right? Where you should really be pushing some of these values a little bit higher. It should be this demonic insect of the jungle or something, maybe like a jungle spirit. I kind of get that. Reminds me of like a. You remember that game? What was it called? Remnant of the Ashes or whatever. Speaking of that game, how's it going, Hester? I played the game with him. Reminds me of like some of the forest NPCs. But a little bit of highlight goes a long way. How's it going, buddy? Yeah, there's all my buddies in here. You guys playing games? I can play games right after this. Totally done. The highlights go a long way, right? Last thing I want to note is that this stuff is a little bit lazy. Okay? Um, make sure that everything is lit properly. So at least the smallest thing you can do is throw in a little bit of specular lighting, okay? A bit of specular. Just complete the drawing. Adds a lot of dimension to the stuff. Okay, see how it kind of lives better on the canvas now? Very simple change, takes two seconds. We're just hanging out, sounds good then. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, where are you hanging out? On Discord? Send me a link. I'll be off in a few seconds here. So I'll give you a quick little before and after here. But you see how that kind of helps, that specular? It's a big deal, right? It's because you don't want anything to look flat and underworked. Everything is going to be affected by lighting. So make sure everything is affected by lighting, okay? Now I'm show you the before. So from this to this, looks like much more of a mature concept, right? Really simple fixes. Just changing the saturation of the background, adding some highlights, adding some cast shadows. Very simple. Okay? Yeah, but that looks like a much more kind of serious design here. It looks good overall. My first character tried to follow the Bucci tutorial. Okay? 
I see you did silhouettes, you did uh, value stuff, good, good, good. At the very end, I see final version. This is the last kill of the night. The Majora's Mask vibe? Yeah, it does, right? A little bit. Yeah, sure. I'm not um, really. I'm not really used to the digital medium. This is not really digital medium problem. It's just painting fundamental problem. So, be a little bit aware of the fact that um, that background shouldn't be too contrasty, okay? Because again, the background is part of the overall presentation. So make sure that that stuff isn't too color contrasty, because it really does make the, the entire concept way more mature. Because this is way too loud. So it's not letting your beautiful character kind of live in its own environment. But this, now that's letting your work actually be seen, okay? How's it going, Az Azar? Good to see you, man. I thought you were done streaming already. <laughs> Welcome. Azar was who we were helping out earlier in the stream. And I'm gonna have to set some time limits next time because this has been six hours of streaming on my part. And all of us have been continuously talking and I'm a little bit tired. But, um... Yeah, we're gonna wrap up pretty soon here. But, uh, yeah, see? Very simple changes makes everything look better, okay? Moving on. The final crit of the day. This one. You're welcome, sir. Alright. So, character design, right? So, you went through the whole Marco Bucci step of character design. Uh, I don't mind those silhouettes, those are kind of okay in general. Let's talk about some just good practices to think about, right? Just things to make the overall drawing better. The first one is layout. There's no reason that I can should be occupying so little space on my canvas. It should be way, way more than that, okay? So I'm just gonna do a quick little recrop here. I lose nothing, but I gain everything, right? Just from that one little change, everything becomes better in the piece. Because remember, everything needs to be laid out properly. That's the difference between a good looking piece and a bad looking piece. Now everything's still centralized, right? The difference is, I don't have so much wasted space, you see? Now, now the, the big question is, why did I even have that space to begin with? And the answer is, I didn't need it. Okay? Very simple. Layout, number one. Number two, background, right? Things are a little bit flat over here. You put all this effort into drawing your character and adding all these shadows in here. What's up with the background and why is it so, like, bleak, right? So what we could really do here is add in a little bit of this gradation to really help this go along. Select that background really quickly. Adjust my fuzziness. Okay, let's hit it with a little bit of a background color. The actual color of the object is something like decide cool. So I'll choose there to be a warmer, darker value for the background. I realized this, I didn't make the change hard enough, so tiny. It happens all the time, right? Something I say all the time for for most artists that when you make a change and it looks better it just looks better it's not it's not correct yet it's just better okay so don't worry about like shifting things in a little bit i think a little bit of background i think is going to be good maybe not cool background it's a little bit awkward maybe like that there's some amount of gradation i think is going to look great on this on this particular character just because it lets these lights on top really kind of live in their own environment right so i want those, those lights to generally be contrasted against the background because right now they're kind of bleeding into the background maybe a little bit but the second i do this ah oh, it's so clear so distinct you know so specific even more than that right i want you to think about a little bit of a push for your overall contrast for your piece right let me show you what it looks like so i can do auto contrast if i need to that looks awful that's why auto contrast doesn't solve all your problems but i can cross channel it push your lights push your docks down Bit like that goes a long way into making your character look like it's much more readable right quick little change there really really quick but it works out you're missing some stuff when it comes to the overall radiation of your character i think we could maybe play around a little bit more be a bit more particular with your cast shadow over here over here over here i like that you're paying attention to it i just think in general it could be handled a little bit stronger so don't forget to do your studies on this particular subject i want to get you thinking about something very very important here is that when there's going to be a change in form there's going to be a change in value and i've said this before but what does it really mean it basically means that whenever something is just flatly colored on your object this is basically all the same color right 
it sort of reduces the overall quality of your image, right? It's like beautiful head, you know, beautiful torso, and then just piece of paper in between. So make sure that you're going over every every stage and saying, okay, that's going to be the light there. Okay, that's going to be the shadow there. Right? So it, it looks more sensible, right? It looks more worked, it looks more real. Because realistically, the lighting's not going to affect this one area, it's going to affect all the areas, right? So in order for your piece to look more complete, make sure that lighting is hitting every area. If something is just completely flat, that should be a big red flag for you. Saying, okay, why on earth is that flat? Right? Why is it flat at all? Why does that make any sense? Is it just a flat object? You know, it is just like, is, it, is it a graphic element? There are reasons to make it so, but these are not the reasons to do so. Like, this is just uh, a bit of an oversight. I mean, look at all the detail that you put in for this, this uh, cloth element here, the trousers. But you completely missed that part up here, which is a problem, right? Anatomy could use some work. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but it's, uh, it's getting better, though, than uh, what I've seen in the past, so it's not too bad. Adam's apple and things like that over here you're missing. A bit too overall dark there, I think. Kind of flattened stuff out. I thought the light wouldn't affect enough to draw attention, but it does look 3D now. There's always going to be a form. Like, if it's a form change, it has to be a value change, right? And there's so many form things happening over there. You can't just leave anything flat. And, and it just looks awkward, looks wrong, right? Go over it at least a little bit, and it helps, right? Even if at the end of the painting, it's so subtle, at least it'll look worked, and that's a big deal. Big deal for it to look worked, right? Because it, it makes everything look more complete, looks more professional that way. So don't make things flat. I don't mind at the very beginning of your painting if you do this, but as a final product, big, big no-no. Okay, work the painting a bit more. All right, make sure you're covering all the bases. As far as the rest of the painting goes, uh, gosh, that is okay. I think this could do, do again with some solid kind of rendering. Again, this is going to be the theme of this crit over here. Is that um, think about the lights? So even if this is going to be completely black, it's going to have some amount of light. F find an excuse, right? Diffuse light, bounce light, accent light. I don't care, but find an excuse to put some light on each area. Because if they don't, things are going to look really flat. In this case, you could have a bounce light from the from the um, the bottom, and kind of lighting up the uh, bottoms of the legs to unify things. Totally fine. Okay, and have some bounce light over here. I kind of like maybe a little bit of bounce light. I think you've already put in there, so you're paying attention to it. A bit more of that, I think it would be good. But again, there's always going to be an excuse to add in some amount of gradation, and it's important that you do so. The, the less amount of... Let's just toss the word gradation. Let's just talk about lighting. The, the less lighting something has, the more it's going to look like it's flat and out of place, right? Look at the barrel of this gun. You can easily just get one single layer of dark in there. Right? And it already looks more complete, more three-dimensionally spaced. One layer of highlight, even more so. Now even more, it looks like it's, it appears in space. Right? Just one little degree. So all this stuff is a bit of an oversight. Make sure you're doing it. Right? Complete the drawing. Don't leave things unfinished. Remember what the tools that you have in your, in your arsenal, and then utilize those tools. Okay? It doesn't take that much more work. It's more complete. It's a whole package because every time you do something that's nice, something that's not nice will immediately devalue what you just did. So be careful. Uh, otherwise, maybe a bit too monochromatic. So some blotches in the skin would be nice. I like the little bit of temperature difference you have going on going on over there. It's not too bad. Uh, maybe push it a bit more. Again, reads flat over there. Reads flat over there. This arm is nice. This arm is not bad. So again, so you know what you're doing there. The only difference I would make over here is a bit of core shadow. But that's not bad. That arm's getting in the right direction, I think. But you see how that looks from, from afar? It looks real. Right? It looks like it fits. So I want you to do that more. Do that more and more and more. Find an excuse and use it. As Max said, there you go. Alrighty. Let me grab the original. Just quick little changes here, but makes a world of difference. Okay. There's better presentation and better attention to detail. Okay. Cool. And I think that is it. That it's the last crit that I have to do today. 
I think Dusk posted like a Yennefer painting. Are you in the chat, Dusk? I don't mind looking at one more. Since you're in the stream right now. Uh, I'm assuming you're in the stream right now. Might have been too small, it was pixels. Yeah, I mean, that's no excuse, John. Come on, blow that shit up, man. Blow it up. Paint I mean, if this is going to be your final character, your final character thing, then give it the respect that it's owed, right? Because your work's not bad. I think it's 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 really a big step up from what I've seen from you before, but that doesn't mean I'm going to cut you any slack, right? Yeah, but overall pretty good. There you go. Good little Witcher piece over here. Pretty nice all overall. Couple of things that I want to point out here right before we close is oh, that um, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. Thanks for the follow, I appreciate that. So we can talk about a few things over here. Overall, pretty good job, right? Pretty good job. So what can we make the team of this, of this overall piece? What's what are you doing right and wrong? First of all, I think you can work on your drawing a bit more. So I know that uh, this is probably off of a reference in some part, but there's a lot of things that are going kind of here and there. So I'm not quite sure exactly what your drawing look like, but certain things like the nose and the face. Right, the eye on this side. I think that you could be a little bit more focused on your drawing. Because, for example, eyes are not going to go that way. It looks like it's tilted. Eyes going to be most likely something like this instead. Right? A bit more like that. It's more likely to happen. Right? But I like the colors that you put on here. I think I like the attention to detail on these, like the belts and stuff. I think that's all kind of cool. I think we could do with a bit of unifying of lighting. So beyond the actual drawing, which I actually want you to work on, okay? So if you need to spend a bit more time in the block art phase, do so. There's no issue, there's no shame in it, just because of the fact that I think your painting is pretty good, right? I think uh, right over here, the clouds in the background, this dragon, I think that's quite nice, right? Not bad, not bad at all. But the drawing is taking me away from it. That's, that's, that's the thing that's a limiting factor, right? So your painting is pretty good right now, right? You should be proud of that. But the drawing is holding you back. And let me tell you, I've been in the same position before, where I spent so much time learning how to paint, that I didn't spend as much time drawing my piece. And I, therefore what happened is that my pieces themselves suffered because I put all this effort into painting it, right? All these beautiful effort over here and here and here. But the drawing kept me down. So spend more time. I feel like if your painting is this good, your drawing is not going to be that bad. So spend a bit more time, map out those proportions, okay? It's going to lead to a much more impressive piece overall, right? Because like from this distance, I'm like, oh, cool. What's it going to look like? And then over here, okay. Sound problems over there. Okay, sound problems. Some things you can kind of think about overall is that I think focal point might be a great thing to talk about in this particular piece. Because I think things like this white element over here and this white element over here, draw you mean sketches? I mean just overall proportioning. Overall proportioning, no matter how you do it. Like if you're doing it through shape or you're doing it through your drawing. How can I improve my draw? Oh, you can just practice stuff. Here's how I do it if you're wondering. When I was first learning how to do proportioning work, I first learned how to proportion stuff. I learned the theory behind it, like I learned negative space. I learned about plumb lining. Things like this that really help you with your drawing. These are tools. And then what I did was I drew a bunch of portraits, because this is a portrait, right? I did a bunch of portraits. And all I did, port eights. So all I did, is it portraits with a, is it that? I don't even know anymore. I've lost my ability to spell. So I, I did portrait drawings in line and I just compared the line drawing to a tracing, to a tracing of the reference. So I could see where I was going wrong. Because see, the thing about this dusk is that you kind of know what you're doing for the most part here. You're just suffering some very common issues that I'm pretty sure if I look through your entire body of work, I'd be able to see that again and again and again. And this is just what I call predilection. It's where everybody kind of suffers from the same fault. Azar in the chat had a fault that I think he's fixed for the most part, where his eyes always curved upwards. And it wasn't in one piece or two pieces, it was in every piece. Okay? The same way on my paintings. There'll be a jaw, the jaw will be too masculine on my paintings all the time. My lips will be a touch too low all the time. Okay? Very common thing to happen. So I want you to do the portraits, I want you to do a trace comparison, compare your drawing with the tracing, okay? And then make a note, make a note saying, okay, in this painting, my chin was too large. This painting, my nose was too small. In this painting, my eyes are too 
are consistently too large or too low or too high. In this way, you'll be able to make a mental checklist that will inform all of your drawing, okay? It'll inform your drawing so that you're not just drawing in the dark and you're not just drawing to get better, right? You're, you're drawing in an idea that I know where I'm going to make a mistake, okay? And that's going to really help you much faster than just drawing at, like randomly. So you're, you're not just drawing, but you're evaluating where your mistakes are going to be. And this will help you a lot faster, okay? So over there, I think that could really be improved. I think overall lighting, right? I'm not going to do too much of a paint over here, but I don't want this and this to be so light. I want you to dim that light down a bit more. And the reason why is because I want to see that face and I want that to be, I want that to be my focal. So think about these ideas, right? Think about these ideas of like light and dark and light, light, light local colors and dark local colors. They're short. See, this is also still light, right? This and this are both light. It's just that this light is dark enough to let me see the face a bit more. Because remember, everything is a package, right? So this face should be the first thing I look at. And that's distracting me. Okay? Somebody asked me, what is the um, meaning of a plumb line? A plumb line is very simple. I can show it to you easily. A plumb line is a vertical line that you draw from one location to another location to just figure out what the relationship between those two locations are. Okay? So, for, for instance, um, on this dog painting, I did a plumb line between the bottom of the jaw here all the way down to the top of the head to kind of figure out how these things look in relation to each other. So this is an imaginary thing that you do. You look at your reference and you draw a plumb line. The reason I wrote it down is because I'm, gonna, I'm encouraging you to search this, these terms and figure out how to use them, okay? But these are all tools you can use. So draw these portraits and do your trace compares, okay? I think it's going to really help because I think your painting is not bad, man. I think it's, it's pretty decent painting. Like you're missing a few things here and there, but overall, I think what's keeping the painting down is your drawing. Sounds fair? Cool. That's what I would definitely work on. Because your painting is not a bad state right now. Push more on the drawing and then post more stuff. Post more stuff and I'll be able to tell you where to go from there. Okay? I think we're done, man. I think we're done with the stream. That was a long one, huh? Jesus Christ. Six and a half hours. <clears throat> of continuous talking. Alright. I hope you guys had a good stream, man. Thank you so much for hanging out. Thank you for uh, for the subs and everything. Uh, be in mind or bear in mind that I do prioritize subs for these crits. So if you ever want to like, get ahead of the line or whatever, or get a much longer crit, something like that, you're welcome to sub to the channel. It's a way of supporting me for what I do. Try to uh, give you guys the best content. So it's a nice way of showing your support. Uh, follow if you haven't already. But uh, regardless, no matter what happens, man, always I will try to um, address everybody. I'm not going to pay gate anything. Um, so no matter what happens, everybody's going to get their fair turn. The VOD for this is going to be available on my YouTube. It's not a big deal, my YouTube channel. It's just a place that you can go and get some um, get some of the VODs that get deleted by uh, Twitch. Okay. Follow my boy Azar in there, it's because we had him earlier in the chat. Uh, we were helping him out with some basic um, information, hopefully he had a good a good time. Cheers Clearzy, thank you so much for hanging out to the entire stream. Uh, and everybody as well that popped in, very very kind of you guys to give me the time of day. And hopefully you guys got something useful out of all the things that I've done today. We went over a lot of subjects, but all of them I think pretty important. I will see you on the next stream, most likely will be tomorrow if I have time, if not day after. But uh, you know I'll always be here. I want to uh, do my best. Hope you guys are along. Clergy, thank you so much for the sub. We got a ton of subs today. Thanks, Azar, for gifting stuff. Thank you for the people that have subbed. Of your own accord. Very, very kind of you. We're gonna go ahead and raid James. This is my buddy here. This is the guy that got me back into art. He got me back into drawing. I had not drawn a single thing before I uh, got back to um, before I encountered a stream on Twitch and now I draw every single day I'm in art school and eventually I'm going to be a, prof a professional so I owe this guy a lot hopefully uh, you guys will enjoy your time there but otherwise uh, do the assignment that I said earlier in the stream if you want to get some evaluation from me but otherwise I will have you over here for the next stream for some more studies some more painting and some more information so otherwise have a good day and cheers
Are you actually a, um... But are you actually a fan of uh, Grand Blue? Like, do you know that franchise? Um...